Hello everyone, my name is Van Garris, and this video is going to be a commentary of Dark Souls 2, where I go through the game from start to finish and commentate on anything and everything as I go. I'll talk about the level design, the lore, the mechanics, as well as referencing other content creators' perspectives of the game, and other games that are tied to it. Before I get into the game itself, I wanted to mention that this video is meant to be a counterpart to Matthew Matosis' Dark Souls commentary, albeit with some modifications. His Dark Souls and Demon Souls commentaries were major inspirations for this project, and I would love to get his take on this, as he has a vast knowledge when it comes to the Soulsborne series, and could easily correct any mistakes I make here. I'm sure there will be plenty. The primary reason for this video, however, is a simple one. I enjoyed Mr. Matosa's commentaries on Demon Souls and Dark Souls 1, and I wanted a Dark Souls 2 commentary in his style to exist, so here I am. Not to say this is on par with those, as both of them are very well made while this is just okay. I also want it to be known now that this is Dark Souls 2, and not Scholar of the First Sin, as re-releasing a game with a few optimizations and enemy changes is an absolutely ridiculous reason to have fans pay more for what they should have gotten on day one. So, nothing I'm about to show you is from Scholar, as I don't support that mentality. Although I did get Dark Souls remastered because the PC port was absolute garbage, but we won't get into that. With all that out of the way, let's get into Dark Souls 2. The list of missteps begins as early as the intro cinematic. The first thing that came to mind after seeing it was that there was a major difference between Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2's introductions. Dark Souls 1 set up the world, and Dark Souls 2 set up the player character. On paper, this isn't a strict negative for a game to have, but this simple change illustrates a major shift from how the player interacts with the world of each game. Dark Souls 1 sets the player as another entity in the world who is pursuing a goal, like many of the NPCs in the game. In other words, you aren't the focus of the world in Dark Souls 1. You simply instigate some of the events that move the plot forward. In Dark Souls 2, the world is built for the player specifically. Nearly everything and everyone revolve around your character's needs and choices, as we will see later. Other mistakes, or changes, made in the intro are that the player character is given a defined gender and a backstory, whereas Dark Souls 1 left the player's history up to speculation, and waited for the player to choose a gender during customization. This can be very off-putting because it removes the sense of filling in the shoes of your character with your idea of their backstory. It also alienates female players and people who want to play as a female by forcing a male and a male's backstory upon them. The funniest part to me is that it conflicts with what customization options you may choose when you reach things betwixt, possibly negating the relevance of the intro cinematic altogether. You spawn as a man, but can change into a woman if you choose. You can even change back afterwards. Not to mention all the crazy stuff the old lady tells us. The most confusing one to me is that she describes Drang Lake as a walled off land far to the north, and yet we fall into a whirlpool, only to end up in things betwixt, which connects to Drang Lake. Either the geography of this world is insane, or they created the cinematic and the game separately, and had to stitch them together afterwards. Add that she says that we will stand at the gates of Drang Lake without knowing why, and you leave a player wondering why we bothered to go to Drang Lake at all after talking to her, considering how useless and vague her speech was. We aren't searching for a cure, at least that wasn't indicated, and we aren't forced into this situation like in the previous game. Our character actively seeks out Drang Lake, while it's ambiguous in Dark Souls 1 why we are in Lordrim. After the cinematic, you'll wake up at a shrine in Things Betwixt. Then you are led to the hut where the three old ladies live. This is assuming that you don't take the path to the left just before the bridge, where you'll be killed by the ogre there, but you will see him in a bit. When you arrive at the hut, the old ladies comment on you being undead, how you're finished and you'll go hollow and such, when they ask for your name. After you tell them your name, such as the handsome Glassboy Bill or Magic Man Mark, they antagonize you for at least knowing your name. Then they reward you with a human effigy and tell you to think back to your past and that it is an effigy of you. This is when you reach the character customization menu. In the menu, you'll see that you can pick different items to add to your inventory at the start, but I'll focus on the bonfire aesthetic for a moment. This is a nice touch mechanically because it gives the player the option to push the game into New Game Plus right away, which is both a cool and broken addition to the game, as we will see later. 
After customizing your character, the old ladies tell you that all undead come here to break the curse. Then they tell you that you don't stand a chance and that you'll lose your souls over and over again while laughing at you. Doesn't stand a chance. Well, you never know. <laughs> Along to the kingdom. But remember, hold on to your souls. They're all that keep you from going hollow. Oh, I'll fool you no longer. You'll lose your souls. All of them. Over and over again. <laughs> to quote Mr. Matosis, you can practically hear the developers laughing at your expense as she says this. They're basically saying, we made this game really hard, that's what you wanted, right? Dark Souls 2 has such a heavy focus on difficulty that they literally have the hags in the beginning tell you it'll be hard. This goes against what Demon Souls and Dark Souls director Hidetaka Miyazaki said when asked about the difficulty in an interview. Difficulty was never the point. It was a way to pull you into the world. Instead of using it to pull players into the world, Dark Souls 2 uses it as a guide for the world, as can be seen once you hit the main areas. One thing I would like to mention quickly is that the opening cinematic and the dialogue with the hags indicates that 1. The length of fire ending in Dark Souls 1 is canon, or 2. Dark Souls 1's ending has no significance whatsoever. Keep that in mind as we go through the game. Once the player is given control of their character again, you acquire three keys from thin air, each unlocking one of the three DLC areas when you come to them. I find these keys to be very pointless, because they were originally found throughout the world, but were retroactively placed in your inventory from the start with an update. I don't have a problem with them being in the world to find, but why keep the doors locked with keys that we'll spawn with instead of removing the keys and just having the doors unlocked straight away? You didn't see Dark Souls 1 give you the items needed to access the Artorias of the Abyss DLC when you first spawned in, so why do this here? The keys could have been left in the world to find, or the keys and locks used for the DLCs could have been removed altogether. This is something that you'll see this game struggle with. They are often afraid to commit to one side of an idea or another, resulting in several instances where you can't tell if the developers were lazy, pressured into doing an idea, or were simply incompetent. This is very confusing to analyze because I can't tell why they did things like this. Leave the keys in the world or remove the lock and key mechanic from the doors. It's simple. Just pick one. We ended up in a weird middle space where we don't have to explore to find them, and some may wonder if the old ladies gave the keys to us since they just appear after talking to them. Add that to the wiki and see what explanations fans make up. From the way this works, I think the developers realized that some players wouldn't be able to find the keys without the wiki or exploring, so they would miss the DLCs altogether. It's no surprise that the DLCs are praised by the Dark Souls 2 fans as being great additions to the game, so they made it more user-friendly by giving the keys to the player straight away. The part that gets me about this is that they lazily changed how the player got the keys. They spawn in your inventory instead of the world now, which I'm sure isn't too hard to code in. I imagine that recoding the doors without the keys would have taken longer than changing where something spawns. Anyway, after leaving the hut, we run back to fight the first ogre in the game. This enemy shows several of the mistakes made during the development of Dark Souls 2's enemy design. The ogre has a bad set of hitboxes, in that they do not accurately represent the model of the enemy. The ogre's grab will kill players even if they have full health, excluding some pre-full life gem healing and they have an attack that is easily baited and easily punished. Because of that attack, a bait, attack, dodge, repeat strategy easily turns these enemies into a joke. Half of the time they will kill you, and the other half of the time they won't know how to kill you. When you move forward you will find a bonfire and then come to the tutorial area. One thing I like about this tutorial is that it is completely optional, but also gives you a few items and unlocks Snuggly the Crow 2.0 for trading. The downside to this area and the game in general, is that it can show several problems that players will be dealing with for the entire playthrough. The incremental movement system, the increased fall damage, and the ambush philosophy of the game are shown heavily in the tutorial, which can start turning players off to the game. 
The first problem, the incremental movement system, is a major step back from Dark Souls 1, in that you no longer have a full 360 degree spectrum to turn your character, like most games have. Instead, you have 8 snap points taking precedence over 360 movement. This means that you will snap between 8 different positions when moving and turning. This can lead to many deaths, as movement is particularly important for combat, platforming, and exploration. If you need to slightly adjust your direction, you will have to snap too far one direction and then attempt to snap back to compensate, instead of being able to move slightly left or right. This leads to zigzagging around, which is stupid to deal with, but is also incredibly underwhelming when you think of the zigzagger becoming the most powerful thing alive by the end of the game. This all can be mitigated somewhat by using your camera to direct a turn, but that shouldn't be necessary. I've also heard that you can fix this by tweaking the files of the game, but that is still terrible. It is easiest to move on PC with the camera, as the mouse has a larger range of sensitivity, but console players suffer through the incremental movement. Fun fact, the Dark Souls trilogy are fun on PC, but the interface is mostly garbage. The controls and tutorials are in Xbox controls, which literally does nothing for a new player learning them. Dark Souls Remastered fixed this, but it took them seven years to do this, which is ridiculous. Seriously, how do you mess this up for that long? The next change in Dark Souls 2 was the fall damage. It has been drastically increased to a ludicrous level from Dark Souls 1. I don't have an actual multiplier to figure out the increase in damage, but it is at least 8 times more damaging in Dark Souls 2 unless you have an item to reduce it. This change seemed to be made for an area later, but I'll talk about that when I get there. The next issue is the ambush philosophy of this game, which is epitomized by the first ogre drawing you out, while the second ogre, who has a grab that absolutely will kill you, sneaks up behind you. This is such a frustrating area to deal with early game because of how hard to kill the ogres can be, not to mention while dealing with the movement changes and the iframe changes that we'll talk about in a moment. Now, you can unlock a shortcut that acts as an exploit against them, but that is still a negative when you have to cheese the AI in order to win. Sorcerers will have an easier time dealing with them, but that doesn't make the encounter any less cheap or tedious. Some people may defend this by saying that there were ambushes and harder parts throughout Dark Souls 1, and that this is nothing new. They will probably point to the skeleton that kicks you off the ledge in the boss run to Nito as an example of a killing ambush. It doesn't matter if it's new or not. It matters if it's fair, decently telegraphed, or both. Players get frustrated when our progress is hindered by a surprise. This is why I think most players hate anything that insta-kills us. It's not a combat exchange. It's a meat grinder. You wouldn't play a meat simulator just to be ground up, would you? One interesting thing I found while reviewing this footage is that the area you can interact with here gives the player the ability to change sex at will. Aesthetically, this is kind of nice, and a bit funny, but narratively falls apart when attached to the intro cinematic. The last thing I'll say about this area is how the crow's drops are randomized. They do scale depending on the type of stones you give, but random drops and repeating dialogue make this more of a hassle than a transaction since you aren't sure what to expect. There's nothing more to say about it. It's random and annoying. With all that out of the way, we finally make it to the Dark Souls 2 hub. Majula is the Firelink Shrine of Dark Souls 2, being the area you will visit the most in the game. This is where you will meet the NPC you will be interacting with the most, the Emerald Herald. She is your source for Estus Flask additions and leveling up, as well as the one to direct you to seek out the four old ones and King Mendrick. Before we go any farther, I want to explain a problem I have with the way you level up in this game, as well as Dark Souls 3. Dark Souls 1 is the only game in the Souls series to not have someone the player must talk to to level up. Instead, you level up at bonfires. This system is something I think fits the Dark Souls series on several different levels, and is superior to the way the two sequels have done it. One quick note before I elaborate. I am excluding Demon Souls here because Dark Souls was a spiritual sequel to Demon Souls, while Dark Souls 2 and 3 are direct sequels set in the same universe as Dark Souls 1. This is shown in several descriptions for items and locations in Dark Souls 2 and 3. This means that certain consistencies must be met, or the world's rules will begin to fall apart. Just wanted to make that clear before I begin. Leveling up at bonfires in Dark Souls 1 fits the game on a mechanical level, a narrative level, an aesthetic level, and a thematic level. Mechanically, it allows the player to level up wherever they happen to be in the game, as bonfires represent checkpoints and are used for health replenishment. You couldn't warp until later, so they couldn't use anything like the Maiden in Black for leveling up here. 
It also made kindling a significant choice to make when at a bonfire. You would need to decide whether to bolster your resource charges at certain points if you wanted the most Estus charges possible, or reserve them if you didn't want to risk getting invaded or using up a humanity. This hits one of the core ideals of the Soulsborne series being the risk-reward system. This also allowed players to mediate the difficulty of each section of the game, as you can have anywhere from 5 to 20 Estus to use in a given area, depending on how much you kindle each bonfire. Now, you would have to fight your way down to Pinwheel and kill him, her, them, it, in order to get the right of kindling to boost your Estus count up to 20, but you can kindle bonfires to 10 automatically without it. You'd also have to have some humanity available, but if you are careful, that shouldn't be a problem. Not to mention that you could manage items and weapon and armor upgrading when you buy the appropriate items to allow this at bonfires. Narratively, leveling up at bonfires is a literal representation of fire bringing power to those who wield it. The opening cinematic of the game shows that the dragons were challenged after four people found four lord souls, which came from and look like fire. Aesthetically, leveling up at bonfires is an affirmation of the importance of fire to the Dark Souls universe. Fire fills your Estus flasks and they heal you. Bonfires are used to regenerate everyone. Fire produces light. Fire has become its own magic tree in-universe as pyromancy. And fire is the reason the entire Dark Souls world came to be the way it is. Finally, thematically, you use the fire to attain power, just like those that found the four Lord Souls. Gwyn was the Lord of Sunlight. Most of his attacks deal fire damage. He was the creator of the first flame and of the Age of Fire, so he parallels the entire empowering fire idea very well. This is all placed on top of the central theme that every fire eventually fades, and that is what most, including Gwyn, wanted to prevent in this story. To bring this back to Dark Souls 2, this game makes it where you have to return to Medulla in order to level up, in order to increase your Estus amount, to upgrade your weapons or armor, and to buy items to access certain areas. The bonfire's value has been drastically downgraded from what they were in Dark Souls 1. Each bonfire in Dark Souls 2 acts as a warping point, a means to tamper with invasions, a way to push sections of the game into New Game Plus, and act as checkpoints. Their utility to level your character up, upgrade items, and improve your resources has all been stripped out, and I cannot understand why. They may have thought that bonfires were too independent from the hub in Dark Souls 1, so they decided to force players back to the hub in Dark Souls 2 and 3 to compensate for this. Or they wanted to get more Demon Souls vibes into the game, as can clearly be seen by the health reduction system, the regeneration ring, and life gems in Dark Souls 2. It may have also been because they wanted warping from the beginning for ease of access to designing and playing through each area. Several areas cannot be physically returned to without warping, but we will cover that later. After listing all the reasons I think Dark Souls 1 bonfires were fantastic and how they fit into the world, I think they made a major mistake in this game and Dark Souls 3. One thing that led to this whole argument in the first place was that I was playing Dark Souls 3 and was getting annoyed at how I'd have to port to Firelink Shrine, go through a loading screen, and find where the Firekeeper was every time I wanted to level up. All they had to do was give you the option at a bonfire to circumvent this. That isn't necessarily Dark Souls 3's fault, as Demon Souls did it first, and Dark Souls 2 retroactively ruined Dark Souls 1's change. It's not necessarily an improvement in Dark Souls 1, but it is a much more significant design choice to have every checkpoint level you up that helps with immersion and consistent playing of the game, since you don't have to go through any loading screens with this system. Another reason this change bothers me is how Fire Keepers were present in Dark Souls 1, but you didn't need to talk to them in order to level up. That's an inconsistency in the universe that I can't unknow now. This is one reason why Dark Souls 1 is my favorite of the series, however imperfect some parts may be. Its sequels added very little to what was established in Dark Souls 1. Dark Souls 1 is the only game of the trilogy that is isolated. It isn't indebted to its prequel like Dark Souls 2 and 3 feel like they are, at least narratively. Getting back to our characters, the Emerald Herald tells you to seek the Old Ones, but doesn't mention that you don't have to kill all of them to access Drangleic Castle, since you only need 1 million souls to pass through the gate, and killing the Lost Sinner and completing that path gives you a fragrant branch of Yore to unlock the statue blocking your path into Shaded Woods, and then the Shrine of Winter. This is a run where I only did the Lost Sinner's path and farmed as many souls as I could from that pathway. Using the bonfire ascetic I spawned with, and one I picked up, I was able to bypass all of the other areas and skip directly to Drangleic Castle. Mind you, there are three more pathways that I skipped, 
with two of them leading to DLC areas. This shows that the developers weren't thinking about the entire world exploration and progression as a whole, but each area individually. Then they slapped on the 1 million rule to make sure players were the right level for Drang Lake Castle when they reached it. This is incredibly lazy, and doesn't add anything to the experience when you view it this way. What if players grind for a while and don't notice the other areas? Too bad for them, I guess. I didn't even know that the path to Seldora existed until after I finished the game a few times. From what I've read, they have fixed this in Scholar of the First Sin, where you need to kill each old one, but that is one positive over many negatives. Anyway, after talking to the Emerald Herald, you can see the famed Bearer Seek Seek Lest skipping that most players will go through to level up faster. The Emerald Herald recites this phrase before allowing the player to level up. I don't know who made this a thing, but it is annoying to deal with. The Maiden in Black and Demon Souls forced you through it like this game in Dark Souls 3 do, but I dislike it there too, so don't think I'm just hating on Dark Souls 2 here. I think Mr. Matosis explains the flaws of this best. When leveling up in Demon Souls, the Maiden in Black would recite a sort of incantation about souls. Anyone who's played the game for any decent length of time can probably repeat it word for word. The phrase she says appears when the player enters the level up screen, and as they think about their stats it continues to play in the background. The Emerald Herald has a somewhat similar phrase which she recites, but it's all front loaded before the menu instead of playing in the background. Forcing players to get through four sentences before they can level up is only going to build resentment towards a character they're clearly supposed to like. The bigger problem though is that this issue was already solved, and yet for some reason it's now implemented in a much worse manner. Spot on. After I finish talking to her, you may notice that I am putting all of my levels into ADP, or adaptability. This is THE cheapest way that the developers of Dark Souls 2 make the game more difficult. As you can see, leveling ADP also increases my AGL, or agility. Agility directly affects iframes. For those who don't know, iframes are a fundamental part of the Soulsborne series, in that you have an option to dodge or roll through an attack without taking any damage at all. This is because you are given a certain number of iframes in a roll which render you invincible for a moment. This is a common way that I and several other players will avoid damage if we'd rather dodge than block. You know, like in all those videos on YouTube with people rolling around all the time? It's all based on timing. It is a much riskier choice to make, but a much more viable one for anyone, as every character or build can do this. The roll is affected by your weight and armor in Dark Souls 1, but your iframes go up in relation to these stats in a sort of ratio. This means that the less you wear, the faster your roll will be, but the lower your iframes will also be. Even though your iframes will be lower here, you will still have enough to get through most attacks if dodged at the right time. Dark Souls 2, on the other hand, tied iframes to a stat instead of leaving it as something balanced among different builds and armor combinations. They not only did that, but also lowered your iframes in general to 5 when at 85 agility, which means you will be invincible for 0.1667 seconds. At 10 iframes from 92 agility, you will be invincible for 0.3333 seconds. Finally, at 16 iframes from 116 agility, you will be invincible for 0.5333 seconds. Doesn't sound like much of a difference, but most attacks pass through the player in a fraction of a second anyway, so this difference in the time you spend invincible is very significant, especially for new players who don't understand what is wrong with rolling in Dark Souls 2. Basically, the best iframe roll has you invincible for three times the number of frames that the base amount gives. That's a lot of iframes. Add this to the questionable hitboxes some enemies have, and you won't know which thing caused your death. Agility also affects the rate that you consume Estus, Life Gems, and Divine Blessings. However, the change isn't as significant as the change in iframes. This wouldn't be much of an issue if the description of agility was more specific than boosts evasion and other actions. What kind of description is that? How vaguer could you get? Tying this important function of the series to a stat means that players will stuff their opening levels into adaptability in order to get an adequate amount of iframes that all the other games in the series provide at the base. This would be like making an RPG require you to spend in-game currency to get your fireball to do damage when you know it should at the baseline of having a fireball. This is one of the more frustrating bits to the development of Dark Souls 2, and it is not the last, but we will get to that later. Some may say that this was better than Resistance in Dark Souls 1, but I heavily disagree. Resistance was a helpful stat, but largely unnecessary. 
Adaptability is absolutely necessary, but only because the developers screwed up the iframe system. When you explore the rest of Majula, you can find a few other items and NPCs, such as Crestfallen Saldan, Blacksmith Lenegrast, Sweet Shaoqua the Cat, and Malin the Armorer. Lenegrast is a hollow and has moved his gear into the building next to him, but someone locked it up so he can't use it. He will then ask the player to help find the key, which we will see later on. Malin the Armorer is a timid man who sells armor and shields, and resides in the house to the left when facing the pit from the bonfire. He is from Vulgan, a place of traders and the like, and he didn't have the funds to succeed, so he left to strike gold, but ultimately hasn't succeeded. He makes an interesting comment about the Blue Sentinels running everything in Vulgan, and that they do it for the greater good, but he believes it to be hogwash. Malin is essentially Domnal from Dark Souls 1. He sells special boss gear after making enough purchases from him. I'd rather it unlock once the boss is dead, but I can't choose how he does his business. You can also find a chest in his house that gives you a Titanite Shard to upgrade your weapon early on, if only slightly. The building in the middle is locked for now, but the well next to it has a rock tied to a rope. After hitting the rope, a hollow body will come up and you will find the first Estus Shard in the game. As you can probably tell by now, the Estus system has been tweaked. You no longer spawn with 5 Estus and can upgrade them in clumps of 5 beyond that at bonfires. Instead, they are items scattered throughout the game that you must find. They also heal over a short period of time instead of instantly. These are things that I am both for and against, as it is a cool and interesting change from Dark Souls 1 to hide the Estus around the world and have them heal slower, but it also makes way for life gems. Life gems are like the grass in Demon Souls. There are different types that heal for fixed amounts, and you can farm them. The problem with this is that the base life gem heals for 500 hit points and heals slowly over time. That wouldn't be that bad on its own, but you can have up to 99 of these on you at any given time, not counting the beefier life gems you can collect. This means that you have 49,500 health points worth of regeneration in your inventory at any one time. This has ridiculously imbalanced the healing system in the game but it gets worse once you realize that you can purchase them from the hub later on. We will talk about that when we get there, but the developers did not seem to put thought behind how this overabundance of healing items would affect the game. The NPC in the building to the right of the pit is Sweet Shaoqua the Cat. She sells items of interest like the Cat's Ring, which is needed for traversing the pit early on, Homeward Bones, Ring of the Evil Eye, which restores health upon killing an enemy, and others. She is aware of what you are at different points in the game, as she will reference you being the king once you complete the story. She also gives a brief description of Covenants and of the man by the sea, Crestfallen Saldan, and the rock behind Majula along the cliff called the Victor Stone. The Victor Stone is a covenant where you don't get NPC summons for boss fights, enemies deal more damage, enemies have more health, enemies take less damage, and enemy players are still able to invade. There is no description of these effects, however and it just asks you to join without any details. This is terrible for a new player, as you can accidentally go into what would be considered New Game Plus. In between the locked building and the cat's house, you will find three pigs. These little mongrels show how hard it is to hit certain enemies with certain weapons. When locked on and at point blank, you will most likely miss them with the broadsword. This is annoyingly stupid, as anyone could stab a small pig with a sword if they were directly in front of them. Moving along to the cliff, we meet Crestfallen Saldan. He tells us about the Blue Sentinels and that they protect others. We learn that he is undead like the player, and he gives a description of Majula and of the intended starting areas that are the Forest of Fallen Giants or the other path towards Hades Tower of Flame. He tells of the four old ones and how we will face invaders at every turn. I decide to join this covenant mainly for the dialogue showing and for the ring as the rings affect covenant activation. He also lets you know that you can summon others to help you. Right next to him is a plaque that shows the death counter. It counts how many deaths players have had in the game. Why is this here? Why does it exist? It is so stupid to have this placed in-game like this, let alone to have it at all. Some games provide statistics about your playthrough or the game in general, and I think that is a pretty cool idea to see statistics about each player or playthrough. Here. It's just how many times you and others have failed to get good, or to realize the cheap tactics used throughout the game. After talking to everyone in Majula, we're going to visit the area we ultimately need to progress to. We find Benhart of Hugo stuck at the entrance to Shaded Woods. 
A statue blocks the way through, and he says that the statue unsettles him, and he wonders if someone was turned to stone. He is correct, and this is when we must find a fragrant branch of yore to unfreeze the statue. This is somewhat inverted from Dark Souls 1, where you had more or less one or two main paths to go down until you reached the Lord Vessel, and then the world opened up significantly afterwards. Dark Souls 2 opens a little after the beginning and railroads it once you hit Dranglayet Castle. Majula opens up two areas at the beginning, but actually connects to five. This chart shows the different routes possible in Dark Souls 2. Black bars represent connectors, gray bars represent connectors with requirements to be met or are required to be visited before more areas are unlocked, and each area is abbreviated. As you can see, the opening areas lead to the end of that path at Sinner's Rise, whereas the red, blue, green, and purple paths are mostly straight shots towards the end. After you finish one, you will come back to Majula and try another path. They literally have bonfires specifically designed to only take you back to Majula once you reach the end of each path. I'll talk about that stupidity later. My main point with this is to show how Dark Souls 2 suffers from a more extreme form of linearity than Dark Souls 1 does. Now, Dark Souls 1 had some areas locked off at the hub, but they still had an option to access them with a master key, which you can equip at the start of the game from the character creation menu. This is a great tool for players who replay the game and want to grab certain items before they really start progressing. Dark Souls 2 doesn't have this option, as you will only be able to reach the Forest of Fallen Giants or Hades Tower of Flame first, since the other paths are blocked with item, miracle, or NPC requirements. However, I can understand why the Dark Souls 2 developers may have changed the opening into a more streamlined experience. Dark Souls 1 had some marketing issues that played up the difficulty more than how challenging the game really was. This caused some players to go to the Catacombs or New Londo Ruins or Blight Town first, which resulted in them dying over and over because those enemies are significantly stronger than those in the Undead Burg. The Undead Burg is, more or less, the next area that most players will explore after arriving at Firelink Shrine. The enemies are simple to read and aren't too tough. The other areas have enemies that hit much harder and have much more health, so players would learn on their own that these areas are too tough for now, and that they should come back when they are stronger. Dark Souls 2 removes the player learning this, and gives them two options to start in areas that aren't too difficult compared to the rest of the game. On paper, this isn't an issue, but when you consider how many enemies they place in these areas, their damage output, and the terrain, these areas can be just as frustrating as later ones, maybe even more so because of the lack of gear, levels, and understanding of the mechanical changes. The first area we'll be heading to is Hate's Tower of Flame, but you'll notice the device in the room on the way. This opens Huntsman's Cops after you defeat Dragon Rider and talk to the NPC directly after him. Or you can open it if you use a miracle. Kind of a strange choice to limit it this way, but we will come back to this area later. One thing that always bugged me about this connecting area to Hades Tower is the long hallway leading to a sewer system that leads up into the actual area. One long hallway leads to a sewer, and that leads you to Hades Tower of Flame? Why would this be designed this way? It doesn't make sense to build the only path to Hades Tower through a sewer. Before anyone mentions the depths from Dark Souls 1, that was an actual sewer level that was placed in a believable position in the world. This is just a couple hallways with water that lead to an almost ocean area from a coastal hub. They could have connected Huntsman's Cops to the tunnel and had Hades Tower connect by going along the edge of the coast until you found a bonfire. Something like the second half of Tomb of the Giants. Instead, it's patchworked into connecting through a sewer. Once we reach the actual area itself, you'll notice how the environment is already odd. It looks like some of Hades Tower, or at least the area around it, fell into the ocean at some point, as well as strange, thin spires of rubble jutting out of the water. I don't know how this place was laid out, but it must have been a doozy when everything fell into the ocean. As you can see, I go to Hades Tower first because the enemies are fairly simple to deal with, and they drop a large number of souls per kill. Not to mention the two bosses of the area, with one of them being an easy kill. These mace enemies represent a strange decision on the part of the enemy design in this area. They have a few attacks that vary widely in terms of punishment for the player. You can see here that this mace dude has two overhead slam attacks that are fairly easy to dodge and are very exploitable. They have another attack that is more of a slash that can be heavily damaging and is hard to dodge the first few swings. The silver lining to the mace dudes is that they don't respawn and that they drop sublime bone dust. This is used to increase your Estus health recovery amount. You'll find these scattered throughout the game on different enemies. 
The level design here is something that I really dislike when it is done this way. It encourages cheap tactics for both you and the enemy. What I'm talking about is the environmental kills possible in this area. Because so much of it is open and leads to the drop of death, both you and the enemies are susceptible to being insta-killed because of a mistake or an attack pattern being exploited. I am perfectly okay with traps in games. They can be rewarding because you use something in the environment to your advantage, which any sane adventurer would do. This could have been done well by having old siege weaponry scattered about for players to use, but instead we get the drop of death. Another aspect of this level that I dislike is the way the boss arena for Dragon Rider works. You have to fight him on a platform surrounded by water, or pull two levers to raise platforms to prevent him from insta-killing you by knocking you off. One way you can work around this, though, is that Dragon Rider is susceptible to being shot from where the first lever is. I did a test on my magic run where I attempted to shoot him down with a basic bow and arrows, and I got him down to one hit point. I think the game has been patched where he won't die unless you are actually in the arena, but once you shoot him enough, he will be one poke away from death. I don't recommend doing the fight this way, as it takes quite a lot of arrows, and he will raise his shield to block most of the damage they do after a little bit. It's much faster to fight him normally, as he has simple attack patterns that are easily exploitable. You can cheese him off of the ledge if you don't raise any platforms, but this can also be tricky because of hitboxes and your ADP stats at the time. There is a summon, Masterless Glencore, right next to his arena that does a decent amount of damage to both Dragon Rider and the Ornstein clone that we will see later. I recommend using him as he is very tough, has strong damage, and you can summon him for both fights in the area. You do have to drag him up to the old copycat, but that isn't too hard to do. Once you defeat Dragon Rider, you will go up to the bonfire where you will meet Lycia. She sells miracles and is the NPC used to open Huntsman's Cops once you speak to her. One interesting part of her dialogue is that she almost says that she can gull people and corrects it by saying, help the gullible by teaching the good word. Gull, in this context, is usually tied to those who are easy to fool. This is where we get gullible from. This hints at Lycia having an ulterior motive for coming to Drang Laic, other than helping the people of this land. She is reminiscent of several con men that use religion as a manipulation tool to gain wealth, power, and the like. She is also somewhat reminiscent of Petrus from Dark Souls 1, as he was a man of the church and had his own more devious plans. The only difference is that Lycia moves around a little while Petrus was always sitting on his holy tush in Firelink Shrine. Now let's check out the optional boss of this area, Ornstein Clone. <laughs> uh, sorry, I mean Old Rehash, uh, what is up in my script? I mean Old Dragon Slayer. If you couldn't tell, this is a copy of Ornstein from the Ornstein and Smo fight in Dark Souls 1, but with no counterpart, no second phase, and his attacks deal dark damage instead of lightning damage. In other words, a lesser encounter than before. This is one of the earliest examples of Dark Souls 2 repeating or referencing assets from Dark Souls 1, even if it doesn't make any sense in-universe. Now, fan service is a tricky thing. I'm not going to argue for or against fan service here, but I am going to argue that this level of fan service in the Souls games is stupid. Especially with the way this game and Dark Souls 1 reflect their stories and themes of forgetting and things fading away. Why would Ornstein be here? It doesn't explain it very thoroughly on the wiki or from item descriptions, so I don't see why he would be here. Secondly, why is this particular boss still in the world if all the others have faded into nothing from Dark Souls 1? There's a lot of theories around why this boss is here, but at best, it's an okay reference, and at worst, it's a cheap rehash. I think it's stupid, but feel free to think differently. Once you kill him, you will get the Leo Ring, just like when you beat him in Smo in Dark Souls 1, and then you can talk to a Blue Sentinel. He's a bit of a pain, and won't tell you anything unless you are a Blue Sentinel, so I usually just ignore him every time I play this game. If you are a blue sentinel, great, but if not, he's just kind of there. After talking to him, you'll find a bonfire down some steps, and we'll get to exploring the other starting area of the game. I head back to Majula and go down a path by the cliff that leads us to the Forest of Fallen Giants, the tutorial plus of the game, as the enemies have low health and don't do too much damage. As you can see, the enemies are very mild compared to the ones in Hades Tower, but here you can also see how ranged attackers will deal with you. This is a small improvement over the ranged attackers in Dark Souls 1, as these enemies will lead their shots. It also shows the extreme stagger time that headshots will do to you. They stun you for two seconds, which doesn't sound like much, but it can mean life or death for the player if they are in a tough spot. 
This wasn't in Dark Souls 1 for the player, and I can understand why they would do it. But this is not affected by armor at all, which ruins any realism argument for this inclusion. I then move up to the area where you can be attacked by three dudes and an archer, which can have disastrous results if you don't see them coming. Thankfully, I managed to dispatch them quickly. This area also shows you the Black Knight equivalent in Dark Souls 2, the Hade Knights. These enemies are very poorly made. Their damage is usually high, their attacks can be very fast, they have a lot of health per the areas they are in, and, if that wasn't enough, their attack animations and telegraphing are frantic and unpredictable. They do give the impression that these enemies are blind, and they are passive unless you attack them, so I guess the developers get style points for that. These enemies pop up along the pathway to the Lost Bastille. Remember the map graph from before? And there is one later on before the path to Drangleic Castle. The first knight drops the Hade Knight Sword, which is a decent weapon for the early game, as it has fairly simple requirements to use and does decent damage as well as being a lightning weapon, which is frankly overpowered compared to many other specialty weapons in the game. After defeating and finishing this area, I go through a small fog wall that leads us into a few enemies with two of them waiting for an ambush. This is an encounter that I like, because it gives you two options. Run down the path and deal with the ambush, or go through the hole in the wall to deal with the two ambushers and backstab the third enemy waiting outside in the hallway. This area in particular will later show that there are hints of good ideas when it comes to the level design of this game. But this area is one of the highlights so prepare yourself for later areas of the game to be... underwhelming. We eventually battle our way up to the second bonfire in this zone, and we get another Estus Flask Shard and a small white soapstone. We then talk to the vendor here, who will later sell us life gems. She also has a Pharos Lockstone and the key to Blacksmith Lenigrass's house. I hope she and Lenigrass don't get into a fight when he finds out she had it. The Pharos Lockstone will be used later to find a ring, but I'll talk about that soon. After I jump to the area below, you can see that an ambush is prepared for you when you enter this little cave. This area can provide an instant kill in the right situations, because you will be trapped by the guards and hammered by the lizard. This is something that will become much more common as you progress. The area loops back into the route we took to get to the second bonfire through a hole in the wall, which is nice to have, especially considering that you can jump across from the opposite side to get to the hole, or climb a ladder to get back up there. Some small things, but the options are a nice touch. Now I head back to Majula to unlock Lenigrass blacksmithing hut, because why give him the key, right? After unlocking it, you now have access to a blacksmith for upgrading, repairing, and buying basic materials. Another nice touch is that you can find a bow in his hut from the chest if you haven't already found one. This is important for later on because of a strategy that I both love and hate, but we have to get there first. You'll notice here that I buy a rapier. The rapier is a small, fast weapon that is a very good choice for an early game and even late game weapon, as it attacks quickly, is very light, it does a decent amount of damage, and it is very useful in confined spaces. It's also purchasable very early on, and doesn't require much farming to get your stats up to use it, so you can get it and upgrade it quickly, and even have multiple rapiers that can serve different functions when you infuse them. You can also get the Astok here, which is a slightly different weapon than the Rapier, but has a slash attack that the Rapier doesn't. It's up to you on which to use, but I prefer the Rapier because of its speed. Now I'll head back to the Forest of Fallen Giants. Once we return, I'll head down this ladder and you'll notice two doors here and a third in the next room. Of the first two doors, the one next to the ladder is a shortcut to the main boss of the area once you make your way around to it and the other leads to an item and an area you will need to come back to near the end of the game. The third door in the other room leads to an optional area, with a few items to loot and some gear that you'll see later. I then go through this fog wall and fight several enemies on some platforms while working our way towards an NPC in the cave on the opposite end. One thing I found quite annoying is that when you jump from the roof of the middle building to the platform on the opposite side, the enemy fires arrows at you. This isn't bad in itself, but the arrows can stunlock you mid-jump sometimes, which will cause you to fall into the water and die. The momentum of a 160 pound adult won't stop because a 1 pound arrow hits them. That would be stupid. After I survive the jump, I'll enter the cave where I believe you're meant to be killed by the Indiana Jones boulder, and a little farther up, I'll find the NPC, Kale. Kale is a cartographer and seems to begin to be going hollow based on his uncertain reasons for coming to Drangleic and his scatterbrained speech. 
He hasn't become completely hollow, and won't go hollow in this game, period. But he must certainly be on his way if he can't remember the curse of the undead, or why he came here. The curse is something that I don't think you'd forget willingly. He gives me the key to the mansion in Majula, and mentions that he heard some disturbing noises below the basement of the building. I'll check that out when we return, but for now, I will move up to the first shortcut leading to the second bonfire. You'll notice the message saying be wary of boss, and we will discuss this in a moment, but first I want to activate the shortcut through the wall. Using the fire bombs, you can blow a hole in the wall that lets you skip through some of the area. It looks good, but doesn't really change the fact that you can simply go down the ladder and up the branch vine things and reach the same point after killing seven enemies. Does this count as a shortcut? Yes, but it doesn't really shorten the journey by much. Maybe a few seconds or so, but that's it. Once the shortcut is opened, I go up onto the short platform after the boss message and trigger the encounter with the pursuer early, as you can face him later if you skip this bit. I'll be showing both encounters, so don't worry about missing one. This is a fight that I really like, and I'd say that the pursuer is a much harder and stronger boss than the main boss of this area. He is much faster, has much more health, and you don't get a summon for him. He has reasonable telegraphing and balanced damage to speed, but he is very susceptible to being baited once you understand his attacks. But I'd say that's fair of most bosses once you've had enough time with them. This encounter with him can be a pain if you aren't aware of a surprise boss. If your weapons are weak, broken, or if you are out of healing items, then this can really suck. But you'll adapt quickly or run away since you can do that here. Once you beat him, you will get the Ring of Blades, which increases damage you deal with physical attacks. This is one of the rings that you get from this area, and I will use it for a good while. After heading back to Majula, I enter the house that was locked earlier with the key given to me by Kale. The main room has another Pharos lock stone, and when you go to the upper floor, you'll find a chest with upgrading materials and torches. After entering the basement, you will see something scrawled on the ground here. Once you defeat one of the four old ones, a small flame will light on the ground. Based on that, and who and what Kale is, it should be easy to see that this is a map of Drang Lake, although an extremely rough map. Kale will eventually meet us down here, and his dialogue changes as you progress through the game, and as the map changes. When I head into the area below the basement, I'll fight a skeleton that drops a human effigy. I'll also pick up an Estus Flash Shard from a corpse and a soul vessel from a chest. The interesting and potentially frustrating thing about the skeleton is that every new game plus adds another skeleton to the room. So New Game will have 1, and New Game plus 7 will have 8 of them. I believe it stops at 8, as several things don't change after you hit New Game plus 7, or play through 8, as you can call it. That is a much lesser issue compared to what the Soul Vessel allows. I'll head back to things with Twixt, and you'll understand why. After getting a Soul Vessel, you can return to the old ladies in things with Twixt to use the item. The Soul Vessel lets you respect your stats at any time, although it will only respect to whatever your base stats were from class selection. This is something that I have a huge problem with. This effectively removes the seriousness of how you bank your souls, since they give you a way to change everything you can do from the moment you spawned in. This removes the experience of making a mistake in your build, or of choosing your stats wisely, because why worry about it if you can respec whenever you want? It takes away the commitment that demon souls set as a constant thing to worry about, or be considerate of when progressing through the game. Once I return to the Forest of Fallen Giants, I'll go down the path that the first shortcut opened up to. One thing that you may have noticed earlier is that the throwing knives do quite a lot of damage, as do most throwables in the game. They have been significantly buffed since Dark Souls 1, and it can be called an issue because of how easy they are to get and use, but it would be a minor issue at most. It leads to some interesting build ideas though. Once I fight my way through and go down the ladder, I'll come to one of the more annoying parts of the game. This room has several enemies in it, and three of them are on Ballista, which do considerable damage, especially at this early level. Add that they can stunlock most players without the aid of siege engines, and that there are four of them, and you have a recipe for an annoying spam area. However, once you beat them, you can go down a ladder and open a chest to get upgrading materials, and use a Pharos Lockstone to get more upgrading materials, and the first Chloranthi Ring in the game. One thing I find interesting about this area specifically is that the trap chest will either use a poison cloud or use an area of effect crossbow attack to hurt you. This is true of several other chests later in the game. The poison is much easier to deal with as the crossbow attack deals heavy damage and can kill you if you aren't careful. 
This also highlights an issue with the life gems in the game, as one life gem can almost completely negate the typical poison duration. Afterwards, I get the Chloranthi Ring, which increases stamina regeneration, and a Titanite Slab from the chest in the hidden room. There are a few problems with this. The first being that the Titanite Slab is the last upgrading material needed for basic weapon upgrades, so giving it here when we won't have access to large Titanite Shards or Titanite Chunks, the prerequisites to slabs, makes it pretty useless to us now, as well as there being several other slabs throughout the game. I tend to have a harder time finding chunks than I do slabs in this game, because certain enemies drop slabs, and those enemies don't despawn like the rest. I genuinely think this is a mistake, and not intentional, as this is a bizarre decision for the development team to make. If you got the slabs later in the game from bosses or tougher enemies, I could understand, but this is such a strange decision to make for weapon progression, so I have to believe that the developers didn't really think this through, or someone made an error. Another problem highlighted here is that the illusory walls in the game are sometimes required to have a Pharos Lockstone. This means that you may miss important parts of the game or items because you will know where the wall is, but not have the resources to actually open it. Add that certain areas have useless or trap areas that eat up your Lockstones, and you're looking at a very unpredictable situation on your first playthrough. Afterwards you will learn where they are and prepare for them, but that can still annoy many players if they know where everything is, but don't have a way to get the lock stones unless they visit specific enemies or areas that could potentially be locked off or much farther down the road. One thing about this area is the room adjacent to this one. The door can't be opened from your end, but if you hit the door, then the halls behind will open it for you. This is something I like, as it takes a little ingenuity to construct and figure it out, but that is all undone by a message displaying what to do. Afterwards, I open the chest that gives you a large titanite shard and the life ring that increases your overall health. Once I leave, you will see Pate. Pate is somewhat like Patches from Dark Souls 1, except he doesn't really screw the player over. Instead, he screws over another NPC that we will see later. He mentions the area through the doorway to his right, and once I enter it, I will be trapped in the area. As I battle my way through, I will find an illusory wall at the bottom of the stairs that gives me a sorcerer's staff and an amber herb. Both items used for magic builds, which are useful if you want to experiment with your build as you go. When you complete this area and return to Pate, he will give you a white sign soapstone and explain the summoning feature to you. With that, I'm done with him for now. As I go through the next area, you'll notice the giant and the alas, nothing happened. This is because you need to get a special item to activate a special sequence from each giant corpse. After climbing the ladder, you will be able to deal with the enemies that throw firebombs at you from above. After dropping down to the main area again, you'll see the turtle armored enemy. I use the firebombs here to take him out easily as he is right in the line of fire. Once I enter the next room, you will see two ways to go, but the door is locked off for now. The other leads to the second shortcut to the second bonfire of the area, and the boss. Before I go there, I go up this giant sword that leads to an ambush. This is an encounter that is very dangerous because of the movement system and how small the platform is to stand on but is easily dealt with once you know how best to deal with the enemies. After going through the fog wall, I find a Titanite Wizard. Here, you can see that the first attack makes contact, but the second does not. You can also see that I switched from my Rapier to another weapon, because the Rapier cannot hit the Titanite Lizard here because the Rapier has no downward swing. This shows the problems with how focus affects weapon swings, and the fact that some weapons cannot hit certain targets especially the smaller ones you probably want to hit most, like the Titanite Lizards. It's almost trolling us that the developers were able to make the Lizard hitboxes more accurate than most enemy attacks. After finishing that up, I will make my way back to the door that leads to the bonfire, and I will take the lift down to the boss of this area, the Last Giant. Here you can summon Pei to help you in this fight, which makes it go a little faster, but he's really just a meat shield. This is most likely the first boss players will see from a cutscene. This shows one dumb decision by the developers. They added a bloody, pulsating overlay to the beginning of boss cinematics. As Mr. Matosis puts it, This little bloody screen thing that pulses at the start of these cutscenes is incredibly dumb. I have no other words for it. All I can do is point out the absurdity of it. Someone at FromSoft decided what these cutscenes were missing was some kind of bloody overlay at the start for some reason. Because of that decision, someone made or procured a bloody texture from somewhere, then someone else had to animate it to pulse at the start of the video, and someone else had to do the sound effect for it. The end result is a cutscene that looks far worse than it did initially. 
Again, my problem here isn't that I dislike it. I realise it's a very small issue. The real problem is that it was completely fine in the previous games, but got changed for absolutely no reason. When you stop and think about it, it says a lot about the way this game was designed. Nobody was looking for this kind of effect to be added to the cutscenes, but some people like myself would surely dislike it. They only stood to lose out by adding it, and yet they added it anyway, because they just weren't thinking. Somebody just put it together, and it made it into the final game without anyone examining what the game actually gains by having it there. I don't think I could say it better. When you get past that, you can see that the last giant can clearly move rubble around that weighs much more than you do. So it would make sense if this boss could smack you around a bit, but we just get the average knocking to the ground. However, most bosses are ridiculous until they actually have to fight you, so it's more of a consistent nitpick than anything else. This is one of the easiest bosses in the game because his attacks are slow, fairly telegraphed, and he doesn't have much health. However, he does hit very hard per his level, and you may fight him after you've already fought harder bosses like Ornstein Reborn or the Pursuer, so this boss is very iffy when it comes to how hard he actually is when you meet him or when you are supposed to meet him. After defeating him, I'll get his soul in the Soldier Key, which opens all the doors I've not been able to open so far. The description of the last giant soul raises some issues, because the description is more fitting for the giant lord later on than this enemy. This may be the same enemy, and time has withered his strength away, but then we get into how time travel works in the Souls games, and it seems to be a closed loop where the undead player already did everything in the past, so it lets the present move forward, but you experience them out of order. I'm not a time travel expert, so feel free to see if this is coherent enough as a valid time travel argument or not. I'm also not sure how this giant was dragged down here, as I seriously doubt he could fit through that hole in the wall or the ceiling. When I leave the area, I then come to the door at the opposite end of the bonfire ladder. Here I find a door that asks me to produce the symbol of the king. I will come back here later. Off to the side is a chest that houses a torch and the ring of restoration. This ring regenerates your health very slowly, and with that ring added, you will have a full set of rings by the time you complete this area. This is something that is a very mixed bag for me. It's nice to have the rings that boost health, add health regen, increase stamina regen, and increase damage early on, but should they all be in one of the two opening areas? This may be the first area players come to, and they already have a full set of useful rings before they even complete a main objective in the game, or even move to another zone. After the developers play up the whole difficulty angle with the hag speech and the death counter at Majula, you wouldn't think that they would make it so easy to find all of these useful rings. Many of these rings you can use till the end of your playthrough. Personally, I keep the Chloranthi ring, the Ring of Blades, and their upgraded counterparts until I finish the game. The Health Regeneration ring and Life ring get replaced with some major buffing rings that I will talk about later on as well. All these rings make the game much easier once you get through this area, and since this area is arguably the easiest real area in the game, this makes for a very strong start for the player, especially with the regeneration ring, but hinders the whole difficulty part of this game. After I return to the bonfire, we talk to Melentia, who returns to Majula after you exhaust her dialogue after defeating the last giant. There she will sell life gems to you until you begin New Game Plus. Once we're finished talking to her, we go down the optional path of this area. As you can see from the turtle armored enemies, they have a large exploit of baiting their attack and simply rolling through it. I do this because they have a countermeasure to getting behind them. They fall over on you. What a great defense method, right? You can even tell how intelligent they are as I sit here and wail on one and he only reacts once he's near death. One thing that does bother me about these enemies is the stagger time they create. They can knock your character to the ground for almost 5 seconds. That's exceptionally long for any attack, even considering grab attacks that are supposed to take that long. They also have a combo move that will most likely kill you because of how hard they hit already added to a long combo move set. Once I get near the bonfire, I find a giant that is resting in peace that gives me a seed of a giant, which helps enemies in your world deal with invaders. We also find a leather outfit and a hunter's hat from a nearby chest. These items are a small upgrade if you're going for a light armor build. When I come back to the central bonfire, I can now go through the door that leads to the next zone. This area is where you battle the Pursuer if you haven't already defeated him, but this time you get a cutscene and a new way for him to kill you by charging you off the cliff. This 
This area also lets me drop down to pick up the Drang Leic set. I eventually find another dead giant and a giant bird's nest, and I activate the nest and the bird takes me to the next zone, the Lost Bastille. Before I head to the Lost Bastille, I am going to get an item necessary for traversing the pit. The Silver Cat Ring reduces fall damage greatly, but even with it, you will need a specific amount of health before you will survive the drops necessary to reach the Grave of Saints, the area after the pit. After I purchase the ring, you can see that Melentia from the Forest of Fallen Giants is now in Majula, and she also has an infinite amount of life gems available now. This, along with each life gem costing 300 souls, leads to the greatest imbalance in Dark Souls history towards your health resources. Now, before reaching even one of the old ones, you have access to 99 basic healing items that can heal almost 50,000 hit points worth of damage. The difficulty has now been reduced more than ever for the game from this point on. Now let's get back to the Lost Bastille. The Lost Bastille actually has two entrances to this zone, one being after defeating the Pursuer, if you fought him later, and one after defeating the Flexile Sentry in No Man's Wharf, which we haven't gotten to yet. I will talk about how these two entrances work once I reach the second one, but they both take you to the beginning of this area. From here, you can see one thing that makes this map a little harsh from the get-go. The rubble here is one way, meaning that you can't make it back to the bonfire after passing it without warping or dying. This would be okay, at least to me, if the cutoff point wasn't 20 meters from the bonfire, but once you have life gems, you should be able to have enough resources to make it to another bonfire. In this room, you will see that there is an explosive barrel to topple over the edge to kill the dogs, but be careful. The explosion can hit you through the floor... sometimes. Once I walk through the door, I will get the covetous silver serpent ring and the antiquated key. The silver serpent ring increases the amount of souls you get by 10%, and is particularly useful for farming. The antiquated key will be used later. Once I reach the corner tower, you will see the boxes and barrels in the way of the door. These are placed so that when you come to the Lost Bastille from the other entrance, you will not be able to open the door from the inside of the tower unless you have a large weapon to go through the door, or arrows to break the rubble from the lower platform. I'm not quite sure why the developers would design it this way, as the bonfire here could have been a nice semi-shortcut if you came through the No Man's Wharf path, and if the bonfire was reachable from that side. Just a strange decision to wall off this part when you'll only need to go through it once to access the ring and the key, and you could warp away to the other entrance from the bonfire. Regardless, you can roll through the blockages and access the door to talk to Lucatiel of Mira, who can be found earlier in No Man's Wharf. She lets you know that you can call on her for assistance. She will have her summon be available just before you fight the first old one, the Lost Sinner, at the end of this pathway. I would like to highlight a problem I have with what she says and where she is summoned once we reach the Ruin Sentinel boss, but that comes later. As I go through the pathway that leads to the wharf entrance, you'll notice that these enemies are all facing the opposite direction from the way I am coming, because Dark Souls 2 AI have been coded, mostly, to attack you from one direction, so if you come from behind, they will have issues. This is something that was already fixed in Dark Souls 1, where enemies would mostly have an aggro radius instead of aggroing by sight, or the path you take. I don't know why this downgrade was made, if it was even intentional, but it makes dealing with enemies very underwhelming when you take a reverse approach. I killed the enemy at the top of the stairs with my bow, because that enemy has an explosive barrel that kicks down the stairs that is used to open up a bonfire, and give access to the other blacksmith in the game. If you melee attack him from behind, either he or you will destroy the barrel, and you won't be able to blow up the wall that leads to the other blacksmith, which is the easy way to get to the blacksmith. One thing that adds to the potential frustration of this section is that the barrel bounces around a lot, and can be hard to center on the wall you need to breach. Luckily, I have fire bombs to help breach the wall. After defeating the optional boss of the area, you will get a key that opens the door to the blacksmith, so you have multiple options to get to the blacksmith. This is nice, but that boss is terrible and hard to manage. You may not even have the resources to access it either. There is a locked gate here as well, but we will come back to this once we enter the area through the No Man's Wharf entrance. 
Once I make my way to the bonfire and then the building, you'll see all the chests have upgrading materials and that the blacksmith is a little off his rocker, as he isn't smithing anything and he's just blabbing about nothing. He also mentions, very briefly, that he ought to fetch a new ember. This hints that he needs an item to begin working again. The ember you need is in the iron keep zone that is much farther down the road, so try to keep that in mind when you have to wait a while before you can get it and infuse your weapons. After backtracking to the corner tower, I head into the middle building that has several enemies that will spam you if you aren't careful. There are five to seven enemies that you may have to deal with here at once, so be careful. Once you beat them, you will enter a room with a gate. I do not advise opening this gate, as there is another way around where you can skip some enemies. Head downstairs and find the ladder. You may notice the door leading to death here as well. This must have been great fun for players who didn't look before they left. After climbing up the ladder, you will see that you are on the other side of the gate, and that you have a summon available for the boss after the nearby fog wall. The summon is Pilgrim Belclare instead of Lucatiel. This is something that really doesn't make sense to me from a design perspective. Why would you give the player an NPC that says they will assist them about 30 meters back, and then give them an NPC summon of someone that they haven't seen in the game yet, and won't see anywhere else besides when you summon them? This doesn't make much sense to me, and there's a bit of an issue with this in Dark Souls 2 and in Dark Souls 1. There were times when you would talk to or defeat someone in Dark Souls 1 who would show up later to help you, like Maneater Mildred for the Quelag fight, and Solaire talking to you before the Bell Gargoyle fight. This was an issue in Dark Souls 1 as well, though, since Paladin Leroy wasn't anywhere besides summons, so it's not exclusively a Dark Souls 2 issue, but it's a shame that they didn't tweak it to make more sense. Once we summon Belclair, we engage the Ruin Sentinels. The Ruin Sentinels are one of the better fights in Dark Souls 2, as they do a much better job at the multiple opponents idea, more so than many other bosses do. The key to this fight is environmental awareness. If you fall off the first platform too early, then you will have to deal with all three Ruin Sentinels at once. If you can stay on the top platform, you can fight the first Ruin Sentinel individually, fight the second Ruin Sentinel for a decent amount of time, and get him to low health before engaging the third Ruin Sentinel. You can also use the summon as bait if you are a ranged character, or if you need to split the aggro of the two remaining Sentinels. As you can see here, I try to stay on the platform and defeat the first Ruin Sentinel before jumping down to help the summon kill the other two, and as we fight the two of them, I'm focusing mainly on keeping the aggro of the one I'm fighting. After defeating them, you'll notice all the illusory walls within the Ruined Sentinels arena that house a few items, and nothing in some cases. These can be opened during the battle, but are fogged up until you defeat the bosses. This is kind of a weird decision to include all these areas at the lower level, and have them contain very few items of high value. This is a good time to talk about the changes made to illusory walls from Dark Souls 1 to 2. Dark Souls 2 has you hit an interact button to trigger the illusory walls instead of attacking them, like in Dark Souls 1. This change is minor, but I'm pretty sure it was made to account for the durability of weapons, and gear in general, being drastically decreased. Overall, I think it's odd, but also nothing negative. Just a small change. Nothing more, nothing less. When I leave this area to reach the next bonfire, I will be attacked by an exploding enemy. This is such a cheap way to kill the player. You put an exploding enemy right after a boss fight that can leave a player with little health the first time through. The enemy doesn't even give souls when it dies, so it's only there to kill you if you get too close. After returning to Majula to level up and upgrade our weapons a bit, I head down the ladder next to the bonfire. This leads me to a room with a chest holding a priest chime, a dog, and a pharaoh's lockstone slot. The lockstone opens the Belfry Luna, which houses the Belfry Gargoyles, the optional boss of the area, and the Bellkeeper Covenant. I find the Bellkeepers hilarious because of the crazy idea that these dwarves would be able to defend the Bell in the first place. Then it becomes much less funny when you see how much damage these enemies can do. I join them here, but you have to deal with the extra dwarf Bellkeeper that spawns. Once you make it up to the third level, you'll notice a barred off fog wall. This leads to the boss. Going up to the fourth level lets you access the Bell, which is needed to open the gate blocking off the boss of this area. After dealing with everyone here, I jump into the boss fight with the Belfry Gargoyles. This is one of the worst fights in the game as far as I'm concerned. It's a repeated asset from Dark Souls 1. It's a spam fest where you not only have to deal with multiple gargoyles, but six of them now instead of two, when one of those two came in at half health. They have roughly the same attack patterns as the gargoyles in Dark Souls 1, and they have almost identical boss music compositions. 
This is just a lazy boss fight that tries to capitalize on nostalgia and difficulty instead of making the fight interesting with new mechanics or strategies to the fight. It's just the Bell Gargoyles again, but with more gargoyles. After defeating this atrocious boss, I run down to the bonfire and find one of the worst enemy encounters in the whole game. At the bottom of this ladder are Stogs and an invader. This is a terribly designed encounter after a terribly designed boss. It is frustrating to deal with several fast enemies that can stun lock you while also dealing with an invading NPC. The best strategy is to simply herd the dogs around over and over again until you can pick them all off. Then take on the NPC. Or you can do what I do when I have some decent ranged attacks. Cheese the dogs from the top of the ladder until you think the fight is manageable from the ground level. After defeating everyone, you get the Bastille Key, which is used to open some locked doors throughout the Lost Bastille and Sinner's Rise. Once I bank my souls and upgrade more gear, I return to the bonfire after the Ruined Sentinels, and go through the nearby doorway to progress further along the path to the Lost Sinner. Once you make it to a tower, you will see a staircase leading up and a doorway leading out onto the wall and some rooftops. The rooftops let you grab some items, and shows you another place to explore if you came through the wharf's entrance. You can jump down here, and you can find your way back to the blacksmith, but we won't go that way yet. If you jump to the opposite rooftop, you will climb the ladder and be in a room with two gates, side by side for some reason, and several explody enemies. These enemies are quite annoying, as they will just fall on you over and over while doing massive damage, but without damaging themselves. There are several of them set up in ambush spots throughout this area, and they can be quite a pain if you try to rush through it. Some of these enemies have a hard time activating properly, so this area can be easy once you understand the enemy placement. There are a few illusory walls that lead out onto the roof of some areas or through walls that will lead to items in hidden rooms. One of them lets you jump down to a chest and you use the cage to lift you back up. This room can be accessed from the bottom by going through the area that we were looking at earlier and using a ferrous lockstone to open an illusory wall. Once I return to the top, I will come to another annoying set piece in the game, Strade's Spamfire, as I call it. This is aptly named after the NPC turned to stone, and the fact that there are five exploding dudes here that can overwhelm you if you aren't careful. This statue of Strayed, like the statue along the Shaded Woods passage, requires a fragrant branch of yore to unfreeze. You will find one of them at the end of this path after defeating the Lost Sinner, but I will talk about Strayed more when I come back. After clearing the room, I use the key we gained after the Belfry spam fight to unlock this door that gives some firebombs and a petrified dragon bone. The dragon bone is an upgrading material for some special weapons, but not for the dragon tooth, which really confuses me. Once I make it to Sinner's Rise, you will notice how the bonfire is in the direct line of sight of the three crossbowmen. This means that once you warp here or die after resting here, you will respawn and immediately must worry about these enemies killing you and forcing you to lose your souls. One aspect that minimizes this threat is that 99% of enemies in Dark Souls 2 will despawn forever after you kill them enough times. This is a fix that I will usually use here, but it is still terribly designed both ways, as they put enemies right next to a bonfire where they can shoot you, and the enemies despawn permanently after a small number of deaths. There is so much changing of mechanics in this game from the first that it may as well be a fan-made version for the plebs of the world, who don't know what made Dark Souls such a great experience in the first place. Dark Souls 2 is the meme Dark Souls 1. No joke. After wiping those archers, I'll begin heading down to the Lost Sinners boss fight. Once again, you will have to deal with a few of these crossbow enemies before activating the lift. On the way down, I pop a human effigy to become human again, so I can summon Lucatiel since she will be very useful against the enemies here. But as you can see, these beefy dudes do quite a bit of damage and murder me. As I make my way back down, I'll talk about the way human effigies work compared to humanity. Human effigies, like humanity, are used to return you to your human form after being hollow, and as currency for certain things. The differences are that humanity can be consumed for health, requires a bonfire to unhollow you, they are used to increase your Estus count, are used for some covenant progression, and are used to switch invasions and summoning on by unhollowing yourself. Human effigies, however, can be used on the go, grant no health, and allow summons, but you can be invaded no matter what although the invasion rate goes up with certain items and while being hollowed. They decided to change this system around for some reason, and I'm not quite sure why. 
In my humble opinion, the Dark Souls 1 humanity system is superior to both this and Dark Souls 3's ember system. To me, it's more balanced, because it allows you to use humanity in several different ways by buffing certain abilities, increasing Estus amounts through kindling, allowing summoning, allowing invasions, and by the way you gain humanity through picking it up in the world or by defeating certain enemies, but without forcing you into human form. This was one thing I didn't like about the ember system in Dark Souls 3, as you always embered up after defeating a boss, regardless if you wanted to or not. I prefer it over the Dark Souls 2 effigy system because you lose a small percentage of health every time you go hollow, which I think is better than the Demon Souls penalty and can be reduced by a ring, but it is still annoying if players just don't want to play online or with summons. This is where the Dark Souls 1 system lets you play through the game without a health penalty, which is quite nice. Now, I know that there are settings to change how online works in the Dark Souls 1 Remaster and Dark Souls 3, but I still prefer that system of managing your hollowing, Estus, and online interactions manually. Feel free to enjoy whichever system you prefer, I just don't like Dark Souls 2's heavy penalties. Getting back to the game, you can summon Lucatiel for this boss for a specific purpose. You need to kill the boss while keeping her alive to complete her quest, and get the achievement associated with it, which can be a bit of a pain, because her AI will often have issues with the bridge up ahead. If you do defeat the Lost Sinner with her alive, that will be the first of three bosses defeated to complete her quest. I eventually reach a room with several exploding enemies and a few items to pick up. If you go through this area as intended by the developers, you will activate the door in the middle and be swarmed by all of the explodey dudes. The spam bush cometh! But I know their tricks, so I'm working around it by killing each explodey dude individually. You can use the Bastille key to unlock the doors on the upper level here to find some items and outright bypass the big gate that leads to the spam bush, which is nice, but only because the normal path is extremely annoying. You'll eventually make it to the Lost Sinners building, where you can open the doors and light two oil reserves on fire. This helps illuminate the boss arena, as it is pretty dark in there, and it helps with locking onto the boss. Don't ask me why the lock-on is so shoddy for this boss, because it's a little dark. With that said, let's fight the Lost Sinner. The Lost Sinner is a very simple fight, as she only hits hard, her attacks are fairly telegraphed, and are simple to learn and dodge. This fight does get much more difficult on New Game Plus, however, because two red phantoms will join the fight that use pyromancy against you. I would say that that is an okay twist, but the Lost Sinner herself is still an underwhelming boss fight, especially considering she is one of the four old ones, and they are equivalent to Gravelord Nido, Seath the Scaleless, the Bed of Chaos, and the Four Kings. After I defeat her, I move to the end of this pathway, and where we will find a chest holding a fragrant branch of yore needed to unfreeze the statues. After that, I find the first primal bonfire, which only warps you back to Majula. As Mahler mentioned in one of his Dark Souls 2 videos, primal bonfires are the developers saying, you've reached the end of this thread, please go back to the beginning. That's all these bonfires really do, but I have one old one down and three to go. After returning to Majula, the Emerald Herald pats me on the back for killing one of the Old Ones, which is a nice reprieve from the spam stun spam stun of the game. Now I'll return to the Lost Bastille to unfreeze Strayed. He describes himself as a wandering sorcerer, and he can trade some spells, rings, and items, but his main function is as a boss weapons and spells vendor. Simply bring him the souls of one of the bosses he can make a weapon out of, and he will give it to you for a few souls. This is much simpler and easier than in Dark Souls 1, where you had to upgrade specific weapons to a certain point, and then smith it at a specific smith to make them into boss weapons. One thing I find hilarious about some of these weapons is that the Dragon Rider weapons describe the Dragon Riders as King Vendrick's royal guard. No wonder the kingdom fell apart. After we finish laughing at boss weapons, we talk to Strayed a little bit and get some details about his history. He was frozen before Drangleic became Drangleic, so it's a little odd that he makes no mention of him being moved, and that whoever or whatever froze him didn't destroy him afterwards. Would have been easy. Just throw old statue straight over the edge of a cliff or into the ocean, and your problem is solved. Once I finished talking with Strayed, I head back to explore the No Man's Wharf path through the Lost Bastille, by going to the roof and jumping over to the path on the wall. Here you'll see another Hade Knight, this time with a spear. This one can be incredibly dangerous considering his reach, damage output, and speed, but luckily I killed him first try here. Afterwards, I head down into the courtyard area and kill a few dogs and another mummy dude, 
and make my way into the room with a hole in the wall. After clearing the room, I open a door to find that we are in the lower section of an area I visited before. There are four dogs and a couple of explodey dudes in the area once you activate the cage thing, so be careful not to get cocky. In the next room, you can fight more soldiers and use some Ferris lockstones to open up some chest rooms and the area we reached earlier by dropping down. Upon returning, I will go up a ladder and some stairs, and I will be above where the barrel-kicking mummy dude is near your second blacksmith. When we turn and go back, you'll see that I neglected to open up some chests in this room. One of them holds a twin blade, and the other a bone staff. Twin blades are one of my favorite weapons in Dark Souls 2, as they pump out decent damage, and their attack combo is good at dealing damage within a radius if you are being attacked from multiple angles at once. After going back to the courtyard area, I'll go along a small opening between two walls and find a chest with another Estus Flash Shard and a large Titanite Shard. Once that is done, I make my way towards the bonfire that is your introductory bonfire to the Lost Bastille if you came from No Man's Wharf. After taking an elevator down, we'll come to an area where there is a ship you cannot get on. This ship takes you from the boss of the wharf to here, but not in reverse. This could have been a cool back and forth path, but the developers skipped over backtracking ideas when designing this game. Then I head towards the gate, which connects to the rest of the area, and allows me to finish opening up this area, and with that, I'm done with progressing through the Lost Bastille. I eventually circle back to the bonfire just after Dragon Rider, and go down the stairs to the area leading towards No Man's Wharf, as I've said Wharf so many times that I'd actually like to get there and beat it so I can stop saying it. You'll find more of the same enemies from Hades Tower down here, and some items including a beefy halberd you can use if this is the first path you take. Once we reach the elevator, you may notice a slight problem. With this elevator going so far down, this puts the wharf somewhere below sea level. This is where you can really begin to see how each zone is more representative of the classic, level-selective old video games, instead of continuing Dark Souls 1's interconnected, geographically sound world. After a little exploring, you'll find a chest that holds the full night set for the Hade Warriors, if you want to roleplay, and I eventually make it to the bonfire of the area. All one of them. This is a little weird to me, as there are several bonfires nearby each other, but this whole area only has one. Just look at the entire Lost Bastille area. The Sinner's Rise bonfire was next to Strayed's bonfire, and the Wharf to Bastille bonfire is next to the Blacksmith bonfire. This just shows some of the inconsistencies in design for the game. I'm not hating on Dark Souls 2 for having too few or too many bonfires here. I just want it to be consistent. Dark Souls 1 usually had 1-3 to three bonfires in each area that you will loop back around to regularly, like the Undead Berg bonfire. Dark Souls 3 has a ton of bonfires, some even within sight of each other. The Dragon Slayer armor and the Grand Archives bonfires are literally like 50 meters from each other. Again, this isn't hating the quantity, this is criticizing the consistency. Now that I'm here, I can see Lucatiel again, even though she's not supposed to be here if she's already gone to the Lost Bastille. This is the beginning of the game showing that the NPCs are there for you instead of pursuing their own goals, which we will see much later as well. She mentions that this place is wretched, but not without traces of its former glory. I have a question. What's so glorious about a cavern with a small town and a ship in it? Yeah, it could be useful, but there isn't anything remotely glorious about it. I feel like the dialogue simply got switched from where it was supposed to be. I can't confirm where, but it sounds like it was supposed to be said about the Lost Bastille, where Glorious would make much more sense. But because we did this area out of order, we got the wrong dialogue for this area. Regardless of that, the second time you talk to Lucatiel, you will get some of her story. She is from Mira, a place surrounded by enemies and constantly at war. She describes the only way to make it up the totem pole there is by fighting. Her family had little fortune, no name, and life was hard, but she pushed through and gained respect through the battlefield. Near the end of her dialogue, she begins to say why she came to Drangleic, but trails off, as if she has forgotten. This hints at Lucatiel going hollow, which will be confirmed later. This reveal is ruined, though, by her saying that she is sorry for concerning you with her fate. This is now blatantly true that she is hollowing, which ruins any climactic ending, if they bothered to make one. Once I begin progressing through the area, I'll encounter some soldiers seen in the Forest of Fallen Giants, and some beefier enemies. Going through this area early on can take some patience, as there are plenty of places to get ganked or suffer a cheap death. 
When you reach the first staircase, you will notice that all the enemies attack at once, so you can already assume that this area is coded for ambushes and spam attacks. When you explore off to the right, you will meet the first black monster of the area. These enemies are annoying, as they have bleed attacks, they have iffy hitboxes, and you have to deal with several of them in one particular and valuable spot. Once you make it to the second level of the area, you'll have three options. Head left, right, or straight up the stairs. Right leads you to a spam area, but also lets you use a Pharos Lockstone to lighten the wharf up and scare the black monsters. The left leads you up into a building which connects to the top of the stairs and gives you a few items. I'm going to head to the right first and then come back, but I don't have a Pharos Lockstone, so this area will be a little more difficult. You'll notice that several enemies are placed through this building with archers on the top floor, some dude sitting at a table on the bottom floor, and an ambush at the staircase. This can be very difficult if you come here early and don't know how many will attack you at once. Anyway, you are able to see a summon sign through the locked gate. That is Lucatil's summon sign for the Flexile Sentry fight, the boss of this area. This gate can be used as a shortcut if you fight the Flexile Sentry and die to it. I backtrack and go to the left path leading into a house that has an enemy and a ring behind destructible shelves. Once we leave the house, we'll be attacked by four enemies, one dog and three Viking-ish dudes. After them, we fight our way through several black monsters until we make our way into the building several of them are defending. This building houses your first interaction with Gablan, a vendor who you can buy and sell items to. This is one of the most important vendors in the game if you know some cheap tactics, because Gavlan sells poison resins, poison throwing knives, and poison arrows. They are limited for now, but can be quite useful later and throughout New Game Plus. He has two chests near him, with one being a trap chest that poisoned me this run. I life gemmed the health back, so it was pretty pointless. The normal chest houses a greatsword. This is one of the strongest weapons in the game to use, because you get it relatively early, its requirements to use aren't ridiculous, it hits hard, and has a wide radial attack. It's a very good weapon for most encounters in the game, and a vendor later on sells them, so you can buy as many as you want, and have one of each type for any challenge you face in the game. Anyway, when you talk to Gavlan, he only cares about trading, which is nice, since that's all I care about at this point in the game. You can sell items to him throughout the game, as he will appear a few more times until he reaches his fixed location in the Doors of Pharos zone. After I buy the poise ring he sells and some poison arrows, the most overpowered setup requires a lot of these, I then start cleaning house. Once I finish selling everything to him, you will see that it gave me quite a bit of souls. It got me from 5,000 to 46,000 souls. This is without anything super valuable being sold, and just getting rid of cannon fodder. Once that's done, I'll continue progressing through the top level of the area. I find and ring this bell in order to move the ship into place, where I can reach it from the harbor, and then I head down to clear some rooms of enemies and to grab some items. One of the buildings near the edge has a room filled with poison jars and a chest with another Estus flask shard in it. Right next to the chest is an illusory wall with a Titanite lizard next to it. Thankfully, I had a greatsword with me, because my weapons would have had a very hard time hitting it because of the inept focus mechanic and its extremely small hitbox. The chest in this room gives you the Royal Soldier's Ring, which increases your weight limit. This can be very helpful when using larger weapons. I leave that building and run into another with an illusory wall, leading to a few chests. Then up the steps to the shortcut to summon Lucatil for the rest of the area and the Flexile Sentry boss fight. This will be the second of the three bosses needed for Lucatil's questline. Unfortunately, one of the black monsters kills me, so I must run all the way back, except for the shortcut making it easier. Not a great shortcut, but still nice. After fighting a few enemies on the harbor and slapping some off the edge, I meet Carhillion, the magic trainer NPC for the game. As a melee build, or anyone with lower intelligence, he won't talk to me much, but he will to Magic Man Mark. He makes you his pupil and is a vendor for some spells and magic build items such as some rings that enhance casting time, or magic defense, or consumables that replenish spell uses. I use most of my souls on Mark here to buy his spells up, as they are much more worth it than a few levels, and a good failsafe if I die and lose my souls. Getting back to Bill, I hop on the ship and fight my way to the Flexile Sentry one of the stranger bosses in the game. The Flexile Sentry has an interesting dynamic of having no backside and having two fronts with which it can attack using swords or maces. Its attacks are fairly well telegraphed and the hitboxes never get too stupid, but it does seem like this boss has very little health when scaled to where the player may be at. 
The New Game Plus version of this boss adds two new enemies that hit fast and can stagger you, so the New Game Plus version is just spammier. The water slowly rises to waist level here, but that's only if you take forever to kill it. Once he is beaten, we can head up a ladder to find a chest that has some pyromancy gear, and we then take the ship to the Lost Bastille. We arrive at the Exile Holding Cells bonfire, and No Man's Wharf is complete. Don't have to say Wharf again. At least not for a while. Once I return to Majula, I will be making my way down the pit. Here you will need the cat's ring and enough health to survive the drops. You'll notice here that even with the ring, you still take a significant amount of damage. This can be made even worse if you attempt the Grave of Saints earlier or at the start of the game. You will die from the fall damage without the ring, or die with the ring because you don't have enough health at the start of the game to manage this drop. This is made even more difficult if you die repeatedly, as every death makes your health smaller without human effigies. This would all be fine as a deterrent if the areas after the drop were more difficult. This would hammer home that to new players, this area shouldn't be accessed until you've gotten some more experience, both mechanically and literally, with the game. This isn't the case, because the enemies here are on par or easier than the Hades Tower enemies. As you can see from the first encounter here, you will be ambushed throughout this area. Luckily, the enemies don't hit hard, but they will petrify you if you take too many hits. I'm not quite sure why they hit for so little and have such a tiny petrify amount, so this is an unusually easy area for most players, unless you aren't paying attention to your surroundings. You may have noticed all the Pharaoh's lockstone points throughout this area. Many of them do nothing or activate small traps that can hurt you or the rats. Shortly afterwards, you will make it to the bonfire right before the Royal Rat Vanguard boss encounter. This boss is not a real boss to me. In my humble opinion, this is one of the dumber boss encounters in the game. It essentially boils down to fighting several previous enemies in a tight space, and then targeting the slightly different rat that has been given a mohawk for some reason. This doesn't suit the Souls game's style and mechanics very well. It doesn't work well mechanically because of the large numbers of enemies. I'm aware of the encounter and have a weapon that is very suitable for this fight, so it makes it easier for me, but many players will have trouble with this area at first because of the spam and because of the rat statues littered about the place that have obviously been placed there just to block your weapons from hitting the rats. They aren't arranged in any coherent manner befitting a grave or a tomb, so they must be just an arbitrary obstacle to make the encounter harder for the player. This fight doesn't work stylistically because of the main boss rat having a mohawk. This is something that conflicts with the tone and style of the Soulsborne series. This series tends to be serious, dark, depressing, and even existential, but has light, very light, humor spread throughout, usually coming from NPC dialogue or player messages. This mohawk on the boss would be like sticking an afro on the Balrog from Lord of the Rings to add humor, even though you have adequate humor already in the project. It just doesn't need to be there, and it makes the boss less intimidating and more comical, resulting in a fight you may laugh at or sigh at depending on your sense of humor. This is secondary to the fact that the boss rat goes down in just a few hits. Not to mention the absolutely terrible hitboxes allowing me to hit the boss when it was clearly not touching my blade. Once you defeat the boss, you will be able to join the Rat Covenant. It always bugged me how the Rat King dude would ask you to serve him after you kill one of his own and conquered one of his rat burrows. Doesn't make sense to make an ally out of one who has killed your people and conquered your land, but maybe he's just incompetent or a coward. He is a rat, after all. After some more dialogue from the Rat King about having the honor of a true rat, whatever that means, you will be able to progress down another series of jumps. Again, this is very iffy because of the controls and because of fall damage and the momentum of rolling after a fall. Here you'll find a few items and a Titanite Lizard. The chest contains the Ash Knuckle Ring, which reduces petrification on the player, but we don't deal with petrify enemies very much for the rest of this pathway, so I'm unsure why they decided to place this here. This area is designed where it is difficult to get the lizard without falling down into the area below, where you will be attacked by several exploding enemies that do massive damage. This is a spot I hated at first, but then realized how easy it was to bait out the explodey dude's attacks, since they die from the explosion this time around, for some reason. Or you can slap them down with a weapon. It really just depends on the timing of it all. 
If you go through the doorway on the other side of the bridge, where you met the lizard, you will find a spot that players can use to skip the Grave of Saints entirely by falling down through the pit to where the lizard is. I wouldn't recommend doing that, as the drops and the stability of the platforms leading down are very hard to manage, especially for a new player. Once I get past the explodey dudes, I'll find a strange wooden structure with several ladders leading down, a few items, and a chest at the bottom. It's a strange thing to have this here, and I'm not sure why this exists narratively or thematically, so feel free to speculate on why it's here besides the obvious point of getting the player down without dying. Once I make my way to the bottom, I will be finished with the Grave of Saints and will be heading into the gutter. Upon entering the gutter, you will notice three things that summarize this zone. It's extremely dark, the floor is untrustworthy, and there are tons of statues that will poison you. There is almost nothing else to this zone beyond those three things. You'll also notice that several pathways are blocked off by the simple fact that the Dark Souls people can't climb small ledges. Once we drop down to the bonfire, you can find a torch nearby, which will help light up the zone permanently, as there are a lot of torch sconce positions throughout the area. There are several areas throughout the zone that have the floor fall from underneath you, which is quite annoying to deal with, especially with the way falling has a momentum to it that can easily push you into one of the many pits of death. After a while, I get invaded by Melinda the Butcher. If you've played Dark Souls 1, you may have noticed the similarities between the Gutter and Blighttown, and between Melinda the Butcher and Maneater Mildred. This is something that will become more noticeable as we go on, where Dark Souls 2 will ape themes, places, and NPCs from its predecessor. This is nothing bad on its own, but this idea can become played out when it's just the first thing again, but with a few minor changes. This area, unfortunately, is pretty bad for the Melinda AI to navigate, as I walk around a little bit and she returns to her world, most likely because she fell to her death. This isn't a problem specific to Dark Souls 2, as all three Dark Souls games have had AI issues, but you'd think they could give this one invasion an extra bit of attention given the place they have to put the encounter. Regardless, the Phantom dies, and I'm able to continue. As we progress further into the darkness, you can see more of the AI having trouble as a dog walks into a statue for a few seconds until I get near it. Later on, we make our way towards the exit and the second bonfire to this zone. One thing you'll notice here is that some of the zombies in this cave have dark imbued weapons, which deal over half of my current health and damage. This is something I find strange and annoying, as this is an area filled with poison, and the zombies are the hardest hitting enemies here, if they are armed. Otherwise, they are the weakest. It's a strange decision to give some of these enemies so much damage, but I can only assume it was made this way to further cram down our throats the idea of difficulty over challenge or interest, as this game is built upon that principle. Shortly after I open the chest, I will begin to run around the flesh dog thing here, only to fall through a small gap in the floor to my death. Love that. 10 out of 10 level design. After running back, I make it to the fog wall here that leads to several ladders and has the second bonfire behind the wall of this room. I'll be skipping over the second bonfire because I'd rather get out of this area as soon as possible, and I'm aware of where the next few enemies are until I reach the first Black Gulch bonfire. After going down the first ladder, I am almost ambushed by some zombies hanging off of the ledge, but I head down the second ladder and slap them down. I then go down a third ladder and nearly get hit by the zombie waiting for the player, but I slap him and his buddies down easily. If you explore, you will find a generous amount of 20 life gems in an urn. Once you've reached the exit, you will see a series of strange urns that will destroy your equipment, which can be incredibly annoying to deal with, because they destroy it instantly, but thankfully there is a bonfire just after this so you won't have to deal with the broken equipment for long, unless you can't afford to fix it all. After jumping down past the equipment urns, you will find a fragrant branch of yore, giving you another opportunity to unlock the statue barring you from entering Shaded Woods, the path to the doors of Pharos and Brightstone Cove Seldora, and the road to Drangleic Castle. Once you pass the fog wall here, you will enter the final area of this pathway, Black Gulch. Before I head back into Black Gulch, I'm going to head back to Things Betwixt to use up some of the stones I've picked up so far. Here you can see what I mentioned before with the repeating dialogue and the slow process of dropping every single stone individually and then picking up each item individually. If they were able to make it where you could consume multiple souls in one function, then why can't they make this area do something of the same by dropping all of your stones at once and generating whatever they're worth en masse? If they can have multiple souls consumed at once, why can't this work better here? I've complained enough about this, so let's head to Black Gulch. Once you enter the Black Gulch proper, you will notice how the number of poison statues has multiplied to a ludicrous degree. 
Forget going to 11. This is over 9,000. Keep life gems handy for this area, as it's nearly impossible to get through this area without getting poisoned. If this was Dark Souls 1, this wouldn't be that bad, as poison did a fair amount of damage in Dark Souls 1 because it was slow, but long-lasting. As you can tell from my footage so far, Dark Souls 2 has made poison much more menacing. It now works much faster than it did in its predecessor. This makes using poison weapons very deadly, as the battles with them will go much faster and put much more pressure on other players when using poison. You may also notice how I am destroying as many poison statues as I can here, because the statues can not only poison you, but also stun you, which can be very bad when dealing with the enemies in this area. Skipping towards the end of the playthrough, I go back to Black Gulch to show you how to find Lucatil. She is in a cave just below the edge near the first bonfire. Seeing this ledge to get to her can be hard without a torch, so come prepared and be ready for many possible deaths by pit. Once you make it to her, she will tell you of her thoughts feeling scattered, and how she has questions about the curse. She also mentions how this loss of memory and loss of self frightens her, and I don't blame her. That can be really scary to lose yourself. Then she says that she would, without hesitation, kill us if it would end the curse for her. Nice to see how much we value to Lucatil, but again, I can't blame her since you can only see her a few times throughout the game. At least she is ashamed that she feels that way. Then she goes over some of the philosophical aspects of the self in the Dark Souls context when affected by the curse. After that, she'll wonder out loud if we're all born with the curse. Kind of horrible to think, but she may be right. Getting back to the area, the enemies here end up being one of two things. These strange squid tentacle monsters, or giant armored worms. The tentacle enemies have a grab that can kill you if you aren't careful, but they also have some iffy hitboxes when it comes to their attacks, so it is best to beat them down as quickly as possible. The armored worms are much easier to deal with, as these enemies remain stationary and cannot move from the points that you encounter them. Their attacks are also quite easy to bait out, so feel free to slap at their hindquarters when they wiggle around in an attempt to kill you. You can find a hidden bonfire if you follow the right edge of the area. This bonfire is used to refresh the rotten fight if you use a bonfire ascetic. This also spawns a pharos lockstone every time you refresh the fire, which can be handy to remember if you need lockstones. Once I rest, I will head over to the boss of the area, and the next Lord Soul I defeat, the Rotten. You can summon Lucatil if you've talked to her beforehand, and this will help push her quest forward and towards her achievement. The caveat is that she has to survive the fight with the Rotten, being the hardest one to survive. When it is defeated, you have all three bosses needed for Lucatil's questline. This questline will end much later at Aldia's Keep. Regarding the Rotten, from the cutscene, you can see that it is the one who makes all the statues that have been poisoning you throughout the gutter and Black Gulch. Based on its roar after it fails to keep the statue's head on, it must have a hard time. The Rotten is one of the easiest bosses to fight in the game, and becomes doubly broken by the fact that it gives a Lord Soul and a large amount of souls every time you kill it. The fight boils down to a simple circle strafe dodge punish battle because the only attack you really need to concern yourself with is his dark explosion, which is very hard to dodge. His other attacks are easy to dodge as long as you don't get greedy with your attacks. An issue with this boss is that the Rotten's arena has several patches of fire that can easily kill the player if the Rotten slaps them into one, or if the player wanders into one by accident. Another issue with this boss aesthetically is that its area is full of poison, but the Rotten only deals dark damage. This is something that doesn't make sense to me, as it is the one making the poison statues, but can't actually use poison in its fight. This will slightly get fixed with another boss later on, but this is subpar for the consistency of the world and who can do what. Because if he makes the statues but can't use poison, who makes the statues shoot poison? I don't drink, but take a shot every time I mention an inconsistency in this game. I'll be surprised if you'll be alive by the end of this video. Granted, this is a million hours long, so that challenge is unfair, but still. Anyway, the Rotten has become a very important and broken aspect of the game for myself and others, because I will boost souls from him every time I have a bonfire aesthetic available. Once you hit his encounter on New Game Plus 7, or play through 8, his combined soul count, including using the ring and gear increasing souls gained, and the two souls that he drops, he will give over 300,000 souls per kill. That is an enormous amount of souls per kill, but makes it even more broken by having several bonfire aesthetics available throughout the game. I've killed the Rotten over 40 times in a single run of the game, without entering actual New Game Plus. And by the end of the run, 
he had given me over 12 million souls. This can be done with several of the bosses, including the ending boss encounter that has four bosses to fight. This is the major reason why I dislike bonfire ascetics. They can and will break the balance of the game by allowing easy farming of massive amounts of souls, leading to easy levels and purchases. Once you defeat the Rotten, which should be fairly easy, you will go through a cave in the back of his arena and find a chest to the right containing more sublime bone dust. Afterwards, you enter the cave with the primal bonfire of this pathway, and now have access to the poison DLC of the game, Shelva Sanctum City. Before I leave this area, I decide to use what bonfire ascetics I have to fight the Rotten a few more times. On New Game Plus onward, the Rotten will drop its soul of the Rotten and now drop the old Dead One soul, which can be used to create a massive dark greatsword. I'm glad they remembered what damage it dealt, because if it was placed in a poison area but did no poison damage, and then its soul was used to make a poison weapon, I would freak out. But regardless of that, I've finished another pathway, although I will be coming back to the DLCs much later in the video. Once I make it back to Majula, I'll be heading to Huntsman's Cops through the area with the rotating doorway, where we will meet Lycia for the second time. She tells you that the machine in the room requires miracles to use, and then spouts out the saleswoman's pitch for miracles. You can ask her about the first flame, but she appears to either not know what it is, or she withholds information about it, and advises you to gain miracles to understand it, which would see her gain some souls through selling you the miracles. To open the Huntsman's Cops pathway, you can pay Lycia 2,000 souls, or use a miracle at the contraption. Don't ask why it works that way. Once that is done, you can begin a long journey down this pathway. After heading through some caves, you will come upon a man that is only interested in the dark, and will find the first bonfire shortly after. One thing you may notice about this area, as well as the first sections of most pathways, is that the enemies retain the same level of difficulty, at least in their encounters, as seen previously, with some minor tweaks here and there. That is why my weapon can slap these enemies down so easily. The reason I bring this up is because each pathway scales on roughly the same level, meaning that the first and last sections of these pathways will be similar in difficulty most of the time. This is something of a problem, because by the time you complete a few of the pathways, the other opening areas will lose some of their challenge. Put simply, the challenge slowly dissipates as you progress through the four routes to the old ones. This was a similar but lesser problem in Dark Souls 1 after you put the Lord Vessel on the altar. The four areas leading to the four great souls for the four kings, Seath, Nito, and the Bed of Garbage had to account for the fact that players may do them in any order, so they had to try to balance them in different ways. They tried balancing them through what each area's sweaknesses and strengths were. Nito's path was weak to divine weapons, Seath's area was resistant to magic, the Bed of Death's area was resistant to fire because duh, and the four kings had enemies that were tough but also required you to kill Sith for the ring to traverse the abyss. This was a lesser problem then than it is now because of the placement in the games. By the time you've received the Lord Vessel, you will be roughly halfway through the game, so the enemies won't have to scale or be balanced as rapidly as before when you were going through the opening areas. Because this was placed later in the game, when it takes you longer to level up and such, this wasn't as much of an issue in Dark Souls 1. This is essentially the same problem in reverse for Dark Souls 2, where each pathway early on has a similar difficulty and because there are so many pathways to go down at once, the developers pushed themselves into a corner where each of the starting areas had to be difficult, but it couldn't kick the player's teeth in. This means that the scaling was screwed, and whatever pathway was completed last would end up being much easier than if you did that path first. They could have done what Dark Souls 1 did with its opening objective of Ring the Bells of Awakening. The first bell is right after the Bell Gargoyle fight in the Undead Parish area. The second is after the Quelag fight in Blighttown. You can go to either bell first, but Blight Town is a much tougher area than Undead Parish. This helped with leading players where they should be able to go for a proper challenge and not absolute rage and death. One reason why the Dark Souls is super hard concept got so widely spread was because certain players would try going to the Catacombs, New Londo Ruins, or Blight Town first, because they didn't know that Undead Burg is the easiest area to start from, and that the other pathways have much stronger enemies and challenges. The Undead Burg also has some key NPCs to interact with, like Solaire for online play, and the Undead Parish has Andre for weapon and armor upgrades. The option was there to explore wherever you wanted, but it would come at the danger of the areas being more challenging, 
because you haven't accumulated good gear or levels yet. This can be circumvented by knowing where to go to get good items for whatever build you are working towards, but the areas can still be challenging even to veterans at that early level. Getting back to Dark Souls 2, each of the four corner pathways in the game are scaled almost identically when it comes to their difficulty and challenge, with a few exceptions. This is something that Dark Souls 1 was able to work around, because the cutscene before arriving at Firelink Shrine showed the sewer leading to Undead Burg, and the Undead Burg sewer is the most visible path from the Shrine Bonfire, giving the player a strong indication of where to go first. The other pathways are obscured from view by stairways leading down, or by the large structure where Framped is snapping. The areas are still there, but the guidance of the game subtly pushes you towards the area that has been specifically scaled for the player to go to after the Undead Asylum. The enemies in Undead Burg are easy to read and don't do too much damage, whereas the skeletons near the catacombs and the ghosts in New Londo deal much more damage or have some other way for making the encounter difficult, such as reassembling or requiring a curse to damage them. Because the developers of Dark Souls 1 knew that these areas were tougher, and the player probably shouldn't go down those pathways yet, they use subtle hints to push the player, specifically new players, towards the first real area in the game. This allowed them to direct players, while also allowing each area to be scaled differently, instead of them making four pathways with similar difficulty no matter which one you take first, because the other three pathways will only get easier as you progress. This is lazy, or a lack of planning and foresight on the part of the Dark Souls 2 development team. Some could say that this idea came from Demon Souls, as you can go to several different areas throughout the game that had to be balanced evenly since you can go to any of them first. This was balanced by the way the levels and enemies are made, with Volataria being one of the simplest areas to start, while the Valley of Defilement was much more challenging because of poison, plague, and the platforms you had to navigate to reach the next area. Stonefang, the Tower of Latria, and the Shrine of Storms also had their own challenges, with the Shrine of Storms having the skeletons be very tough, but also having the flying enemies that will occasionally shoot at you, especially near ledges. Stonefang had several tough, fire-based enemies and traps, while Latria had very few tough enemies, but the level is so complicated that the difficulty comes from making it through the level and understanding it as much as dealing with the enemies themselves. Getting back to Dark Souls 2 again, many people have used the B-Team argument to explain why Dark Souls 2 was the black sheep of the Soulsborne series, as there are a massive number of discrepancies in the developer roster for this game compared to the team for Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1, Dark Souls 3, and Bloodborne. I won't go through the list of everyone involved with all of the games, but by this point you'll have seen that there are a number of issues throughout Dark Souls 2 already that were not present before or were much more nuanced in previous titles. It's clear that what made Demon Souls and Dark Souls 1 great was lost in Dark Souls 2 by this point, because the attention to the details of the level design, the enemy encounters, and subtlety, among other things, have all been tampered with in a way that doesn't work well with the previous game's style or mechanics in mind. The level design has gotten much more linear and simple. The enemy encounters variety and challenge in combat have been dumbed down into a spam fest for a majority of the game, and subtlety has been replaced by mass vagueness or overtly telling the player what the prequels would have kept below the radar. Finally getting back to Huntsman's Cops, I make it close to the second bonfire where you will notice the shortcut that is made almost completely useless by the fact that the shortcut is right next to a bonfire. Mr. Matosis pointed this out in his Dark Souls 2 critique video by mentioning that this shortcut shouldn't have been placed here, but could have connected to the bridge above the bonfire, allowing easy access to the area boss of Huntsman's Cops, or only having one bonfire at the start and have the shortcut where it is now. This could have helped curb the difficulty of this game in a way more reminiscent of Dark Souls 1, but this is what we got. This makes me think that they made the levels, then the shortcuts, then placed the bonfires wherever, and they didn't really pay attention to each placement when putting it all together. While exploring further, you can find a secret area with a chest containing Rickard's rapier and one of the annoying enemies of the area. After completing this area, I loop back around to the area just before the second bonfire. As you may have noticed, there are several poison butterflies lingering about that can poison you quite easily, but since life gems are abundant, you should be fine. The first bridge leads you to an area where you can either go forward to progress down the pathway or to the right to fight the area boss, the Executioner's Chariot. I've decided to kill the horse here, so I begin the boss run. This boss run can be quite annoying because the enemies have decent health, high damage, and can ambush you with anywhere from one to four of them attacking you at once. 
Since I know that they are there, I'm able to deal with them accordingly, but a surprise spam can lead to a very frustrating death. Just before the boss, I go across the bridge that could have had a shortcut to the bonfire, but nope. We get to run all the way back around again because spam is totally fun. Guarding the boss door is a phantom that is very beefy. I am aware of how cheesable the AI are in this game, and since I don't want to do the boss run a second time, I poison the phantom to death until I slap him down with my greatsword. Upon entering the arena for the Executioner's Chariot fight, you can see that the arena is one large circle, with the boss repeatedly circling through it. This is something that the developers could have done more with by making the arena more than a simple circle, but I can forgive them for that. What I won't forgive them for is the reassembling skeletons and necromancers here. The spam here makes the fight much more annoying to deal with than the boss on its own. Once I've dealt with the spam and closed the gate, thereby knocking the horse down, you'll notice that the attacks for the horse are somewhat telegraphed, but the hitboxes are quite iffy, with its little move forward slightly attack being a real pain to dodge. Regardless, the boss goes down without any issues in this run. One funny thing I found while playing my magic build was that you can get a special death for the boss if you slowly chip away at it as it makes its way around the circle. Once enough health is taken off, it will get stuck on the edge of the drop of death. This lets you smack it off the edge as it struggles to lift itself up. This requires some patience and manual aiming of spells and other ranged attacks, but can be quite entertaining if you want this boss to suffer. This may be a reference to the easy way to kill Ceaseless Discharge from Dark Souls 1, where you get him near a certain edge and then hammer him where he will fall off the ledge and instantly die. This isn't quite the same, and I don't really know if that bug with Discharge was intended or not, but it is something to think about. After defeating the boss, you will find an area that will give invading players much excitement, a covenant and vendor that will make invasions much easier through red-eye orbs and statues nearby that trigger invasions. I don't invade myself just because I don't care for the online of these games that much, but feel free to use and abuse. Once you head the other direction, you will make your way to some more spam areas and ambush rooms until you lower the bridge to the third bonfire. This bonfire is locked until you kill a mob a little further down the path. This pathway is very narrow because you're on the side of the cliff, so think before you roll. You can see me attempt to get the Titanite Lizard here, but it is very hard to hit without strong ranged attacks. One thing you will notice about this area is that it had a phantom guarding the entrance to the Executioner's Chariot boss, and now another invades just before the Skeleton Lord's boss fight. I find this to be annoying as a principle because it can seem unnecessarily punishing. The second phantom is easily beaten off the ledge because of stunlock combos, having a huge sword, or abusing poison, like so. Once you get the undead lockaway key from the corpse here, you can now unlock the bonfire behind the door, as well as free the NPC trapped in there, Creighton of Mira. One thing I find funny is how the key is literally called Undead Lockaway Key. It's absurdly direct, and it made me laugh when I read it. It's like calling your car keys my car key. When you talk to Creighton, he hints at having a grudge against someone who betrayed him, and when Creighton tried to trap him, he himself was trapped. He then says that the man was named Pate. This is Pate from earlier in the Forest of Fallen Giants. Creighton then says that he is going to find Pate and end his roguery. You will see both characters appear later. Once I leave the bonfire, I head down the other pathway from the third bonfire, where you will find pots that curse you, skeletons, and necromancers. They aren't too difficult to deal with, but the skeletons will reassemble until the necromancers are killed. One necromancer is on a small platform that can be a little difficult to kill, but if you have a ranged weapon, you should be fine. This area is the pathway to a shortcut for the Skeleton Lord's boss fight, although I didn't unlock the shortcut gate from the other side yet. Not to mention that one way to go is only slightly less challenging and shorter than the other. Upon returning down the first path, I attempt to get the lizard again, and fail again. What you can notice here is that there is a very stupid drop to get an item. As you can see from the footage, I do some retarded movement to reach it. Your reward is Poison Moss, which is infuriating to think that several players probably died many times here just to get something that they don't really need for this area, if at all. Once we get to the Skeleton Lord's boss fight, you will see how weak this boss is in every conceivable way. The boss employs spam, one with the first three skeletons, and two with the several smaller skeletons that spawn after defeating each bigger skeleton. Some of the spawns are the ridiculously frustrating wheel skeletons from Dark Souls 1, too. There are several things wrong with this fight, chief among them being that spam and a hack-and-slash-finish are not a very interesting fight, 
as the enemies can stun lock you to death, especially the wheel skeletons, and that the fight becomes very boring once you figure out the strategy of smack the swarm, run away, repeat. Don't take that as attack, dodge, repeat strategies are bad in the Souls games, because 99% of encounters are like that at the base. But when the enemies feel like a blob of damage dealers instead of a unique enemy type, it'll get old very quick. One other thing about this boss that bothers me is that the soul is called Skeleton Lord's Soul, as in possessive, but singular. But the health bar shows Skeleton Lords, as in multiple lords. This is a small chink in Dark Souls 2's armor of quality that they can't even remember what the boss is, but that is one among hundreds, so think what you will. Not to mention that most of the health bar comes from the minions, so it should really be called the Skeleton Lord's Minions, or the Skeleton Lords and Followers, or something. After I defeat the Skeleton Bros, I have finished Huntsman's Cops, and will make my way to the next area, Harvest Valley, in a moment. But first, I'm going to head to the statue blocking our way forward, just before Shaded Woods. After running up to the room with Hugo and the statue, I cleared the lower level of the two testicle men. I didn't coin the term, but it is very apt for what they look like. Here, I'll be freeing Rosabeth from petrification. This is something that is unusually drawn out, because she will sit there coughing and whining about being petrified for almost 60 seconds. You will have to sit there for a literal minute just to listen to her coughing and complaining. This is something that made me roll my eyes, because Strayed from earlier was petrified longer than Rosabeth, and takes about 10 seconds to comment on being stiff. This is both an inconsistency in the way the world works, as well as an annoying experience where an NPC just wastes your time. It's not even about lore, or her history, or a joke, or anything else. It just wastes time. That's it. That's literally all it does. A moment, please. Um. After the complaining is over, Rosabeth thanks me for rescuing her, and mentions that she is a pyromancer. There is also a small thing with her saying that I am that traveler, which doesn't make sense to say now, since I just met her, and she shouldn't know me or know of me yet. I can't tell if that is meant to be said if we left and came back to see her later, but it doesn't fit well with the conversation to be surprised to see someone again if you just met them a moment ago. One small thing that I do like is the attention to the word Traveler, spelled with two L's instead of one. Since these Dark Souls games are based on medieval Europe culture and art styles, then the grammar would have to fit as well. At first, I thought it was a spelling error, like with the Skeleton Lord's Soul, but it turns out that some things in the game do make sense, and are nice touches, as this is the European English version of the word. It might just be because of my perspective as an American, though. She will then mention that she is shameful wearing these rags, and asks for any spare clothes you may have, and that she's not particular about clothing. She then says to put it on the ground, and she'll change into it later. This is funny, stupid, and interesting all at the same time. It's funny because you get to play dress-up with a Dark Souls NPC, but it's stupid for that same reason. It's also stupid because she says to leave the clothing on the ground, but you give it to her directly through a trade window. This is dumb, because you trade things with other players and some NPCs by dropping items on the ground. That would have been fine, but I have a feeling that one developer wrote the dialogue after hearing how players could trade items, and another developer decided to make it where you give it to her directly, instead of leaving it for her to pick up. I also imagine it would be harder to code her to pick up an item left by the player. This is the dialogue not accounting for the gameplay, or vice versa. Either way, it shows a disconnect between some staff members of the development team. It's also interesting for two reasons. One, mechanically, it's an interesting inclusion that you are given an NPC to customize the way you want to. This could have been done well and expanded upon in any potential projects, where you could have a friend or two that you customize what gear they use and maybe could help you throughout the game. Perhaps custom NPC summons that can summon someone you know and you know how they fight. Regardless, this just changes how Rosabeth looks once she returns to Majula, and Dark Souls 3 didn't have this option anywhere, so I'd say it's safe to assume that what I mentioned as an idea hasn't been thought of or approved by the developers at From Software. The second reason it's interesting is because of something that may or may not be true, but could be a subtle thing. Dark Souls 2 could be anti-feminist or even anti-woman. 
Take a moment to think about it. The lost sinner is a female, and her name and soul suggest a sinful backstory. Nishandra, the queen, is behind Dring Lake's fall to ruin. The opening cinematic and the bit before character creation makes the character a dude by force, and Rosabeth can be dressed up as the player sees fit, however scantily clad. There's nothing concrete that makes this true, from what I've seen, but it is interesting to think about considering how the other games display their female characters. Politics aside, I give her a couple of crappy items I have on me just to appease her. When talked to, she mentions being Carhelion's student, and that they became separated on their way to Drang Lake. She later mentions that he may have ditched her after learning that she was rather unskilled with spells. She does say that she is a fast learner when it comes to pyromancy, though. Once I'm done with her, she thanks me for the clothes, and I open up the next area. This begins by spamming several testicle bros at me, and then lets a basilisk into the fight. After slapping them down, you will find a bonfire and an Estus flash shard in the next room. I really recommend not resting at or warping to this bonfire, as it will close the door at the top of the stairs, and you will have to face the basilisk and another group of testicle spam in order to open it up. Testicle spam. What a phrase. After entering the actual shaded woods, I will fight my way past some various testicle bros. Some slap with sticks, and some throw rocks, so be wary. They don't hit too hard on their own, but there are quite a few of them to fight. Once I make it to the second bonfire, after only about a minute and a half of walking and dealing with nether region monsters, I find Creighton sitting along one of the three archways. Here he talks briefly about the person who trapped him as living further down the road at Brightstone Cove Seldora, and that he won't let that bastard live another day. Exhaust his dialogue to continue with his quest. After that, I will be heading down the left pathway first to show the route I need to take to get to Dranglea Castle. Here you will find another Flexile Sentry. Normally I poison him, but I don't have enough poison arrows. As you can see here, the pathway is blocked by some rubble. We can't climb over it because of the series mechanics, but it will get even dumber in a moment. Make your way up to the little path to the left of the rubble, and you will find the Shrine of Winter. As shown earlier, this area blocks the way to Dranglea Castle and the Frozen DLC, unless you have one million soul memory. I do not yet, and now I must go and kill more to get more souls. One thing that bothers me about the text appearing as Seek Mightier Souls is that it implies that you need to find stronger souls, not more souls. As such, once again, instead of hopping over some rubble, I go to fight the strongest beings in existence. Once I realize that I don't have the right number of souls, I leave to continue down the pathway I was on previously, and I can now get into Harvest Valley. Upon entering Harvest Valley, the first thing you will notice is Cloanne, the Orstone Trader. Most of her dialogue revolves around her getting where she is, and that her stones are used in smithing. She doesn't have much now, but once she moves back to Majula, her inventory of items will scale with your progress in the game. This means that she will only have Titanite shards, then large ones, then chunks, then slabs, and then has several infusion stones and other special ores used for upgrading by the end of the game. After talking to her for a bit, she will talk about not remembering how she came to Drang Lake, and that she will move on soon. She will be back at Majula the next time we talk to her. After leaving her, you can see that I lose connection to Steam, and basically all online functions, so the game switches to offline mode. This message is such an annoying thing to deal with, especially if you are having issues with your internet. This message pops up in the center of your screen, takes up a third of the screen, obscures your vision of your character, dims the background, and requires you to press OK before it will go away. This can easily get you killed. Some might say that this is an improvement over Dark Souls 1, where Dark Souls 1 would return you to the main menu instead of a pop-up, but I disagree. In Dark Souls 1, if this happened, you'd be booted to the main menu, but wouldn't suffer any penalties. You'd simply be sent back to the menu and may lose some boss progress, or might have to rerun a short distance. In Dark Souls 2, it can cause your death, which is much more frustrating than restarting a minute or two back from where you were. Not to mention that this could have easily been dealt with by making it a pop-up in the corner that doesn't require a button confirmation to get rid of it. Anyway, once you head to the first area, you'll see the overabundance of poison clouds. Throughout this first section and the next, the poison clouds will be something to keep an eye on, but should be relatively easy to deal with if you have life gems to offset them. There are items scattered around the misty areas, but there are usually skeletons or big dark-throwing dudes guarding the loot. The skeletons don't do too much damage, 
but the Dark Dudes should be taken care of quickly because of their large health pools and their damage output. After exploring a little, I will run into Gavlan again. This is another opportunity to sell all of the junk from your inventory, and also sets up Gavlan for his third and final appearance later on, where he will supply you with more plentiful gear, such as unlimited poison arrows, and where he will remain until New Game Plus. After Gavlan, there is a somewhat tight space with several small zombies and two dark dudes. As you can see here, their AI is somewhat lacking in... awareness. To open up the pathway here, you need to climb the ladder nearest to the gate to pull a lever above it. This will open the pathway and allow access to the second bonfire of the zone. After resting at the second bonfire, you'll come to an area with a few different ways to go. One path leads to a dark dude hiding behind a plank wall. This subtly tells you that these guys can break stuff if close enough, which I used to open the area behind where he was hiding. It can be difficult to get them close enough to break it, as they physically must hit it, not hit it with the dark orb thing they throw. After defeating him, I hop down to a chest containing a poison stone for infusing and a rotten pine resin. As there is no way back up from here, you have to go down the ladder into the poison gas. This will take you back to the open area just after the second bonfire, where you can rest and try the other paths. Upon returning to the path with the plank walls, you will jump down into an area with an ambush by a bunch of fat sickle wielders. This area is meant to overwhelm you with their numbers and damage, as well as the zombies that can catch you long enough to get destroyed by the Fatso squad. This is what is meant to happen, but the AI isn't that intelligent as two of the fat boys stare and run into a wall for a few seconds. After dealing with the enemies here, you will have several small little pods in the rock outcropping to inspect for souls, items, and the occasional zombie. One of these pods leads to the way out, that leads back to the opening from earlier, as well as pointing you towards a suicidal titanite lizard. Upon completing this path, you will find a fragrant branch of yore here. This shows that every pathway accounted for the fact that you may need the branch to unpetrify Rosabeth. This is a nice touch, as it would be annoying to have it only be down one path, especially since you would technically need three branches for Strayed, Rosabeth, and Ornifex, an NPC we will come to later on when we explore Shaded Woods further. The last path takes me further down the pathway and eventually up into the Windmill Tower. After defeating a few enemies, you will find the entrance and that this building is filled with poison as well. If you explore near the beginning, you can find this lockstone wall that gives you the Poison Bite Ring. This is a nice touch to have a useful ring nearby, but its usefulness is almost nullified by the fact that life gems are plentiful. It's much easier to simply heal through the poison than to actually wear the ring, since you may have other rings you may want to use that affect stamina, equip load, health, damage, etc., instead of using a ring that will only delay the inevitable. Once I find the ring, I'm going to head back outside where I will take a short path to an area with serious fan service. I'm, of course, talking about the Solaire-inspired Altar of Sunlight Covenant. Here you can join and improve your standing in the Covenant, as well as learn the Praise the Sun gesture. Some may enjoy this, and some may not, but I'll leave that up to you. Personally, I love the gesture, but mainly because it's stupid. But let's get back to the Windmill Tower. There is an area near the entrance to the tower where you will have to make a dodgy jump that leads to a small area with a few enemies, a trap, and eventually ends with a chest with a heavy crossbow in it. I'm not sure why they made this pathway only give you a very lackluster weapon. Add to the fact that platforming in the Souls series sucks, and you have a recipe for player resentment as they try and fail this jump over and over, only to be rewarded with a simple weapon. After I make my way back to the fog wall, I will engage the covetous demon. This boss is pitiful, as his attacks are easily dodged, he can get stuck spinning if you get behind his arms, and he has trouble keeping you in sight. This feels much less like a unique encounter and much more of a roadblock, just to slow you down and add another boss to the game, however underwhelming or downright terrible it may be. This isn't the worst roadblock boss yet though, so wait for the real surprise later on. After killing him, you can see that I shoot these zombies out from the pots they are stuck in, above where you fight covetous Jabba. Two things here to consider. The manual aiming with the crossbow is retarded, as you have to aim so far above the target to actually hit them manually that you can't actually see what you're aiming at anymore. That's dumb on its own, but then you begin to think about how and why these zombies were put in the pots and why they are dangling from the ceiling, and you wonder who did all of this. It certainly wasn't the covetous fatso, but I'm sure there's some kind of obscure reference to something that explains this perfectly, right? 
Once I slap the zombies down, I'll head to the bonfire after Jabba the Fat, where I will meet Lucatil again. Talking to her here will give you the Ring of Steel protection plus one, and will give some very blunt dialogue telling you that she is hollowing. She also mentions her unbeatable older brother who disappeared. She says that she is certain that the curse took him. I will encounter him later, but I'll get there when I get there. One thing that really bothers me about the end of this dialogue with Lucatil is that she says, if only someone would hear my tale, even though she just told me her tale. I know you forget stuff as a symptom of the curse, but this is just stupid that she doesn't know that she's telling her tale to someone literal seconds before saying that she wants someone to hear her tale. This makes me wonder if the curse makes you stupid as well as forgetful. All this drama around Lucatil has no resolution, by the way. She doesn't go hollow or die during the game, unless you kill her, of course. And she even shows up in the Frozen DLC much later for the Burnt Ivory King boss fight, the final fight of the final DLC for Dark Souls 2. This is something I'll talk about later on, but most NPC storylines don't have much going for them. Regardless, Harvest Valley is finished, and I'll head into Earth and Peak after heading back to Majula. After returning to Majula, you'll see Chloan again. She will now sit on her rock for the rest of the game and sell you other rocks she's found. One part of her dialogue talks about how the blacksmith nearby looks like her father, who is also a blacksmith. She also asks if he is one of those hollows, and says that he keeps eyeing her up. She also recounts her birth in Volgan, famous for its merchants, and how she left. After moving over to Lenegrast and talking to him, he will now give us the blacksmith's hammer. One thing about the delivery of this that bothers me is that he says to take these, but we only get one item. I don't know if we were supposed to get more items, or even two hammers, but either way, someone messed up somewhere. He eventually comments on his witless daughter finally coming home, and that she is as oblivious as she's always been. He then says that he can keep an eye on her for now. This ends Cloan and Lenegrast's storyline, I use that word loosely, but you can see that it didn't really amount to much beyond getting a key and getting Cloan off her keister to get to Majula. Apart from that, let's head to Earthen Peak. Before I say anything about Earthen Peak here, I just want to mention that the file for my Glassboy Bill run for Earthen Peak, Iron Keep, and Belfry Soul got corrupted, so it'll be exclusive footage of Magic Man Mark for a little bit. My apologies. Anyway, once you enter Earthen Peak proper, you'll see that these fast enemies are very nimble, but also very weak to sorcery. One of the first memorable encounters of this area will be on this tight walkway, where you will have to deal with two archers and a shielded dude. The archers can be shot easily, but are much harder to deal with if you have shield bro attacking you. Add that the walkway is tight, and you have very little maneuverability without retreating into the room before. If you have a hard-hitting weapon, however, you can stunlock shield bro into oblivion. Once you reach the next room, you will find a ladder where two nimble enemies drop from it. As you can see, it is best to slap them down quickly, as one of them almost stunlocked me to death. Before going up the ladder, I will hit a pulley that lifts these poison jars where I won't hit them if I fight near them, and after that, I'll go down to a chest near where the archers were positioned. This whole area in general has a decent amount of platforming, or at least environmental awareness, required to get certain items, so be careful with your controls. The next bonfire is up the ladder from earlier, and through the fog gate. I'm not sure why they put the fog gate here, but it may have been in an attempt to trick the player out of a potential bonfire checkpoint but it wouldn't be that long of a walk back anyway, so if that is true, it wouldn't change much. What would change a lot would be the boss arena after setting this windmill fan on fire. If you light this windmill fan on fire, it will remove a large portion of the poison from the boss area and the area itself. There's no real reason why this works that way, or why fire can light a metal beam on fire, but it's only going to get worse when you get toward the end of this pathway. After progressing up a ladder and exploring around the ledge, you will run into Gilligan, a ladder enthusiast. He is hiding from the enemies of the area, and will spill some of the lore around the boss, about how she sought a prince's approval but wasn't beautiful enough, so she tried to enhance herself and ended up becoming a horrible monster instead. Reminds me of some celebrities. After you talk to him enough, you can pay him 2,000 souls to use a ladder to get down to some items below. This NPC can also be used to lower a ladder into the first bit of the pit at Majula to make the way down easier. 
I don't know why they put him so far down this track as I, personally, didn't even know this pathway existed until I watched some videos on Dark Souls 2. And even then, I had already gone down to defeat the Rotten before even getting to him. If you came this way first, it would be a much easier ride down to the Grave of Saints, the Gutter, and Black Gulch anyway, as I would list this pathway towards the Old Iron King as harder than the path to the Rotten. Regardless, he will help you out with another ladder if you need it, assuming you have the souls for it. After exploring further, you will notice a massive lift in a nearby room with a soul under it. This lift can take you up to a chest, but I'll be visiting with Pate as he is chilling in this poison room. Interestingly, he will immediately give you his entire set of gear, spear, shield, clothes, and ring, and says that they were meant for you. This is a strong implication that this is most definitely the man who locked up Creighton earlier, and that Pate is trying to trick Creighton into thinking you are the one who wronged him. Pate will then talk about a treasure here that he doesn't quite have the guts himself to get. He is talking about what is behind the nearby door. After exploring more, you will come to an encounter with one of the pyromancers on the opposite side of a gap. For a ranged build, this can be easy, but for a melee build, this can be problematic. If you pay attention, you will realize that you are on a platform just above the opposite side of the wall that Pate is trying to get through. Here you can jump over, loot the chest containing Great Heavy Soul Arrow, then go through the door that wasn't openable from earlier. A little further along, you can find a room stuffed with two pyromancers and a shield bro, but this is made underwhelming by the fact that they have trouble aggroing to you at once, so you will have to deal with the awkward combat of one-on-one -on -one while the others ignore either of you fighting. And as you can see, the last pyromancer didn't even realize she was being murdered. After backtracking a little, you will go up a ladder and be between two doorways. One leads towards the boss, Mytha, and the other towards where you encounter the two pyromancers and the shield bro, only you are now on the other side. Returning to the boss route, you will see two pyromancers at the end of the hall near some poison vases. One quick peck by any weapon will usually be enough to stagger them into the vases, resulting in a quick and poisonous death for both of them. Afterwards, you will be rushed by a shield bro again. Fight in the corridor, as the pyromancer in the corner of the next room can really ruin combat with the shield bro. Once they are both dead, you will have the option to go straight for the boss, or try to get to the hidden bonfire above. Tragically, I get stunlocked to death during this run towards the boss. After making my way back, I'll head upstairs toward a room full of poison vases, poison bugs, and a mimic. This room requires patience to get through, so be cautious. This is an interesting encounter with our first mimic enemy. Here you can see that they no longer breathe like they did in Dark Souls 1, but have symbols that appear on mimic chests only, as well as having the lid open just enough to see their teeth. Once all of the enemies are dealt with, I will go up the stairs to fight a phantom. This phantom is very easy to stunlock to death, and since the game loves doing it to you, why not repay it in kind? Shortly after, I find the illusory walls containing a chest behind one, and the bonfire behind the other. After activating the bonfire, I jump down to begin the fight with the boss of Earth and Peak, Mytha. With Mytha, you may notice the poison ring around the room. This ring can heal the boss when she stands in it. This is such an annoying gimmick with the bosses in the game that you will see used more aggressively much later on. One thing that makes this boss fight extra terrible is that if you don't burn the windmill, you know, that obscure thing you probably wouldn't do on your own, then the entire arena is poisoned and she will heal all the time. You will be poisoned the entire fight, which makes it much more difficult and annoying as she continuously heals, as is the mantra of the game. One thing about this particular boss fight is that Jester Thomas does enough damage to solo her, so there's either a problem with the boss or the NPC, so take your pick. Once you finish the fight, you will find the elevator that leads to the next area and the biggest joke in the game. After riding up an elevator, you arrive in a lava land that is directly above Poison Land, even though you can see the sky from Poison Land. The world has finally broken itself, and I shouldn't have to explain why. This is something that should have easily been fixed by making the elevator go down instead of up. This reeks of incompetence or laziness or both, but this is something that turns the level design, more specifically the world design, into a joke, as most other areas don't have anything as dumb as this. This destroys the reputation that Dark Souls 1 set up for itself, with its interconnected world, when you realize that they abandoned that for the sequel. It's just sad. Some have defended this as the world falling away, and that things aren't supposed to make sense, 
but that is completely undone by more than half of the game making sense, and then certain bits just don't. It's half dumb, half okay. You have to commit to one or the other, not both. Anyway, with that hilariously incompetent realization, I have finished Earthen Peak. It is now time for the final stretch of this pathway into Iron Keep. Iron Keep, as you can tell, is a level full of lava and fire, and as such will have obstacles to overcome relating to these things. You may notice in the background some items far off in the corners of some lava, which are incredibly frustrating to get to considering the subpar movement of Dark Souls 2, the terrible platforming of the series in general, and that some platforms will burn you alive. I advise ignoring these items as much as you can, because in my eyes, they are not worth the hassle. Here's something interesting I found while going through the opening bit of this area. One small thing that produces problems is the way that the game will adjust your aim. See here where I'm shooting at an enemy on some stairs. While focusing and from a short distance, the first two shots make contact, but the third shot at close range is cast but completely disappears and misses. Then, directly after that failure, the focus system keeps me facing the enemy, but pushes my thrust off to the side. This can be very frustrating if you are in a tight spot and really need the attacks to come through for you. I've personally had several moments where I desperately needed an attack to go through, but the game changes the trajectory of an attack or focus forces me off to one side. This is most obvious with great swords, which require you to use the movement keys or movement analog stick to direct your swing, even with focus in use. There are many times where I and other players have been using these weapons and the game decides that we should swing 90 degrees to our left or right and even swing behind us when we are locked on to an enemy. I know people are going to defend this by saying that this was for the sake of PvP combat where you could use different swings while still focusing on your opponent and that this system appears in Dark Souls 3 so it must be good. This argument is flawed at the baseline because your swing can be adjusted even without touching your movement controls in order to direct it. The fact that this isn't told to the player by the game at all also produces issues, because this is something you'll have to find out on your own, which will usually involve you taking an extra hit or dying, because the game decided to aim your swing towards a very sexy part of the air instead of the dude trying to murder you. Dark Souls 3 gets a pass in my book for this system, because there is an option in the interface to allow this, which anyone can view. Dark Souls 2, on the other hand, will force you to look like a fool several times and you'll eventually have to pick up on your own what is actually causing your character to act retarded. After getting through the first few enemies, I will come upon Magarold, who is the person you use incense with. Incense will decrease the requirements for spells and miracles by decreasing the faith or intelligence needed to cast said miracle or spell. You use the simpleton spice to decrease intelligence, and the skeptic spice to decrease faith. These can be quite useful if you are working your way up to a certain spell or miracle, or if you just want to use certain abilities without grinding to level up the stat. This is good for magic and miracle builds, but Magarold also holds what I consider to be the best set of armor in the game, at least in terms of bonus effects, the Jester set. This set of gear has a passive effect on each item when worn. The Jester's cap raises item discovery, the Jester's robes nullifies critical attacks against you, as in backstabs are negated, the Jester's gloves increase souls gained, and the Jester's tights reduce fall damage. These, on top of the four ring slots available, gives you quite a lot of benefits once you purchase them from Magarold. The only downside to this is that the Jester's set has a dexterity requirement before you can use them properly. You require 14 dexterity before you can use them, and they do add a little weight to you, so be prepared to dump some levels into vitality and dexterity if you want to use this set. This is a strong set for glass cannon builds, as they don't rely on armor as much as other builds, so the benefits of wearing this set are very high. Increased souls gained, increased item discovery, reduced fall damage, and backstab nullification are quite useful in general, but is doubly effective in this game in particular because of the amount of souls given, items attainable, many areas having platforming, and you will most likely have to deal with several invasions in this game. This allows one of the staple moves of PvP, the backstab, to be negated in its entirety by using the robes. There's one encounter in particular later on that I will show that demonstrates what I'm talking about. That's in the final DLC though, so that's hours away. Once I'm done with Magarold, you'll notice the instances of areas with several tough enemies to put up with. Since I'm using a magic build here, and I have a lot of experience with this area, they aren't much of a problem. 
but be wary, as several of the smaller Alon Bros have some strange speed abilities. Once you make it through the first building, you'll meet the archer that can really ruin your walk across this little bridge, so keep in mind that he will be there spamming arrows at you. This area houses the optional boss, the smelter demon Orange. The reason I say Orange is because they repeat this boss fight later without changing its name, so it can get confusing when talking about both of them. The way to get around the boss is to interact with the flame contraption in the middle. This stops the flames from spewing out and allows you to go up a ladder that lets you continue through the area. I don't recommend doing this, as the smelter demon has a bonfire just after him, and it's nice to avoid the first several dudes of Iron Keep if possible, in the event that you die. One thing I do not appreciate about this area is the amount of platforming you will need to do. Some of it isn't that bad, but several spots have you jumping after items that will easily lead to your death by the way of the lava lake beneath you. One jump I especially don't like is the one over to the first large archer. There are several ways for the angle and momentum of the jump to screw the player over. This is an important area to get to because of the dull ember near the edge. This item is what I mentioned earlier regarding Macduff. This allows him to smith items and opens infusion for the player. This gives you access to making weapons do elemental damage, like lightning, fire, magic, dark, poison, and so on. After getting the ember, I fight the smelter demon. I'll call him Mr. Orange, which I consider to be a very basic fight with a few cheap tactics to the boss. Mr. Orange hits hard and has an aura of damage around him after you deplete a certain amount of health. This, combined with the fact that he can easily stunlock you to death, is one reason why I think they repeated him. He embodies the Dark Souls 2 style boss fight. Cheap, lazy, and easily beaten once you figure him out. The reason I say that it is easy to beat is because Mr. Orange's moveset isn't that fast or complex. All he does is swing his sword a few different ways and has the slow AoE effect coming from his body. Apart from that, there isn't much of the boss fight when it comes to his attacks. His weaknesses are quite exploitable as well. He can be poisoned, he is weak to magic, lightning, and dark. So if you get one summon to tank him, like Lucatiel is now, you can sit back and spam him with spells, miracles, or arrows. After defeating him, you will find the bonfire up the stairs, which will link up to the way you need to go. After grabbing the dull ember from Iron Keep, I'll bring it back to Macduff so he can infuse and upgrade my weapons. To get him off of the chest he is sitting on, you will need to light a torch and light the sconce near his anvil. After resting at the bonfire or leaving the area, he will now be at the anvil and you can open the chest which houses the Craftsman Hammer and a Twinkling Titanite. This hammer is quite nice as it does a decent amount of damage and has good durability as well. The only downside is that you have to be right on top of an enemy for it to connect. Backstabs with it are also very fun because of the pancake maneuver you do to the enemy, but that may just be my own subjective view of it. Once I make it back to Iron Keep, you'll see this scripted sequence where one of the turtle enemies destroys part of the bridge you are on. This is something that I have mixed feelings about, because it shows some creativity from the AI and their strategies, but also makes it easy to beat the turtle dude because he can't attack you once the bridge is broken. He'll just run away. Another aspect of this encounter that I don't like is how the large Alon Knight won't attack you if you are in line of sight near the doorway but once you make it inside, he will aggro to you and ambush you from behind while you are dealing with the turtle enemy. This is cheap and nonsensical, as he should clearly be able to see you before you enter the bridge area. Even worse than that, if he can't see you when you're standing 10 feet away from him, he should definitely not detect you through the wall. This is simply another spam and ambush like many other instances in the game, however poorly executed it may be. Because of this ambush and because of my poor decision making, I die here. Once I respawn, I make sure to kill the Elan Knight first and then deal with the turtle dudes. Once we defeat them, we run into a room with several Elan archers and a few more turtle dudes. One thing I find hilarious about this area is how the small Elan Knight, who has a bow mind you, will turn away from me, run towards me to attack, and will usually be killed by the player flipping the lever that lowers the platform into the lava, killing him and his turtle friends. In my experience with the game, this is one of the two encounters I typically have in this area. The other is simply shooting him until he runs over anyway, so there isn't much difference, but he just needs some encouragement to run into the trap then. The door nearby houses a lockstone hole that opens to a ladder leading to a chest, a bonfire, and an optional area, Belfry Soul. 
One major problem I have with this is that the area with the bonfire is a few feet below where the rest of the platform is. If you rest at the bonfire, you will be prevented from jumping out of there. This means that we are forced through Belfry Soul to return to where we just were, or forced to warp to the bonfire after the Smelter Demon in order to return, or to the unlucky few who don't kill Smelter, they have to traverse all of the area from the first bonfire to return to this spot. This is a very cheap and outright dumb way to make the player go through Belfry Soul if they come up this way. Belfry Soul is optional, and you don't have to drop down to the bonfire anyway since you could ignore the Lockstone Hole and continue on, so why force them through this area if it's supposed to be optional? Why not have the bonfire on the same level as the chest and the first ladder? Why not have it be a useful bonfire that leads in two directions instead of one way that loops around to where you need to go anyway? It's just there to frustrate the player, either through repeating something they've already done, or forcing them through an area they may not want to go through. Belfry Soul is very much like Belfry Luna, albeit a bit longer and without a boss. Here, you will have to fight against some dwarves again, as well as a few amazing PvP-style NPCs such as Caster, Tank, and Crossbow. As you can see from the footage, Tank is no match for my five great soul arrows. Once I climb the ladder, I meet Crossbow and get invaded by a bellkeeper. Crossbow has a triple shot crossbow, so be wary of his three bolts flying toward your face. After him, you'll see that Tank has returned and is supported by two dwarves with bows. Just to make it clear, this part is annoying without taking out the dwarves first. Now that it's been said, they're all very susceptible to poison and any ranged weapons, so keep those handy. One thing that I find funny is that my first two arrows towards Tank don't appear at all, but still hit him. I'm pretty sure this is just a bug, so don't expect some huge essay about it. I know I tend to ramble about nothing, which is pretty much this entire video. Once everyone is defeated, I'm going to go back to a lever near the ladder that I forgot to hit. Hitting it opens the gate that blocks the exit from being passed through. It is guarded by none other than the Bellkeeper, but because of my massive number of spells handy, he is simply a dwarf without purpose. Even dumber than that, I forget to hit the lever again, so I then go back again to hit the lever to move on. Afterwards, you will find a chest with immolation inside, and a pathway leading to the area above the bonfire you got stuck at. Again, this bonfire should have just been even with the platform, so you can choose to go through Belfry's Hole or not. It leads in a circle anyway, so it's really just a pointless extension of the area. As we progress through the area, you'll notice the large Alon Knights with bows that can destroy you if you aren't careful. Thankfully, I know how to use and abuse them by hitting the pressure plates that drop the platforms they are on. Once they are dealt with, I climb the ladder to find another chest. This one, however, is a mimic, which should be easy to deal with, but the great god of Dark Souls 2 hitboxes strikes again. Bruh. After making my way back to the Mimic, I fight it and manage to kill it, but with a few hiccups of getting stuck under it for a few seconds. It drops Dark Armor and the Lightning Wing Spear. This is somewhat of a reference to Dark Souls 1's first Mimic, holding the Lightning Spear, but the reference only goes as deep as that, in which case it may not even be a reference at all, but I'll leave that up to your discretion. I make my way around and find another chest, this time full of great arrows and set teeth, and a ladder leading up into an area I really don't like. This area houses three large Alon Knights with great bows. Two on the left and one on the right. These enemies are already tough as is, and combined with how much damage they can do with their bows, I'm glad that rotten boosting was done beforehand. The nearby chest holds the Black Knight Great Axe if anybody cares for it. The only way out is down from here, leading to some very thin platforms leading down into the area just after the room with all the Alon Knights, and the dropping platforms. This little space annoys me, as these platforms serve no purpose other than a means to go down from where the player becomes trapped. It could have made sense if they had tried, but who am I kidding at this point? After making my way down, you'll see an Alon Knight on a platform preparing to ambush those that went through the route with all the dropping platforms by trapping them in a hallway with another enemy up ahead. You'll also find a skeleton in a giant cauldron that has the covetous gold serpent ring, the ring that increases item discovery. 
Once I jump down, I've lined back up with the pathway towards the old one of this route, the Old Iron King. In the hallway I mentioned before, I'll run into another turtle enemy that can really prove to be an issue if you don't have a thrust weapon or something with an overhead strike. The second turtle around the corner can be damaged by this guillotine in the hallway, but I have a question. Why would anyone put this guillotine here? This is such an awkward place to put something like this. After that, I make it to a room with metal bull heads spraying fire in a sequence. This area is annoying and stupid, as there are the flame bowls and spiked walls in this tiny room. Why does this room even exist? Who has this in their castle? Maybe the lord over this castle was a sadistic guy, and I'm just being rude. I go up a ladder that leads to a bonfire, and a lever that deactivates all of the flaming bull heads in this zone. Very useful, and right next to the boss. Nice job, DS2. You can do something right. This middle platform I passed doesn't have anything on New Game, but New Game Plus has an NPC that can be a real pain to deal with going up or down through it. After I make my way down, I grab the lightning short bow by the bullheads. I like using this bow as a part of my cheap poison strategy, as the arrows will do poison damage on top of lightning damage. A very effective combination, in my opinion. After getting past this last turtle dude, I'm finally at the old Iron King boss fight. I find this boss fight, like many others, to be a disappointing mess. He looks super intimidating during the cutscene. He's a giant demon that was napping in lava. This should be an epic fight in the traditional sense, but as soon as the fight starts you see exactly why this boss is extremely forgettable. He's abusively susceptible to any ranged attacks, and his melee swipes are so slow and painfully easy to dodge. His fire breath can be annoying as well on top of the fact that you can get caught near a small opening in the platform that can lead to your death. This boss is such a bore because of his moveset. After most melee slashes, he will just leave his arms there for a few seconds, which makes him wide open for melee attacks. One thing that makes those worse is that he has one charged flame smash that has a lingering hitbox that can still get you even after the flames have dissipated. This is just a bad boss, plain and simple. His old king soul, dropped in New Game Plus, ties him to Gwyn and the Four Kings, which you wouldn't believe considering he is in a place populated by lava and fire, so Bed of Chaos would have made much more sense, but what can you do? After defeating him, you can find a chest with more sublime bone dust in it, and you now have access to the Broom Tower DLC, or the Fire DLC, for ease of understanding. After making my way back to Majula, you can see the Emerald Herald tells us to proceed, since I have over 1 million soul memory now but it's kind of awkward to think about since we still have one pathway and one old one left to defeat. Again, the inconsistencies boggle my mind, especially when Dark Souls 1 set the bar so high. But with that, I'm out of corrupted melee build footage, so I can go back to that. I now return to my boy as we check out Drangleic Castle and begin the final pathway after getting to Drangleic Castle. It's weird, okay? I'll get to the pathway soon. Anyway, I now have enough souls to pass through the 1 million soul gate, and also gain access to the ICE DLC, Elaim Lois. This is something that I don't quite understand about the placement of the DLCs, being that you can reach the fire and poison DLCs early on depending on what path you take, but the ICE one is locked off until you complete a large portion of the game. Relatively speaking, all of the DLCs share a similar difficulty range, as most enemies have high health, high stamina, high agility, high numbers, etc. Add that each DLC contains three boss fights, with at least one being a pain to get to or fight, and they even out for the most part. I'll go over all of that later on when I get through the DLCs, but it bugs me how they are placed. This doesn't affect how the keys were handled before they were dropped into your inventory either. The keys for Poison Land and Fire Land were found in Majula and the Forest of Fallen Giants respectively, before being dropped into your inventory. Those are very early game levels that you have access to, but people may have missed them so they dropped them into your inventory from the start to appease those that couldn't bother to explore or read the wiki. The ice DLC's key was found in Drang Lake Castle along the main path, so it would have been found either way. As I said earlier, this doesn't affect progression at all, since you can still go to the poison and fire DLCs without going through the hoops to get to the ice DLC. I genuinely don't know why the developers just caved and dropped the keys into your lap. Dark Souls 1 didn't do this at all with the Artorius of the Abyss DLC, which had some very specific requirements to be met before making it to that DLC. Much more than simply finding a key. 
I know I said it as a joke earlier, but Dark Souls 2 becomes more and more the meme version of Dark Souls 1 the more time you have to think about it. Getting back to the walk to the castle, I'll meet the last Hade Knight here. He is a very lonely boy that drops a Hade Lance when killed. One thing I would like to stress about this next bit is that you can clearly see Dranglant Castle on the left side of this tunnel when in Shaded Woods. Mind you, this tunnel is straight. Let me say all that again. Dranglant Castle is on the left, and the tunnel is straight. Castle, left, tunnel, straight. Got it? Now watch. Fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it! You see what happened there? Gwyn has nothing on Vendrick, especially when Vendrick can teleport his castle wherever he needs to. It's like Dalaran from World of Warcraft. I'm kidding, it's just the developers failing to make a grounded world map, or failing to make accurate backdrops. This is something that Mr. Matosis points out in his Dark Souls 2 critique, where he mentions that the levels have backdrops that are meant to give a basic idea of where other areas are, but end up being significantly out of position. There's no hint of Iron Keep whatsoever from the outside of Earth and Peak. From Harvest Valley the sky is overcast, but in Iron Keep it has a red glow and the surrounding area is suddenly an enormous wasteland of lava. Similar transitions exist elsewhere. Going from the Tower of Flame down to No Man's Wharf makes no sense as this places the wharf somewhere below sea level. Going to the boss in Aldeus Keep reveals the landscape to be far below, but in reality the player should be more or less at the same altitude as Majula here since they've only walked up a few stairs. Even worse then, transitioning to the Dragonary reveals an obviously impossible set of outcrops in the sky which weren't visible just moments before. There's a host of smaller issues as well, such as the Tower of Flame, as seen from Majula, which is way out of position. As a result, the feel of Dark Souls 2 suffers heavily compared to the other games, which felt much more consistent in their geography. These backdrops are only there to make it feel like the world is connected logically, but it simply isn't once you really look and think about it. It's also a bit confusing how a few meters away it was light without rain, but once we make our way through the magic tunnel it is now very dark with heavy rain. This is another screw up with the level and atmosphere design that could have been corrected with a few minor changes here and there. They could have done something like what Peter Jackson did in the Lord of the Rings film trilogy. Mordor is always covered in shadow because of the barren and ashy nature of the area, because it is home to a volcano. They could have copped out and had a boss causing the shadow and rain. It's not ridiculous to think that a boss could do that, or that that kind of magic exists in the world. We've seen Gwendolyn affect the weather and lighting of an area, so why not use that again here? They also could have fixed it by simply having Shaded Woods lead to some nest that causes a cutscene to play, where a creature takes you from the end of Shaded Woods to Dranglaic Castle. This type of thing has been done before in Dark Souls 1 with the giant bird and the flight up to Anne Orlando. You can have both pieces and make it work, but they simply didn't care enough to fix it, or it was rushed. All that aside, I have finally made it to Dringley Castle for a bit. Once I reach the castle, I run into the Emerald Herald here. This is the first time she leaves Majula for the player, and proceeds to say some very strange things such as, your fate will be more terrible than mere life or death, even though the curse of the undead is a thing, and the player is one of them, so our fate is already more terrible than life and death. A strange choice of words, to say the least. One minor thing I want to point out about Dranglaic Castle in comparison to Anne Orlando is this tiny bridge that leads up to it. Now, I'm no expert on castles or castle design, or what kind of traffic a castle would or should have, but this seems really narrow for the King's Castle. Traffic up and down it must have been a pain back in the day. Anne Orlando at least had a sprawling city underneath you when you arrived, and it wasn't simply cut off from the world by a door or a little rubble. And Orlando was open-ended to how resources go in and out of the city and the castle, as well as there being a rite of passage to get into Anne Orlando in the first place, but here there is only this one way into and out of Dranglant Castle, by way of a tunnel and a stone archway, assuming the king didn't leave the rubble and shaded woods broken forever, because that would be even more ridiculous than what I just said. This opening section to Dranglant Castle is very annoying to me. The two archers supporting the giant elephants is a pain, as their arrows can pierce through the two elephants and the two of them can block the pathway up to the castle. Add that it's an ambush because the big guys are camouflaged as statues, and you have a recipe for annoyance and death. 
Thankfully, I'm aware of the ambush and have several strategies available to me to overcome this hurdle, such as smack the elephants and run away repeatedly, poison them to death, or make Carhelion proud. With the archers and the elephants out of the way, I now must open the door by killing something near each chalice so the souls will power up the giants to turn the chalice to open the door. It sounds dumb and unnecessary, but it is even worse when you realize that you could simply open doors like this in Dark Souls 1 by pushing them or using a lever. This system means that some players won't have anything to kill if they don't kill anyone close enough to the statues to activate it. The developers decided to deal with this by having several soldiers spawn every little bit to make sure you have a chance at opening the door. Personally, I simply would have had the first encounter with the elephants and the archers and the door just opens once you interact with it, because the post spam spam can be very annoying to deal with. The spam comes from the left side, but the right side has a chest with great combustion and a fire seed in it. Once I open the door, I'll be greeted by this handsome ghostly gentleman, Chancellor Welliger, who asks who you are and says that you are trespassing. He then questions where the king is and calls you a guest. He then mentions that the queen took the king and that the king vanquished the four great ones and built Drangleic upon their souls. First off, he's clearly lost his marbles since he called me a guest moments after saying I'm trespassing, and second, he mentioned that Vendrick defeated the four great ones. It's unclear if this is the four old ones in Dark Souls 2, or the four great soul holders from Dark Souls 1. I would assume the latter, as it wouldn't make sense for us to defeat enemies that have already been defeated by the king, as well as the use of four great ones instead of four old ones. This produces another problem, as those four great ones were already defeated by the player in Dark Souls 1, so there is a problem no matter what way you look at it, as there isn't anything mentioning powerful beings or a cursed time between Lordran and Drenglaic's eras. He then mentions that the king had a queen of unparalleled beauty, so what he's saying is, amazing chest ahead. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist. He also states that the queen came to them alone from a faraway land, and warned the king of the threat of the giants across the sea. The king commandeered their power after defeating them and created the golems that were used to build Drangleic Castle. Don't know where he was ruling from before then, but whatever. This was done to celebrate victory and to show his love and gratitude to the queen. He then says that the queen brought peace to the king and the kingdom, a peace so deep that it was like the dark. He then starts losing his mind again, questioning if this is a dream, who you are, what happened at the castle, Blah, 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 you get the gist. Then he turns into a vendor selling a few weapons, arrows, bolts, and some miscellaneous items like the beefiest life gems. I buy some items and then I move on, but before I do, I would like to mention how funny it is that a foreign woman effectively ruined the giants and the kingdom of Drangleic. This social commentary from Dark Souls 2 is amazing. Afterwards, I go up into the throne room of sorts. This room is pointless on New Game, but spawns two Pursuers on New Game Plus onwards. I never fight them, as I have no desire to fight the Pursuer that many times in a single playthrough. Once I go down, I'll meet some beefy knights that look like Dwemer armor from Skyrim, and eventually make my way to the first bonfire of the castle. This next area is very tricky, especially on New Game Plus, but I'll come back to it later. Heading back to Shaded Woods for the final pathway available, I'm going to go through a ghostly area next. This isn't a cool ghost encounter, like in New Londo Ruins, but instead has you walking aimlessly through a fog while being attacked by nearly invisible enemies. They have a vague outline you can see, but given the fog, it can be difficult to see them without looking hard for them. Another thing about this area that bugs me, as well as several others in the game, is the overabundance of destructible pots that do something to the player when they are nearby or when destroyed. These status pots, as I'll call them, tend to have one of two effects in Dark Souls 2, poison or curse. The poison ones aren't that bad in my eyes, because you can't be poisoned by them unless you break them close to you, which is totally fair, and even if you do get poisoned, a life gem will usually be enough to negate the entire poison effect anyway, so they aren't that hard to deal with unless you don't understand your resources very well. On the other hand, curse pots will continuously build up your curse meter whenever you are near them, and can only be stopped by destroying them. The functionality of one conflicts with the other. The poison pots make complete sense to me, as poison would most likely be a toxin-based slime or liquid substance that you could easily place in a pot. Curse doesn't have that same simplicity as the only times you get cursed in Dark Souls 1, 
was when picking up invader bloodstains or when getting clouded by the basilisks or when dealing with seeth's encounters so it's either magical or gaseous this isn't a simple put it in a pot situation these curse pots don't make sense because how do you keep a cloud in a pot after moving a little bit farther into the deep colorless fog wink wink i'll find a chest with the old sun ring this ring is a strange design choice to add to the game, in my opinion, as it essentially lets you retaliate against enemies without you having to attack them. The catch is that you have to take damage from them for this to work, and it loses 10 of its 75 durability every explosion, so I'm not sure how good this ring will be considering it'll take a couple thousand souls to repair, and it'll only give you a maximum of 8 explosions. In my own experience, the ring doesn't do that much damage either, you're better off using a weapon or spell to damage the enemies, as you have more control over those and aren't required to take damage in order to use those. I see this ring as more of an experiment than anything else, and you can tell its effectiveness, as well as other experimental changes made in Dark Souls 2, when looking at what was kept or dropped going from Dark Souls 2 to Dark Souls 3. This ring flies in the face of the most basic concept every game with a health bar has, that you should be doing your best to avoid damage. On a side note, one comment on the Dark Souls 2 wiki page for this ring made me laugh, as it stated that this ring was the Don't Spam Me ring, which I found quite funny. Some of the best parts of the wikis are the comments, I swear. <laughs> After a little while, you'll come across a small path leading up to an area with some rubble and a head that you can speak to. This is Vengarl, or at least his head, and he describes his reason for being here. He fought for the kingdom, and that led to his demise of losing his body. Now his head sits here alone to his thoughts, while his body is out there roaming around, killing anything in reach. I was going to write sight, but that seems in poor taste at the moment. He mentions that his body is wielding a sword forged only to kill, which sounds as dumb as saying a grenade is made only to explode. Anyway, after you finish talking to him, you'll learn the decapitate gesture. I see what you did there from software. And you'll find that he has a few items he sells, one of them being the greatsword, arguably one of the strongest weapons to get early game. It's a very useful weapon, as you've seen, and now you can purchase as many as you want from Vengarl. A couple small things to note before I get to the big thing that annoys me about Vengarl. First, it is a little weird that the Greatsword's description lists it as one of the few Ultra Greatswords, so shouldn't it be named Ultra Greatsword? I don't know, maybe I'm just being petty. Second, how could Vengarl's body have disappeared when it doesn't have eyes to see where it's going? And how hasn't it been destroyed by walking into fire, into an enemy, into the ocean where something could eat it, or falling off cliffs? I'll bring this final point up further down the pathway, trust me. Thirdly, how in the name of Gwyn can Vengarl teach a gesture when he's just ahead? I found that as a comment on the wiki and nearly died laughing. What I didn't laugh at was what Vengarl's decapitation represents to me. How does his head and body function? This may seem like a small nitpick, but this demands so many follow-up questions. Can all undead survive decapitation with their limbs getting minds of their own? Can anything survive decapitation and have its limbs get minds of their own? If so, that could have been an awesome boss encounter in Dark Souls 2 or 3. Imagine fighting an enemy whose appendages detach after you cut them off, and they come after you. That would be a great experiment. Side note. Phalanx from Demon Souls doesn't count, as the hoplites weren't limbs. Getting back to headpiece, Vengarl apparently is the only person whose head and body can survive and don't get along. It gets even worse later on when you find out that he magically gets fixed, albeit with a smaller body than before, which also doesn't make sense, but whatever. It's all going crazy anyway, so why not enjoy it, right? Anyway, before I leave Vengarl to his thoughts, and after I exhaust his dialogue, I'll get his headpiece even though you can still see it on his head. I don't even know anymore. Personally, it would have been cool to have Vengarl have a small quest to do where he mentions having a backup set of armor somewhere that you need a key for, but first you have to get it off his body. That way you could avoid having him give you a headpiece he's still wearing. But it is what it is. I'll talk about his armor later on once I have the full set, as I have a few things to say about it. After getting back to the deep colorless fog, I'll find a chest with an invisible ambusher that gives us the upgraded Chloranthi ring plus one. This is a nice touch, but I wish that the Souls games didn't give you any upgraded rings until New Game Plus, as I think it lends more to the world being tougher after each playthrough, but also potentially being more rewarding at the same time. 
Once I move past the ring, I will be able to find the path leading to some ruins that house the next bonfire of this area. This area is one that has always annoyed me because of the hoops you have to go through to get everything from this area. One thing I find interesting about this area is how many curse pots there are. There is an absurd amount of them, and they are often placed right next to enemy encounters. They aren't the only problem, though. There's one place in particular that I hate that I will get to in a moment. Before then, let's talk about these lion enemies and the platforming around here. As most Souls players know, platforming has always sucked in the series, so this area can produce problems. Many times, you may fail and fall into a pit of death, or end up having to loop back around where you began the jump. It's quite frustrating most of the time. Next are the lion enemies. This one I kill near the bonfire angers me for two reasons. One is that he can attack you as soon as you spawn in, which is always a big no-no in my book. It'd be up there with make accurate hitboxes and don't do cheap tricks. They'd be on my Ten Commandments of Game Design. I might make a video on that. Someday. The other reason that I hate this enemy in particular is that you need to unpetrify this guy, using up a precious resource, mind you, then kill him in order to get a key that doesn't drop from him, it just appears in your inventory as soon as he's dead, and use that key to free someone later on to unlock the other half of boss weapons and spells. This is such an annoying encounter with this guy that angers me on so many mechanical levels. Also, none of the lion enemies get petrified, even if you have them getting breathed on by the basilisk spam. The petrified ones are just petrified because... stuff. Figure that one out. Add that the lion enemies hit incredibly hard, and that can be quite a pain. After regaining my souls and getting vengeance against the lion dudes, I run down a short path to find a small ruined area with the scorpion dude chilling. There is a titanite lizard here that gives you two titanite shards, one titanite chunk, and a bolt stone. I don't understand why it gives you such a random assortment of upgrade materials. It's just all over the place, but let's not complain too much about that. I always end up killing this scorpion dude as he drops the second dragon ring, which is essentially Dark Souls 2's equivalent to the Ring of Favor and Protection, but without the ring breaking if you take it off. There is a third dragon ring that I will get later, but I'll get there when I get there. This unfortunate scorpion boy is someone that requires a specific ring to communicate with, the Ring of Whispers which leads you to do a series of visits to him where you can get him to fight the boss of the area, Scorpion S. Najka, his wife. You get a fragrant branch of Yor after defeating Najka and talking to him, and then you get the second dragon ring after completing the pathway's old one boss fight, the Duke's dear Freya. He has several lines of dialogue stating that Freya is his master who changes form, who ultimately is Seath from Dark Souls 1. In case you couldn't tell, Scorpion Boy will say, but our master never dies, only changes form, so that he may seethe for all eternity. Seethe for all eternity. Seethe, seethe for, for all, all eternity. eternity! I'm cringing at how on the nose this is. I kill him early for the ring because one, I don't care to come back to this area ever once completed, and two, I want the ring sooner rather than later, since you get it either way. The Yor branch is a nice gift to give, but you have to have the right ring to even talk to the guy so I see this as more of a hassle than a proper quest. You just do what you're going to do anyway, but he'll reward you for it. When I return to the main pathway, I meet the first giant basilisk most players will see in the game. It's essentially the same as other basilisks, but with cranked health and damage, as well as some new attacks. These guys are usually easy to kill because their combat range, as in the radius the game allows them to fight within, is ridiculously small compared to the areas you can attack them from. Any ranged attacks make killing them easy, or at least soften them up before going in for the finishing strike. You can see me here spamming it with bolts and spells because it's so easy to abuse. After that wonderfully challenging encounter, you have more lions, ruins, and more curse pots to deal with. I also run into another Yor restricted area, and I'm unlocking it to show that it drops a set of armor that casters may find useful, as well as it refunds your Yor branch. What a saint of a pathway! Praise the sun! The Lion Mage set, the set from the chest, increases casting speed slightly for each piece worn. Very useful for casters. After the chest, I will fall through a small hole in the ground to get to two important things, the Dark Pilgrim Covenant and Ornifex. The Dark Pilgrim, I'll call him Legs, talks to you a bit and mentions how you want a truer dark. Then he will meet you again. 
This hints at encountering him more often, which you will. So I won't be doing anything with him yet. The other part of this area, the one I mentioned earlier, is the rest of this cave that leads to Ornifex, the other boss soul vendor. Ornifex is trapped behind a door in a cave with several basilisks next to it, and item corrosive acid everywhere in the cave. I think you understand why I hate this area. One thing about the basic basilisks that has changed from Dark Souls 1 to 2 is that their jump move can now do damage and stagger you, not to mention knock you on the ground for a second. Once the spam is gone, I rescue Ornifex, who says to meet her farther down the path as she must return to her home in order to reward you. She will meet you a little later on, so keep that in mind. Here you will find another Estus Flash Shard, which makes the hassle to get here feel much more worth it. After I go back to Majula to upgrade my weapons and Estus, I return to face Najka. I feel like they were going for a Quilag vibe with Najka, as she has a relative nearby, and that she is half human and half monster. There are some differences, though, that make this encounter more enduring than when the Belfry Gargoyles reference the Bell Gargoyles. This fight does a nice surprise by having the monster half of Najka and her name hidden before her real body is revealed. Creates a decent surprise for players new to the game. She also has a decently varied set of abilities, being that she has a poison grab, a pincher slice, a spear thrust, some spell use, and a move where she burrows into the ground in order to hide from the player and ambush them when she appears again. Overall, I'd say this fight isn't that bad. It's only bad if you're severely outleveled and geared up to destroy. It also doesn't help that there are times where Najka can get stuck on some of the tree trunks sticking out of the ground, which can lead to major abuse of the boss with ranged attacks. But with the fight over, I'm almost done with Shaded Woods, but I'll come back for the final section later. Now I'm heading into the next area, the Doors of Pharos. When you enter the Doors of Pharos, you have two ways to go, up or straight. The Doors of Pharos is an optional area, as the way up continues the pathway, but straight takes you through this area and towards the boss. Going up also leads you to Gavlan in his final position. He will stay here for the rest of your playthrough, and now he sells infinite poison items, so prepare for the spam of poison arrows. This is a nice place to put him, as there is a bonfire just below him, so you'll easily get to him to sell items or purchase something. As you can see, you will accumulate a lot of items throughout the game, with many of them being useless or mediocre for you at best, so I recommend selling anything that your build doesn't need or what you'll never use. After I'm done with Gavlan, I jump down to this mimic next to the bonfire and kill it. We then return after leveling up to face this area. This entire area will play very differently depending on what covenant you are in. If you are in the Rat Covenant, the enemies won't attack you, but if you aren't, then get ready for a spam fest. This covenant was a real pain to deal with in the early days because of the spam of a giant elephant, a small rat dog thing, and on top of that, an invader. Mr. Matosis brought this up with a fully accurate description of it. The covenants in Dark Souls 2 are mostly analogous to the ones in the first game, but one which saw a major overhaul was the Gravelord Covenant, which has been replaced by the Rat one. I always wanted to love the Gravelord Covenant in Dark Souls 1, but found it inherently unsatisfying since you don't get to witness what's happening to the people you Gravelord. This seems to be what the Rat Covenant is rectifying, but it's gone way overboard. The Rat Covenant is a completely unfair and frustrating setup to go against. In the doors of Pharos, players are immediately assaulted by a huge mammoth creature, a toxin-inflicting rat, and an enemy player, all while wading around in knee-deep water which restricts movement. This isn't a PvP exchange, it's a meat grinder designed for the amusement of the rat. Some people defend this by saying the victim loses nothing in the engagement even if they die, but this is a weak excuse. I don't judge my enjoyment of a game based on how much stuff I have in my inventory, I judge it by the things happening to me. Being pulled out of a level, into a load screen, only to be slaughtered by impossible odds, taunted by an enemy player and then kicked back into a load screen is a waste of time at best. One thing that makes this pathway extra annoying to me is that there are a great deal of Pharos lockstone keyholes to deal with that open up some items and traps, but will often be useless duds that just waste a resource of yours. After this lockstone in particular, you'll get the Saintier Spear, one of the weirder items in the game. It's essentially a spear that you can break, but once you do, it'll still do decent damage without having a durability count to manage. It's essentially an infinite durability weapon. I don't personally use it just because I prefer my rapier and greatsword over it, but use it if you choose. One thing that will annoy many people about this area is the water preventing you from running at full speed. 
This is only in the first area of the map, but this is also where the invasions typically occurred, so connect the dots to see what pain this will induce. After I progress a bit, you'll see more of these Gurm dudes that look like Gavlan. These guys are strange to me, as they do a good bit of damage, but are left wide open as soon as they raise their arm. They also have an incredibly strong shield that they use, which is very hard to break the guard on. This shield, the Gurm Great Shield, is very effective against the ancient dragon boss fight that we will see later. It's also effective against any other fire-based enemy, but it really shines when dealing with the ancient dragon because of that boss's terribly cheap moveset. Once I reach the next bonfire, I'll be at the boss, and I try my best to bank whatever souls I have before this fight begins. Because, as Mr. Matos has put it, it's a crapshoot, and you'll see why in a second. But before that, enjoy him saying it. The Royal Rat Authority, on the other hand, is a retread of the Sith fight with four random enemies which inflict toxin slapped in front of it to make it harder. If you manage to kill the four rats, the fight is practically over, but unless you're a pyromancer it's a crapshoot about whether you'll manage to get them all before the giant one mauls you to death. Similar problems extend to other boss fights, which seem to follow the mantra, if you can't make it good, make it difficult by adding more stuff. This boss fight is against four small rats and one giant one, and boy is it bad. These little mongrels can rush you, stunlock you, and will apply Toxic to you, the toughest version of poison. They can be killed easily with spells and ranged weapons if you play it smart. And once that is done, the boss fight is pretty much over, as the big rat doesn't have a very strong moveset. It leaves itself wide open after many of its attacks, and anyone with a greatsword will tell you how easy it can be to hit him. One move that I particularly despise is the Acid Barf move. He will aim down and spew acid on the floor in a wide radius, which damages your item durability heavily, so be ready with a ranged weapon or spells to spam while he does this. This is an annoying gimmick that will be used in a much worse way later. This boss was easy for me, but usually ends up being a 50-50 shot of defeating it because of the small rats and the big rat combo killing you, like Mr. Matosa said. After defeating the royal crapshoot, I'll run into the rat dude again. Here you have another chance to join the Rat Covenant, even though he shows his distaste for you after the boss fight, right before offering you a chance to join. I don't know why this is, but I won't see him again, so it's not really a big deal. One nice thing about this whole area is how it looped around on itself, where you can get right back to Gavlan and the first bonfire. Now I'll head up the walkway past Gavlan and find a small path out of the doors of Pharos that leads to Brightstone Cove Seldora, the final area of this pathway. And with that, the Doors of Pharos area is done. What an amazing area with a legendary boss, right? Once I exit the Doors of Pharos, you'll find yourselves in a small sort of camp with some Amish zombie looking people. This area houses a bonfire in a tent, but it has a similar problem as the Sinner's Rise bonfire, where enemies are right next to you when you spawn in. It's a little better because they can't shoot you, but they will still aggro very quickly most of the time. This area at the beginning is one that seems very underwhelming to me, as you fight a couple people and some boars while finding a few souls and hidden items around their little village. The boars are very underwhelming, because they're basically just bigger versions of the piglets at Majula. They aren't even like the armored boars from Dark Souls 1, which I considered pretty cool. They're just rotten looking boars. This gets worse in New Game Plus, because they add two giant boars to also re-at you. Once I start going down the mountain, I'll be ambushed by two boulders dropping on me. These will most likely throw you off the edge, but they are very easy to see, so I don't think they're too difficult to get past. One thing that bugs me about this is how the first boulder holder gets killed as soon as he activates the trap. I don't know why that is, but I would assume that this may have been rushed, as I don't think it would be that hard to code him to activate it without dying. It also shows that the hitbox for the boulder is bigger than the model, but that's nothing new for Dark Souls 2 at this point. After dealing with the crowd ahead and the second boulder, I'll come to a doorway with a cliff off to our right. This area is relatively boring this time, but on New Game Plus, the Duke's dear Freya will appear, and you can fight her for a little bit, which I think is a nice New Game Plus change that they could have done more with. After I open the doors to this spider crypt area, you'll notice all the holes in the first room, and how all the holes in the second room are filled with spiders. This area starts what we'll call the Spider Bush. The spider bush is unique to this pathway, and it's exactly what it sounds like. You will be ambushed by a lot of spiders down this pathway. This time I was ambushed after attacking one of them, but the intended ambush is running in and opening this chest that activates the encounter. Given my weapon, they are easy to take down. After that encounter, I'll come to a fog gate and a hidden path. 
The hidden path leads to another Estus shard, and then I'll fight the most pitiful boss in the entire game. Behold, Prowling Magus and the Congregation. This is such a pitiful boss fight. It's just a few zombies, two healing zombies, and a bigger dude that occasionally shoots at you. This is such a lazy boss fight to make as some of these zombies have popped up before, and this fight pretty much is just a small spam fest of weak enemies. Even the big guy doesn't pose much of a threat because of how weak he is. The only time these enemies will be a threat is if you are relying on a thrust only weapon, or get hit by all spells at once. The only time I've died to this boss is because I got comboed by a dark spell and two lightning bolts at once. It'd be so much fun if there was like a secret way through here where you could like drop attack one of them. Oh man, I'm asking for too much out of this game. This game didn't know what the hell it was doing in the first place. Let alone after a re-release. Let alone after a re-release! Can you believe that? Well, shit. That was the quickest I've died in a boss fight. Wow. Weapons like the rapier and a few other thrust weapons have immense trouble hitting the enemies on the floor because they only have thrust attacks and the focus system is so broken in this game that you'll be hitting just above them over and over again. This boss is simply a roadblock boss fight, meant to slow you down and add to the ever-growing list of boss fights for this game. This boss fight was made for marketing. Think about that for a second. What's even worse is that you get a Titanite slab after defeating them. Why would you give the player the highest upgrade item after an extremely weak boss? That makes no sense. You're essentially rewarding the player for doing something easy. Now, some people might say that since this boss fight doesn't give a boss soul, that the slab is alright. I beg to differ for many reasons that I'll talk about later. Once I return from leveling up, I'll head back slightly to find the area where you can meet Pate and Crate in fighting, if you've done their questline properly, and help one of them out, or kill both of them if they just make you angry. After the fight, you'll come to an area that can be hard to deal with as there are a lot of enemies and the area requires looping around several times to get to everything. But once you make it down far enough, you'll come to an area with some basilisks without the big eyes, not sure why this changes so much in the game, and an area afterwards with a red phantom. The minor red phantom hits decently hard, but is very susceptible to poison, so come prepared with Gavlan's goodies. After that fight, you can hit a door a few times to open up a house that was filled with sand, a neat touch that I wish they did more with. Here you'll find a locked door that requires a key after defeating Freya to open. I personally never open it, as by the time I get to this pathway, I'm already at Dreng Lake Castle, and I just want to get through this area as fast as possible. After exploring a little bit more, you will meet Ornifex again, this time at her home. Here she will tell you that she is a smith of sorts for unique items, boss items, and that she will craft one thing of your choice for free. She sells a lot of the really big weapons, such as the Crypt Black Sword, the Butcher's Knife, the Iron King Hammer, etc. I can't get anything from her now, and I don't usually get boss weapons when I play this game, so I'll be moving on. As we try to escape this spell spamming area, we'll encounter another spider bush, which is always fun. We'll make it back to the bonfire and begin moving around this area again in order to unlock more of it and to find more items. After dealing with this zipline section, we'll find ourselves in a room with two sorcerers and a ladder leading to the bonfire near Ornifex. After returning from boosting the Rotten, I buy the Crypt Black Sword for free, since I tend to fight the Rotten many times each playthrough. It's a very heavy dark greatsword, so it does a large amount of damage if you have the right build. I don't have the ideal build for it, but it's a nice alternative if I need dark damage. After that, I'll be heading back to Iron Keep to show you something about New Game Plus that annoys me. Once I return to this pathway, I'll be using a bonfire ascetic to respawn the area with the old Iron King. I'll be doing that partially for the boss, but also to show the red phantom that appears in New Game Plus. The area I mentioned before between the ground floor and the bonfire floor houses a red phantom. They all have high health, high damage, and are very mobile. They drastically increase the time spent in an area because of how strong they are. Other areas are much easier to handle with them, as you have more space to work with them, but this is essentially a tiny arena. Despite my best efforts, I die to this one. The fact that it sits at the bottom of the ladder is so annoying to me, as you will either have to go down the ladder and be hit, or jump down and lose a lot of health, even with fall reduction items. 
These phantoms are one of the main reasons I use poison arrows, because it will usually deplete half of their health and I can use it from a safe distance. This is much more abusable in Hades Tower of Flame because of the amount of phantoms and their placement, but here it serves me well at getting sweet revenge. After that and the boss fight, I'll return to the Freya pathway. I make it back to the area with the phantom miner, but now I'll be heading toward the boss. This little area is interesting to me, as they have set up an ambush next to a trap that can help or hinder you depending on your competency and strategy. The area below the bridge will do damage to anything in it, and can be useful for the spam in the room. The spam can also be dealt with by using the door to bottleneck them. This is usually a simpler strategy than using the spiky ground, but the options are there, which is nice. Once the spider bush is dealt with, you'll find another locked door requiring the key after Freya to open it. Again, I don't come back once Freya is dead because I consider this area very annoying. Anyway, you'll find two doors that open by pulley contraptions. Not sure why, but it's whatever at this point. I did just go through some spider caves directly into a church, so it's up in the air for how this world works at this point. Opening one of them gives you some homeward bones, and the other houses an enemy in the final area before the boss. This area is full of webs that slow you down and spiders lying in wait to ambush you. However, they are pretty easy to slap down, and once you know where they are, you can trigger their encounters at will to get rid of them quicker. Before the boss fight, you'll find a phantom on the opposite wall to the fight, Ashen Knight Boyd, yet another random guy that you've never seen, and we'll begin the fight with Freya. This fight is one that is very imposing from the cutscene, but becomes severely underwhelming and even stupid once it begins, and once you've had some time to think about it. First off, did you see how the spiders walked past you to go up to where Freya is, but then started running towards you once she hit the ground? Either the Spider Collective are idiots, or Freya is. Once the fight begins, you'll be spammed by these little spiders, but thankfully Boyd and I deal with them quickly. Once the fight begins, you'll be spammed by these little spiders, but thankfully Boyd and I deal with them easily. They are only there to stunlock you while the boss hammers you. Remember Kaffir Demon? This fight is a very annoying one for many reasons, but the first one I want to talk about is how you damage her. Freya can only take damage if you hit one of her two heads. I don't know why a spider would have two heads, but whatever. You can tell I'm giving up on finding any reasonable excuse for what's going on in the game. These two hitboxes mean that you will have to run from head to head or dodge around one head in order to kill the boss. This can be very underwhelming, very repetitive, and even stupid when you end up chopping off one of her heads. If one head takes enough damage, it will fall off. This could have been cool, as you essentially neutralize one side of her. The problem is that sometimes you may never notice this. If they made it where each head held half of her HP, then I could see it working better, but if you just slash away at whatever head is available at the time, you're probably going to miss this. It also would have worked more in a realistic setting, as she has two heads, so chopping off one wouldn't be enough to kill her. Both coming off would have been a great opportunity for the developers to make the fight change once one head was gone. Maybe have a second phase where she attempts to protect the second head with a different moveset that makes sense, since she was attacking at first, but now she's defending, but nope. We just get the same fight the whole time, with more spiders added for a little while. Let's not even delve into the spider laser beam. Who designed a spider to have a laser beam attack? Why would she be able to do that? I know she's supposed to be Seath Reborn, but a spider probably shouldn't be able to do that. Add that if every dragon could change form, then why did so many disappear from extinction instead of transforming and plotting a return once the gods were weakened? I won't open that can of worms anymore, but think about how this little dragon-turned-spider affects the stories of all three Dark Souls games. They ruined the dragons. Just saying. After the fight is over, I get Freya's soul, which looks like a normal soul and doesn't give a crazy amount of souls. This is odd if she is supposed to be the reincarnation of Seath, as shouldn't she have an Old One-style soul? Shouldn't she have even more reason to have a soul like that? Another thing that bothers me is how you embrace the Great Soul after the fight by walking up to a red glow and interacting with it. Shouldn't we just get it by killing Freya like all the other Old Ones? This is jumping all over the place, and I don't know how people gave this higher scores than Dark Souls 1 and 3. I honestly don't get the praise when by now you should be able to tell that this is at least worse than Dark Souls 1. Rant aside, after the fight I'll murder this dude in a small library of sorts and he drops the Brightstone key. 
This key is for all of the locked doors of this zone, so have at them if you want. After him, I'll fight Vengarl's body. Don't ask how his body made it here without eyes to see the cliffs, or the enemies, or the giant spider nearby. Just don't. It'll hurt your brain. This fight would be intimidating if I hadn't gotten a massive weapon that can stunlock him to death. Let's not forget that he will somehow reattach his head to his body, and his body will shrink later on, so prepare for that nonsense. Once I defeat him, I now have the entire Vengarl set, which I consider to be the toughest light armor in the game, as it has very high defense compared to its weight. I'll still be using the Jester set, but Vengarl set is a pretty good alternative. Once I interact with the Primal Bonfire, I'll be blasted back and greeted by Aldia, Scholar of the First Sin. This will happen at whatever Primal Bonfire you interact with last. Aldia is essentially the final boss of the game, if done correctly. It tells you that there are two paths to this world, inherit the order of the world, or destroy it. He then gives you the objective to seek Vendrick, and mentions that Vendrick will guide our way. Aldia then hints that you will meet again, and disappears into the earth. Aldia wasn't in the original release of Dark Souls 2, but I will talk about that when we reach the ending of the game. But for now, I've completed all pathways, so I can now head straight for Drangleic Castle. But not before I show you this post-progress event. If you return to Freya's boss arena after getting the Ashen Mist Heart, you can interact with this crystal to enter a dragon memory. Here, you will be teleported to what appears to be something similar to the world before Gwyn fought the dragons in Dark Souls 1's opening cinematic. Here, you will find what appears to be a dead ancient dragon. This has drawn some speculation about what dragon this one specifically is, or if it is any special dragon at all. It drops the ancient dragon soul when you interact with it, so I would assume that this is the real ancient dragon and the one later on is an imposter, since that dragon gives a giant soul instead which doesn't make sense for a dragon to have unless it isn't a real dragon. This makes sense to me, as the soul from this dead dragon speaks relatively clearly about what the ancient dragon is doing when you meet it later. This dragon dropping a soul, however, is one weird thing about the Souls games, as Dark Souls 1's dragons didn't give their own souls when defeated. Seath gave a piece of Gwyn's soul, and Calamit didn't give any soul at all. Dark Souls 2 and 3's dragons do give souls, so it's another cross-game inconsistency. Thanks, Dark Souls 2. You started this. Stop hurting my brain, please. Once I make it back to the castle, I'll enter this room I mentioned earlier. Now, Scholar of the First Sin drastically changes the layout of the enemies in this room. Scholar has them lined up in rows across the whole room, while the base game has a pair of them at each door. That is challenging in itself, when you realize that the doors open with souls that bring a Ruin Sentinel into the fight five out of six times. These stone enemies are an oddity in the game to me as well, as they are the only enemies in the game that continuously respawn. Half of them despawn permanently, but three remain on each side. Most enemies in Dark Souls 2 will despawn after around 10 deaths, a strange decision given that every other game in the series has 99% of all enemies respawn infinitely. These enemies also have a chance of dropping a Titanite slab. I don't understand why the developers keep doing this. Another aspect of this area that I find extremely annoying is that there will be two red phantoms at the doorway down the stairs from the bonfire on New Game Plus onwards. One is an archer with a great bow, and the other is a slashy boy. They are incredibly annoying together, as they both complement each other and have high health and damage. They can be incredibly frustrating to kill, as you are often in a tight space with them and have one of them slashing at you while the other tries to shoot an arrow the size of a person through your face. The Red Phantoms change things up in New Game Plus, but more often than not, it will be for the worst. Another annoying aspect of this area is how quickly you can screw yourself over if you aren't paying attention to the environment. I recommend trying to deal with everyone here in a single encounter, as subsequent encounters will only add more enemies to the fray, resulting in a spam of several long stunlock combos and enemies that hit hard. After I clear the area, there is a section of floor that breaks, bringing you to the final encounter with the Dark Pilgrim Covenant and Legs. You can also get the Faram set on a skeleton here, this set being the one used in several trailers for the game. There is also a bonfire here, so don't worry about having to deal with the spam every time you want to come back. I will come back to this area later to fight Dark Lurker. Once I return to the bonfire before the spam, I'll run quickly off to the closest right door as it leads further into the castle. As you can see, only one stone guard remains, and you'll only have to deal with him and one ruined sentinel in order to proceed. 
Slightly up the path, you'll find a metal remake of a turtle knife for some reason, and I have no idea why it's here. Maybe Nishandra has a thing for turtles. One thing I found odd about this castle is how many different rooms and encounters there were. In a short walk, you're able to see a poison dart room, a destructible pool of liquid, several open spaces that can easily lead to a lethal fall, and a painting that curses you if you are close to it. This is something that really bothers me about this castle versus An Orlando. The route you take to An Orlando Castle, specifically towards the sniper section and the bonfire afterwards, has areas that are clearly not made for travel in mind, but still work given the architectural style of the castle. You make it into the castle by way of the architecture, not a given path that wouldn't make sense in a real castle. An Orlando and the path you take to enter it both make sense for the most part, although I don't know why there would be two knights chilling on the edge of the place. Given that, Drain Lake Castle seems to have several areas that don't make sense from an architectural or castle design viewpoint. However, they do make sense from a game design perspective, since the game clearly wants to kill you so they stuck a room in to poison you, an area in to break all your gear, several areas where you can fall to your death, and added a painting that can curse you. This is, once again, a meme of difficulty turned into an actual level. As you progress through here, you'll be attacked by a bunch of archers with the Pit of Destruction below. There is a secret bonfire here, which is quite good considering that I am near a boss, albeit a bad boss. Further up the path, you'll see the Queen sitting on a throne in some sort of isolated throne platform. Don't ask why. She will tell you her name, Nashandra, and will spout off about Vendrick cursing the undead and finding more strength to face them. Then she tells you to visit Vendrick and that they don't need two rulers. It's very obvious from this that she intends for you to kill Vendrick, or that she wants both of you dead, as you are essentially a threat to her rule. One thing I think they missed out on was allowing us to shoot her here. Nothing happens when you do. No comments, no cutscene, no change in health, no repercussions for shooting her. You just waste some arrows. Amazing chest, she is not. After talking to the Invincible Queen, I'll come upon everyone's favorite repeat, the Twin Dragon Riders. This fight is a bit of a joke, especially once you have a heavy hitting attack and know how to abuse the system. This fight is over in seconds on my glass cannon because the Black Dragon Rider has a pathetic amount of health, and his friend is barely better. They don't even drop two Dragon Rider souls, so I guess the developers knew how weak the Black one was, and how useless this encounter was besides souls and adding to the boss list. After leveling up and returning, I run into an area that really shows how weirdly designed this place is, both sensibly and in game terms. You have to climb a ladder in order to drop down into a room you can't escape from, so you can kill a bunch of stone dudes, so one of them will fuel the giant to lower the elevator down next to the ladder, so you can use it to go up to get the key from the top of the elevator shaft to get to the boss fight just past the elevator on the ground floor, but you have to loop around and go through an area full of enemies just to get back to the bonfire before the ladder and the elevator area. Does it sound as convoluted to you too? Anyway, going through this path will eventually lead us into a room with six big Alon knights. Don't know why they are here. Two Dwemer dudes and another elephant. Poison arrows are painfully overpowered in this encounter, as you can see since I can tag an enemy with poison and move on to the next one. Once all the big guys are tagged, I simply wait until they are dead. These Dwemer dudes ruin this plan, however, by having their shield up constantly, and by not playing by the same poison rules as the player, given that I spammed one with arrows and it didn't do anything to him. After that, I'll go up where the archers were to open two chests, one being a trap and the other giving us Firestorm. Thankfully, the trap was poison, so life gems galore. And after that, I run outside to find another elephant and more archers. The room they are on top of is the way back to the bonfire that houses an Estus shard. I just love how this area is ridiculous going forward, but even more ridiculous coming back through the spam, as the archers are meant to attack you if you try to go backwards. If you go backwards first, you won't be able to open the door, and you'll now be attacked by Dwemer Ripoff and three Elan archers. After finishing this trial of confusion, I go up the elevator to find a room with a cage in it and some chests. On New Game Plus, there is a phantom here, but thankfully poison is plentiful and OP by that point. The first chest gives you the key to King's Passage, so you can fight the Looking Glass Knight. The other chests give you a soul vessel, a fire seed, and strong magic shield. After looting everything for now, I say goodbye to the woman trapped behind the gimp door. You pick up an item later on to open it up, 
but you get a ring as a reward that isn't very useful, so I usually ignore this and just continue on. After going back to Majula to talk to Ben Hart of Hugo, the lowdown is that he thanks you for clearing the path and says he will aid you later, I return to the bonfire before the boss run to the Looking Glass Knight. Here he will tell of his journey to master his swordsmanship, and how his sword is a family heirloom. He then gets caught in a loop talking about how Dark Souls 2 is messed up and everything is overrun by terrible beasts. After talking to him, I open the door near the elevator to find King's Passage, an area that can annoy many as the enemies here are able to ambush you, but given you know what to do, you can get rid of the stone statue spam before facing Dwemer Boy. If you destroy the heads of the statues before their eyes turn red, they won't activate and attack you. A nice subtle thing, but it doesn't change the fact that they will most likely spam bush you and kill you on your first run through here. After they are dealt with, it's time to fight the Looking Glass Knight, a boss that is a very mixed bag. This fight has a few issues that include his shield's hitbox being massive, as you can see when I am slightly to the right of him when my weapon hits him from the front. He won't take a hit, and it's registered as if I hit his shield. His shield has an interesting effect on casters, as he can repel spells back at you. This fight also has a very annoying interaction where the Looking Glass Knight will summon a phantom or another player to aid him in the fight. This phantom not only increases the difficulty of the fight, but has opportunities to heal the boss. This can be very annoying and frustrating since the PvP in these games has always had some sort of issue, whether it be internet connection differences or cheap tactics. Thankfully, I was able to kill him here just as he was summoning a phantom, so I don't have to worry about him anymore. One thing I do want to know is why his shield and others like it with mirrors can summon and trap people in them. You'll see the latter part of that statement later on. I don't understand how that works. This fight could have had an interesting encounter by doing something like what happens with Wolnir in Dark Souls 3, where you interact with an item and then get sucked into the boss arena. This boss has the perfect aesthetic for that, but sadly, they were too lazy to implement that in this game. Thankfully, Wolnir got it in the sequel, so think about that when comparing the Dark Souls 2 team to the Dark Souls 1 and 3 teams. After the fight, you'll find a chest with three bonfire aesthetics, Soul Bolt, and the Spell Quartz Ring plus 2 in it. You can tell how many Rottens are about to be killed. I'll also read the Looking Glass Knight's soul description, which mentions that the King's Passage was a route taken by the bravest warriors to prove themselves, but now it only prevents one from pursuing the runaway king. I'm not quite sure why this passage would help prove warriors, since it's just a hallway with a few enemies in it and the boss itself. I'm not sure why they would prove that in the passage, but fighting the boss would make some sense given what we know about Vendrick as something of a conqueror. This might be the lore actually working right for this, but at the same time, I can't shake the feeling that this is designed to be vague enough to give the idea out without actually being specific enough to be an objective truth. It's a statement that could work, but we aren't sure enough to make sure it does work. After all that mess, you have a long elevator ride down to an area that frustrates many, the Shrine of Amana. The elevator down takes its sweet time, clocking in at 30 seconds of pure elevator wall. After it, you'll find a strange, overgrown doorway heading to Shrine of Amana. Not sure why this is, or even if the shrine is a hidden section of the kingdom, but I'll talk about that when we actually go through the Shrine of Amana shortly. After returning to Majula, I'll return to our map-making friend in the room with the flames on the floor. This means you've completed some parts of the game. Kale feels comforted by the flame on the maps, which makes me wonder if he's okay. But who am I to judge as a headstrong zombie jester? I returned to Drenglaic Castle for a bit to test a theory. I used one of the bonfire ascetics on the bonfire before the Looking Glass Knight, you know, to try to get three ascetics per one for boosting, and the developers recognized that some players would do that here, and kept the chest as a single open per playthrough. I'm both glad and annoyed by this, since I died to the knight before getting here. Once I enter Shrine of Amana proper, you'll notice that this area is very reminiscent of Ash Lake in Dark Souls 1 although it's longer and doesn't make physical sense to exist. Much like Ash Lake, even though you can see Ash Lake from the Tomb of the Giants. Seriously, we went down an elevator for maybe 30 meters or so after being near the top of a mountain, to then being in an area covered by trees and surrounded by deep pits of water. I don't understand this world. I really don't anymore. Or maybe it doesn't understand itself. Anyway, Shrine of Amana has had a very divided reception, with some people saying it's the hardest area in the game, or that it's a cakewalk. When you think about it, both sides can be right given how certain builds will be able to combat this area better than others. 
The best option for this area involves a single word. Range. Any ranged weapon will help, but a bow will work wonders here, as the only advantage the casters have in this area is that they can track you from so far away. If you have a bow and enough arrows, you'll be able to clear them out in no time, as you'll see later. One thing about this area that will become apparent is the amount of enemies lying in wait to ambush you and gank your sweet hollow booty to death. This area has a lot of sections where spam becomes apparent, but sometimes the spam simply won't activate, like these enemies in the water. They're barely visible and all angled toward the walkway, but they don't activate until you get near them or the Milfonito nearby stops singing. This is something that convinces me that the spam in this area was designed to work if the player is in a specific position. If they are not, the enemies aren't sure what to do until you run up to them. This is one thing that I think feeds into the dichotomy of this area being easy or hard. Not only will your build change it, but also the path you take. In this building, I'll meet a Milfonito. These women sit around and sing throughout the level. Apparently these milfs, eh, eh, are supposed to sing here forever and never leave, even though one of them is trapped in Drang Lake Castle. Don't question, just accept. They talk about the little ones dancing when they sing, and I'm not sure what they are referring to by this. They mention that the little ones bring comfort to those who bear death and the dark. It makes me think of humanity, as we've seen it be a comforting thing before, but even the wiki doesn't know for sure. They do speculate about the little ones being the enemies hiding in the water, since they are docile for the most part. But then again, they aren't exactly little now, are they? You'll also find out later that the Milfonito were taught song by the great dead one, our boy Nito. One comment on the wiki had me rolling when it just said Milfonito, Milf and Nito. Rave Lord Nito. Fantastic world building right there. Also, whoever decided to make the word Milfonito literally have the name of the boss they learned singing from, have you heard of the word subtlety? Moving on, I'll make my way to another ambush that can be very annoying. There are three white guys near an open area with several tongue dudes lying in the water. If you're lucky, or experienced, you'll be able to aggro one instead of all three white dudes. After them is a room with more docile tongues between you and a chest, and you'll eventually reach the next bonfire. This is where the fun begins. What I mean is that the casters are now an opponent, and they have, no hyperbole, cheated. They are able to attack you from distance, which is fine, and with spells that track you, which is also fine, but they can do it from very far away. This is straight cheating on the AI's part. They can fire on you from extremely long distances. We're talking almost football field lengths, and have no casting limit. This means that they will be spamming their spells at you over and over from miles away until they are dead. Or you. Whoever designed this clearly hated players, as this is something that the other games wouldn't do, out of respect for the players. If it was just the casters, it could have been just bad. With the spam in the area added to them, on top of nearly invisible drop-offs in the ground, you now have one of the worst areas in the Souls series. If an ambush doesn't kill you, the map will. If the map doesn't kill you, the casters will. If the casters don't kill you, then the bugs will destroy your gear, as you'll see shortly. This area is a massively underwhelming and disappointing area. We've not had many aquatic-themed areas before, with New Londo Ruins and Ash Lake being the only ones we've had that did anything with the water in mind. We could have had encounters with more aquatic enemies, but instead we're just in Hades Tower of Water. Seriously, think about it. It's just some ruins with drop-offs into Waters of Death, just like Hades Tower, only this time it's harder. One thing you'll also notice about this area is how the tongue enemies don't have that firefly effect around them, which means they'll be more aggressive. This is tied to the Milfonito in this area. Later, you'll come to a building with a caster, several tongues, and an ogre keeping watch. The ogre would be intimidating here, but he has a serious aggro problem that prevents him from reaching me. I don't know why he's a special needs ogre, so I'll leave him be. Down a nearby pathway, mind you a tight pathway surrounded by death, you'll find another Estus shard. At least it was worth it for all the players who fall off because of spells and bad controls, right? Right? Anyway, one thing about this area that I like is how there is a summon for Felicia the Brave in this building. This could have been an improvement to the previous games, where summon signs would only be found near a boss. They could have done more with this, however, so it's no amazing change since this only appears three more times in the game, all of which are in the DLC. They could have improved the idea of other NPC heroes joining us in our quest, 
as all the other games make it where the summons appear near a boss fog wall. It would have been such an interesting experience to have an NPC you liked journey through the world with you, not just appear and disappear at certain bosses. Just imagine if they had that idea and executed it well with Solaire in Dark Souls 1. The attachment to that jolly boy would go even further through the roof. I'd like to think the same would happen with any other NPC. They could all have their own storylines, their own experiences with the player based on if they died during a journey or were summoned at all. It would add so much replayability to each area, and every new game if you had the option to have a companion join you. Yes, it might sacrifice difficulty, but it would give some form of character development and player attachment to those characters. You could see the summon playthrough as the character development run, and without them, the difficulty run. The plebs could be satisfied with an effective easy mode, while purists can ignore the summons and treat the game as some people treat it now. It's a win-win. Options for everyone. Or they could balance the summon mode to account for the extra person. But sadly, they only add this NPC here to help us, and more often than not, she'll die before even coming close to the boss. It was a nice thought, though, till you realize that there is a bonfire between the summon and the boss, making it a difficult choice if you want to continue with a bonfire refreshment or sacrifice the summon to progress the area. Yes, I know you could just backtrack and summon Felicia, but do you really want to go through this spam again? Anyway, you'll see me using the age-old poison arrow strategy to take out the casters from afar, as getting near them will trigger spam. After they are dealt with, we'll head through the next fog wall to find an area filled with equipment-destroying bugs. In my opinion, Dark Souls 2 uses the destructible item gimmick too much. The pots in the gutter, the liquids in Drang Lake Castle, the bugs here, etc. They put them in the way so often that it becomes less of a challenge and more of an extension of playtime. It'll either break your gear, resulting in you returning to a blacksmith to repair them, or you take all your gear off to roll through it, or punch your way to peace of mind. If the items worn were much tougher, like in Dark Souls 1 and 3, it could have worked better, but I'll talk about the weapon durability later. I usually use Felicia here to kill the bugs, as the small ones are a bit annoying and the large one is just a straight troll blocking the way forward, as well as being right next to a bonfire. Once they're cleared, we'll begin slowly picking off the casters before the boss of the area. This area in particular can be a pain, as there are several enemies, both casters and tongue bros, on a confined platform. Not to mention a phantom as well. Not just any phantom either, a caster phantom, which as most Dark Souls 2 players know, the NPC casters are the literal spawn of Satan. Luckily, the summon confuses Kindler here, so I managed to defeat him relatively quickly and painlessly. Now I get to another MILF, an ugly one if I do say so, who disappears after you interact with her. Now we're at the boss. The Demon of Song is a boss that I dislike and find quite stupid with its gimmick. That gimmick being that it won't take damage unless you hit its face. Only its face. Why on earth is this a thing? Like the Freya fight, they cop out and force you to attack one particular spot of the boss when attacking it anywhere else should absolutely do some amount of damage to it. Like what I said with Freya, either reduce damage everywhere but the head, or increase damage dealt when striking the head. This game apes a lot of ideas from Demon Souls, but can't bother to reference the way those bosses worked. The Tower Knight is a great example of this idea being used well. After defeating the Frog of Song, you'll get the key to the Embedded, basically unlocking the Gimp door holding the other MILF hostage in Drangleic Castle. You'll also find a bonfire afterwards and a door you can't enter unless you're hollow. This leads to a place that really irks me. Regrettably, I forgot to actually go through the door for this commentary during my initial recordings, so I had to go back and record it. My apologies. I find this area pretty much useless for a very specific reason, so that's the excuse I'll run with, but let's set up how it works first. This area has an Aldia Warlock and a few crawling enemies before you meet another MILF. In case you were wondering, yes, these are the crawling enemies and the big dude from the congregation fight. Which came first? Don't know. Is it cheap to repeat them either way? Yes. This MILF pretty much spills the beans on who and what they are. They were taught song by Nito, and they sing for the dead and those with the dark, etc. She also mentions that the little ones were born from the great dead one, which confuses me, as the wiki speculated it was the Tongue Dudes, and I speculated it was humanity, but Nito can't produce either of those, so now we have no idea what the little ones actually are. They may mean skeletons or undead in general, but saying that all dead things were born as a result of Nito is just a bit ridiculous, so I'll leave it up to what you find while playing. 
The main thing that irks me about this shrine is that it is designed to restore your humanity for free if you have absolutely no human effigies left. Mechanically, this is okay, as some people might run out, but narratively, this is a bit ridiculous. Imagine if you just had to pray to a shrine to gain humanity back in Dark Souls 1. It'd be spammed all day, every day, once a player died. They could simply bank their humanity into bonfires, then spam the shrine. But getting back to Dark Souls 2, the requirement is a bit extreme. You have to possess no effigies, not a single one, either in your item box, or inventory, or even dropped on the ground. You have to be completely out of them for the shrine to work. I don't know why this is in the game, but I also have no idea why this is put so far into the game. If anything, you'll die more during the opening bits of the game than the later bits because of your lack of gear, lack of understanding the mechanics, lack of ADP, and that you haven't honed your build yet. In contrast, the end of Shrine of Amana is very close to the end of the game. After the shrine, you'll go to Undead Crypt, then Aldia's Keep, then the Dragonary, then the Dragon Shrine, then the Memory of the Giants, then the Throne of Want, where you will reach the credits. This means that you will gain access to the shrine after completing 75% of the game, not even counting the DLCs, which can drag on for quite a while. I don't completely hate the idea of a shrine that restores humanity, as it can help those struggling, but it's placed at such a point that it may be better to ignore the shrine since by this point, you may have 20 effigies on you just from PvE, let alone PvP or enemy farming. This is just here for the plebs who couldn't finish the game given the systems in place, and it'll only work for players who are at the end of the rope. It literally won't work for anybody else, because everyone else will have to completely rid themselves of effigies. It makes me wonder if all the areas in the game were planned with mechanical purpose, or if random people were asked to create areas and then added random elements to those areas to make them unique. It confuses me greatly. Not to mention how much this affects the whole difficulty meme that this game struggles to stay consistent on. But with that out of the way, I'm finished with Shrine of Amana. Thank Gwyn, it's over. Heading back to the Cathedral of Blue for a moment, you'll notice how I want to fight Ornstein 2.0 again. But in order to do that, you have to use a bonfire ascetic at the bonfire after him. But once that is done, you can't enter his fog gate from behind. So you have to warp back to another bonfire in Hades Tower and run all the way up to the boss again. This is something that I think really becomes a pain in certain areas because the requirements to redo a boss often end up requiring you to essentially replay the level again just to get to the boss. You've seen many more examples of this throughout the game. This doesn't add anything to the playthrough, but I included it since Ornstein is a fan favorite and I know some people might have some trouble trying to get into the boss arena from behind. This is more of an FYI for the players that want to fight him. Before you get into the Undead Crypt, you'll have to go down yet another 30 second elevator ride and once you reach the bottom, you'll run into everyone's favorite blob, Aldia. Here, Aldia will continue to bug you about being a true monarch and how people chase concepts like life and love and how the Lord of Light banished Dark once and men assumed a fleeting form and blah blah blah. Aldia clearly wants you to abandon the fire as he constantly questions the validity of the lie of linking the fire and how all this will play out again if you do link it, much like the other Dark Souls games. Again, subtlety is an issue. Once I enter the area, I'll find a few undead with one wielding a torch. I'll also run into a room with dark, miracle, magic casters that can be quite the nuisance in groups. After defeating them, I'll run into a room where we will meet an NPC who demands we not produce light. This place is unwelcome to light, and those who bear it, for some reason. Not sure why he hates the light. Might be a Twilight fan. His name is Agdane, and he guards the crypt. He mentions that the graves are cradled by the comfort of dark, and that light agitates, which is weird, since an undead was literally holding a torch not two minutes ago. I can't tell if that was just a rebellious undead, or if Agdane just won't do his job. Or his speech is stupid and trying to sound Souls-like when it just comes off as an emo Souls fan. Think about his lines with the most stereotypical goth accent, and I think you'll see what I'm getting at. He mentions that he is Finito, who weaves death and watches over the dead. I guess he's the main stud for the MILFs? This was given to him by the one who gave them first death. If that's Nito, where was this guy in Dark Souls 1? Don't question, just accept. He then drones on about all the basic stuff we know death does, like how we all die, whether rich, poor, wise, dull, etc. He actually gives you some useful information by telling us that Vendrick is further in the crypt. 
Then he goes back into blabbing about the lie Aldia mentioned and how the King of Light feared humanity would usher in an age of dark, and so on. It's really just pounding the idea to not link the fire into your head. He does say that the crypt is welcome to all provided due reverence is shown. One question, is due reverence getting murdered? Seriously, if this place is welcoming, why do you have guys at the door set to murder you as soon as you walk in? Seems like more of a trap than anything else. If he's talking about being dead, I'm not actually dead. Hollow, yes, but not dead. So am I unwelcome? Can I even really become dead? Who knows? Once his dialogue is exhausted, you can see that he sells a stamina shield as well as a ring of thorns and several spells. I'll buy the shield here as it is a good secondary while flailing my Ultra Greatsword around. I'll continue now to roam around finding Dwemer guards, zombies, chests, and several tight walkways making it hard to deal with the Dwemer guys, whose guard is near impossible to break. Eventually I'll reach a fog wall and it's the second bonfire of the area. But before I go in, I'll be dropping down to go around and pick up a few items. This will lead you directly to the second bonfire, and then you'll have to trek through a series of graves that have zombies spawn endlessly, with hooded floaters spawning from the large gravestones. This will become much worse later. After exploring a bit, I'll be invaded in a room with ghosts attacking you from the wall. Unlike New Londo ghosts, you don't need to be cursed to kill them, because consistency is the enemy in this game. I smack the usurper down easily because greatsword OP, and I'll make my way to an annoying and utterly retarded encounter before yet another annoying and utterly retarded encounter after that. The first encounter involves you getting past these two huge shield dudes while being ambushed along the walls from the ghosts. The ghosts aren't really a problem, but these two dudes sitting there with their massive pathway blocking shields becomes very annoying to get through, especially when they start coming at you. They're just big enough to make it extremely difficult to get past, provided they haven't already stunlock comboed you to death. I recommend a very hard-hitting weapon or spell to knock them down quickly, or get past them, as they can't chase you past the doorway they are blocking. Also, do they just sit there with their shields up all day? Wow, what a life. The second encounter is the spam encounter. If you allow an undead to ring a bell nearby, you'll have to deal with a massive amount of hooded enemies in a tight space that can cast spells, stunlock you, and respawn over and over. Whoever designed this needs to burn in a very special fire in a very special place. Please stop spam-bushing me. Thankfully, once this area is dealt with, you'll unlock a shortcut from the second bonfire toward the bosses of this area that completely negates the long walk down hallways and crypts full of horrible spam and ambushes. At least that's what you're led to believe. Now I begin the final march towards the two bosses of this area. This march is another spam-bush where this undead under the stairs will ring another bell causing four hooded dudes to spam attack you again while dealing with up to seven Dwemer dudes. Why? Why? Because you suck, and you need to die. That's why. I'm aware of it now, so I can knock him down quickly, but the hitbox for the bell is weird, so be warned. On this run, I fail to reach the boss, as the last two enemies learn to block, so I have to make this terrible run again. Once I've cleared the room and summoned Edgelord Agdane, we'll fight Velstat. There's not much to say about this fight, other than dude in armor number 97. Seriously, it's really just another dude with a few swing combos and a bit of dark added for flair. The lore for Velstat is probably the strongest aspect to this boss, as he is the defender of the king. His soul will tell you that after killing him, and mentions that he was always at his king's side, right up to the bitter end. After you defeat Velstat, you will meet King Vendrick, finally in his hollowed and passive state. Vendrick is one of those bosses that makes me hate the game because of how he fights, but I'll get to that when I actually fight him, since fighting him now would take forever. You don't have to fight him to complete the game, but you do have to kill him in order to fight Aldia at the end of the game. Before I get there, I'll loot the King's Ring. This allows us to open several doors around the world that let us explore the last few areas before reaching the Throne of Want. When you turn around, you'll find Old Greenhood has been stalking you through the crypt and she'll tell you that the King's Ring is the symbol of the King, and that it opens the King's Gate. It should be King's Gates, plural, as there are three of them, and you need to do all three to finish the game. So I'm wondering if this Emerald Herald is stupid, or just making things up on the spot to sound mysterious. Or a scripting error. Or a voiceover error. Take your pick. She then says that if you want to be the next monarch, you'll walk these grounds without really knowing why. 
I don't think this game understands the difference between subtlety and vagueness. Seriously, it's either up your nose with how direct it is, or they give you next to no detail to figure things out. It's just confusing. Anyway, I'm done with the Undead Crypt for now, so let's leave this spam grave. I'll be making my way back to Shaded Woods for this next bit, because the pathway directly behind the bonfire leads to a King's Gate door. This one leads to Aldia's Keep. Here you can see how dumb the King's Ring is, as you have to equip it to open the doors, instead of the doors just telling if you have the ring on you or not. Again, arbitrary playtime. Seriously, what's the difference of it being in your pocket versus on your finger? Anyway, now I've arrived at Aldia's Keep. As soon as you enter the area, be aware of these tiny petrify monkeys. These guys can spam you quickly and petrify you if you aren't careful. Just after them is another mimic, and then the first bonfire is outside in a small shed. Here you will find Lucatiel in her final NPC appearance. Here she will be resting, and her hollowing is reaching its peak. She is forgetting who she is, who you are, why you both came to Drang Lake, and she will give you her set after speaking with her. Here you will reach the end of her questline and get an achievement that you see I didn't have until this commentary because I never knew she was in Black Gulch. The more you know. Her final lines have her ask you to remember her name, which we will kind of do, mainly due to Aleum Lois as she doesn't appear again until that DLC. Which is, again, really odd how she's hollowing, but she appears later on. Once you enter the keep, you'll be invaded by Lucatil's brother, Aslatil, revealing that he disappeared to Drangleic and has most likely gone hollow. This could have been a climactic moment if you found Lucatil next to her brother's body, like with the two onions in Dark Souls 1. Or they could have had her fighting her brother, like with Creighton and Pate earlier. She ends up right next to him anyway, so why not? They could have done something interesting with Dark Souls 2's Slayer, but they didn't bother. There's no resolution or arc for her character. Her story just stops. It doesn't end, it just stops. It's almost like they cut something from the game, or were too lazy to actually have something happen to her. Anyway, once the Phantom is dealt with, you'll encounter a giant dragon skeleton falling on you, and most likely killing you in the process. This is quite possibly the cheapest death you can have in the game, but it's hard won. After that, you'll find the Nobody Pull This Lever, which unlocks the guy hiding in the opposite side as a vendor, which I usually go to for bonfire aesthetics as he sells 10 of them, and as was established earlier, each one gives us roughly 300,000 souls per rotten kill. Such a generous mound of flesh the rotten is. Anyway, this is Nablan, a man that has a split personality based on if you are hollow or not. Again, these NPCs are for the player, not the world. He gives you a quest to assassinate several NPCs if you talk to him through the barrier, or he will invade you a few times if you open it with the lever. Either way, you get bonfire aesthetics, but I prefer ignoring his quest and just coming for the goods, as most of the encounters with this phantom are troublesome, but manageable. And his quest has you kill Bearer Seek Seek Lest. What would we do with our rotten souls then? Once I'm done with him, I'll move up the stairs into an area full of mirrors, with phantoms trapped inside. These mirrors mirror <laughs> the Looking Glass Knight's shield. They spawn people from a weird pocket dimension sort of thing. These phantoms don't pose too much of a threat because I hit hard and they have a spawn in time that leaves ample room for a backstab. Afterwards, I'll head up to another large basilisk. This one is also stuck in position and I don't want to use up arrows, so I slap that thing down quickly. While exploring this level, you can find a chest with two more ascetics in it. I get the feeling that since you are on what would be the final stretch of the game, that they added more ascetics in so you could go back and redo what you wanted before the endgame. Regardless, that's still a lot of ascetics. Once I make it to the long corridor of this keep, you'll find several ogres and smaller Aldia acolytes littered about in the side rooms and behind paintings. Hooray! Ogres! One thing that should be noted is a bonfire nearby the destruction cage where you can fall in to be attacked by two flesh dogs while also breaking your gear. This place just gets better and better. After returning to Navland to buy more boss murder tokens, I'll continue down the hallway while exploring the rooms. Eventually you'll come up behind an ogre staring at a door. This is meant to ambush you if you come through the door, dealing a high amount of damage. Since the ogre is mildly disabled, he's no real threat though. Once you reach the next door, you'll go through to find another small door with an ogre trying to ambush you from behind it, again. Now they're even repeating ambush ideas literal meters from the original ambush. This time, Navlan is here, but he doesn't follow you far and the ogres are no match for the mighty poison cheese. 
Neither is Navlan, but since he gave me ascetics, I'll kill him quickly. At the end of the pathway, you'll enter the Guardian Dragon's birdcage. This boss is a very lackluster boss, as it doesn't have much health, and it'll often cling to the walls and breathe fire at you, even though it can't hit you sometimes. If this boss showed up earlier and then reappeared later, like Taurus and Capra Demon, then I could see it working better, but here, right before they repeat it several times, seems like a wasted opportunity. And with that, Aldi's Keep is over. It's just that useless. The next area after Aldi's Keep is the Dragon Airy, and as you will see, there are dozens of in-flight dragons everywhere. Real subtle. It's nice to know that the dragons have been able to replenish themselves over the years, since they were thought to be nearly extinct in the previous game. Anyway, you'll find the Emerald Hood again, and she'll give you some, how do I say it, hopeful suck-up dialogue. She just states how she's waited for a bearer of a curse like you to appear, and shatter the shackles of fate. Whatever that means. I won't get into how people use the term fate wrong so often in art and media, but I'll put it simply. Fate is whatever happens, not what potentially happens. Fate is what happens. Then she says it was her own manifestation that led you here, and I wonder why she says that as this isn't a manifestation, you can kill her here. This isn't a vision, she is literally here. Then she'll say the ancient dragon has watched over the world for aeons past. So he's been chilling for billions of years, but hasn't tried to fix what happened with Drangleic? I figure a billion year old dragon would be able to offer at least a little wisdom to a king that is about to destroy his kingdom. By the way, Aeon, in astronomy, means a unit of time equal to a billion years. Or in geology, it means a major division of geological time, subdivided into eras. If they use Aeon as a billion, then the ancient dragon is too stupid to offer any advice, or doesn't care about the plight of Drangleic anyway, further screwing up why he would bother to help the bearer of the curse. If they use Aeon as an era, then the argument still stands, but over a shorter period of time. If I'm reading into this too much, I apologize for going in-depth in a game from a series where I'm supposed to search for meaning and answers. Anyway, after the speech, she'll give you the aged feather and tell you to go to the ancient dragon and that he welcomes you. I don't think welcome is a good way to put it, as everything leading up to him is trying to kill you. The item she gave you, the aged feather, is used to warp back to bonfires repeatedly, which is a nice replacement for the homeward bones. But the description of it says, The child of the dragon, sequestered away from the world, imagined a world of boundless possibilities from the mere sight of a feather. Uh, how does this deal with talking to the dragon? He doesn't take it from you as an offering, and he doesn't mention it when you talk to him. So I'm at a loss as to why she would give us this now during this conversation. If she already had it, then why didn't she give it earlier? Were we not worthy till now? Is she just trolling us? Who knows? I actually do know, but bear with me. Once I begin moving around the airy, you'll see that they brought back the explodey dudes from the Lost Bastille. There aren't many of them here in the base game, but Scholar spams them heavily, so be warned. Once you reach the first dragon, you'll notice how its fire attack lasts for a very long time, and how it probably should have killed me given how much damage it did, and how long it lasted. You may have also noticed that this is the boss from a little bit earlier. It's not really been altered between the two positions in the cage or up here, except that it won't cling to the cage and breathe fire. This tells me that they either made the boss and then copy-pasted it throughout this area afterwards, since it fit the aesthetic, or the reverse happened, where they thought it would make a good boss when thrown in a cage. If the cage was placed somewhere else, I could have seen this dragon working better, perhaps as something that Dragon Rider would ride during his fight, since his name says he would ride dragons. Maybe something along the lines of the Nameless King's fight, where he will fly around a bit and then come down to attack. Then, once you kill the dragon, you fight Dragon Rider. It would make that fight much more interesting, and it would be a subtle way to show how strong the character has gotten since a part of a boss is now a regular enemy, like with Taurus and Capra. They would have to remove the Guardian Dragon from its cage, but then they could have made a new boss that was good. Or not. Probably not, since they've repeated assets before, and we've seen the quality of bosses they made for this game. Getting back to our boy, you'll notice the high amount of Titanite Lizards roaming around the area. I think this is just meant to boost the character's weapons quickly because we are nearing the finale of the game, with the only things left to do being talk to the dragon, go into the memories of the giants, and then go to the throne of want. You can kill Vendrick as well, but I'll get there. I'll get invaded here by an actual person, which is somewhat refreshing until you see how this devolves into a cat and mouse fight. 
You'll also notice the absurdly ridiculous netcode that makes fighting other players a hassle, since your screen and their screen won't match up, as the lag between you becomes an issue. Luckily, my rotten boosting has aided my sword swinging arm. After that, I'll run into another dragon and chop him down. Then I'll come across a vantage point where we can fire arrows and spells at the next dragon. This is where the level design and enemy AI really contradicts the game's focus on difficulty, since the dragon will just sit there most of the time. It has wings. Use them. Afterwards, I run off of a ledge to pick up some items before being trapped there. So now the purpose for the aged feather is really revealed. It's to prevent players from getting too angry once they realize that several areas in the dragon area are designed to get you stuck, and force you to warp or die in order to walk through the level again. That doesn't sound tedious at all, does it? The saving grace for this is that the dragons don't respawn. But that's it. A little farther down the path, I'll get invaded by Navlan again, and I'll just spam left mouse. That's it. He's dead again. Thankfully, before he started spamming his spells. After Navlan, you'll get this long bridge that forces the player to slow down when walking across. Not sure why. Again, tedium is abundant here. Then, you'll arrive at the actual Dragon Shrine. As soon as you enter the Dragon Shrine, you'll come across a bonfire, and baby Aldia will appear. It looks so cute. It will continue its spill about how peace grants the illusion of life, and love is an illusion until the curse touches their flesh, and so on. It then backtracks slightly by saying that the facade is a world full of warmth and resplendence, and questions if this is so wrong. Then it'll ask if you still want to spoil the falsehood, and I reply yes. It then declares that it is Aldia, and that it sought to shed the yoke of fate, but failed. It then tells you to seek the throne, light, dark, and what lies beyond. Then Aldia disappears. It really is the ultimate don't link the fire advocate, isn't it? Now I'll move up towards the dragon. First, you'll find more large dudes in armor being supplemented by a miracle user spamming explosive orbs at you. I recommend dodging the big guys and going for the caster first, as he can hit you during most of the encounters in this first section of the area, often resulting in heavy health loss or death. Before I head up, I'll jump down to a chest and a mimic, followed by a dude with a huge hammer and a massive shield. These guys in particular are annoying because they hit hard, have strong block and health, and are very hard to get behind. Luckily, Poison is with me. After the big night, I'll find a staircase with a third dragon ring at the bottom, and an invading NPC at the top. He doesn't put up much of a fight. After him, I will find a petrified egg that you can give to Magarold, and then I'll be in a nice position to snipe the knights in front of the door forward. After they're dealt with, I will come to the stairs of Spam. There are two knights with big swords, followed by two dragon warriors, followed by two shield hammer knights, followed by another dragon warrior. If you aren't careful, this will be an area that will kill you a lot. If you are careful, patient, and have ranged attacks, you'll be fine. Once they are all dealt with, you will come to the Ancient Dragon. Here he will telepathically speak to you and talk about how the curse of life is the curse of want. Then he'll tell us to go into the fog for answers, and he'll give us the Ashen Mist Heart. I don't know why we needed all this and why we need to enter the fog, but whatever. You can fight him and get the heart, but I recommend talking to him for the heart before fighting. I'm not going to fight him here because he is easily the cheapest boss in the entire game with how he will kill you. I'm going to skip to the end of the playthrough when I return to kill him once I have the appropriate gear to survive his usually one-hit kill fire breath. As you can see, I have the Gurm Great Shield, which has 100% block to both physical and fire. This shield is what most people use when dealing with his fire attack, because it does an insane amount of damage, as you will see. This fight is usually a long and tedious one as he has almost 20,000 hit points, and his fire attacks usually do almost 1,500 or so per hit. Imagine that. Also, his hitboxes are terrible. What the fuck? I'll return to fight him again, and I managed to kill him this time, mostly because I have a weapon that is infused with lightning and is fully upgraded, on top of a few hundred levels giving me over 2,000 HP and 225 stamina. Even with that and knowledge of his moveset, he still took a staggering 5 minutes to defeat here. He is the cheapest boss in the base game, and the reason I say that is because I haven't even gotten to the DLCs yet. Regardless, I'm done with the Dragon Shrine, for good. Now, we've returned to our old stomping grounds. Here you will be going into the memories of the giants. The giants are the overgrown tree people you saw resting throughout this area. 
The important one is behind the king's door of this area. Thankfully, there was a bonfire after it, because it'd be pretty dumb to have the door close behind you and have no bonfire. As you see, I become completely enamored with this little spastic spinning thing I'm doing. I'm not retarded. I swear. Anyway, once you enter this memory of Jay, you'll run across the boss arena for the pursuer before it fell apart. One thing I don't like about this area is how much environmental damage you can take, on top of there being the boss at the other end of the arena. The fireballs do about half health and damage, and they keep on coming. The boss of this arena, the Giant Lord, is a big lumbering idiot with a massive sword that can insta-kill you in the right situations, but other than that, he's a very weak boss fight with very lackluster movesets. Not to mention that every memory has a vague time limit to how long you can remain in that memory. The Giant Lord's soul mentions how Vendrick took some giants prisoner and brought them to Drang Lake, which probably wasn't a good idea with how large and destructive they are. After you return from the nightmare, you'll be greeted by Navlan invading us for free souls once again. Then he's dealt with. Then I move to the next memory. The first memory is the only one you need in order to complete the game. However, if you want to kill Vendrick without grinding through his 32 multiple defense stats, then continue to get all of the giant souls from the following locations that I will show, except the one from the Ancient Dragon, since I did that out of order. Anyway, once you enter the memory of Vamar, you'll come across Drummond, who will tell you to not involve yourself in this battle. He will forgive your trespass, but tells you to leave immediately, indicating that no man will stop you, but they may not have the will to resist anymore. He then gives some backstory about what happened when the king crossed the seas and pillaged the prize from the giants, leading to their attack on the kingdom. He also mentions that his father and grandfather fought the giants, indicating that this war has been going on for generations. He then describes the giant lord, saying that he is a towering monster and he will be a thing to topple. Towering is right, but a monster... eh... He then goes on about how it won't go down without a fight, and then he gives you the Drangleic Helm again saying these instead of this for some reason. I'm beginning to wonder if it's a translation issue or if they genuinely messed that up more than once. One funny thing I found was how he teaches the hurrah gesture, even though his side is clearly losing. It'd be like legs teaching you a dance gesture. Once he's done for, you'll run through a hallway where a giant will break through the wall, leading toward the giant you need to get a soul from. You'll run into two other giants in the next area, one with poison and the other with a massive club. The room after that holds several club and pyromancy giants fighting with Dranglaic soldiers, and since I'm in a rush, I try to brute force some of them down, but I pay the price. When I return, you can see the issues of this area, as the giants hit for massive amounts, and there are usually several of them to deal with at once. On my third attempt, I climb a nearby ladder to give me an opportunity to deal with the giant pyromancers, who have some terrible hitboxes. The time limit doesn't help things when you can't tell how long you have until you get kicked out of the memory, and have to go through it again. Once you finally make it to the end, you get your soul and get out, because these are some of the worst areas in the game, because you can't even take your time with them. The next giant memory is near the Pursuer Arena, where you'll run into Benhart again. He makes some jokes about fate not letting us stay away from each other, and then gives some history for his sword. He said it was in his family for generations, and that it was crafted by Moonlight. He mentions that no man has teased out the sword's true power, so it's probably just a fancy sword in his hands. He then swears to aid us in our darkest hour. That darkest hour is when you fight four bosses in a row at the end of the game. I know, it sounds stupid. Let's move on. After I'm done with him, I'll enter the memory of Oro and Benhart is here too, for some reason. He doesn't say much besides he's ready to help and that his homeland is in the Far East. Not much to go on or learn from that. It's also weird how Benhar appears to be a time traveler. You'll venture out into a courtyard full of giants and soldiers, and you'll be making your way around to the giant soul. This area has multiple passages to get to the soul, which is a nice change of pace. But since I'm rushed through these areas, I don't have much time to experiment with our approach before getting kicked out. One funny thing I noticed here was when I kill this particular soldier, he gives the demon soul's boletaria soldier death sound. That's interesting for reasons I'll be bringing up later. Right after him is the soul you need, and then you return to the memory a second time to explore more areas where you find a much easier path towards the giant soul you picked up. With that, I'm done with the Forest of Fallen Giants for good. Now I'll be heading back to Black Gulch for the final giant soul I'll be needing to kill Vendrick. 
If you look off the edge near the second bonfire of the area, you'll notice a few platforms that you can drop down to. Be warned, they can lead to death if you haven't gotten used to the movement system. Once you've gone down, you'll find a locked door that we'll come back to, and then further down, we'll find two giants that poison makes quick work of. I say quick, but it's better than trying to fight them in melee combat with terrible hitboxes, high damage and health, and there are two of them to fight. Once they have been killed, you get the giant soul and the forgotten key. This key is used to unlock the door you passed earlier. Hooray for looping! You'll also find a few items down here, among them being the Ring of Giants plus one. When you're done, there is a little elevator that brings you up above the open area before the rotten. I'm not done yet, as I jump down and go through the door that was locked. Here I will run into Legs again for the final time. Once you've interacted with him three times, he will talk to you and give you access to the areas that lead you to Dark Lurker. He will require a human effigy for every time you access the area's pre-Dark Lurker kill. Make sure you have a few on hand, but he also sells a few if you don't have any. You'll notice here that I get an achievement for this since I've never done this before. This will get funnier later on when I fight Dark Lurker. The first thing you'll notice about this area is how you're essentially fighting PvP enemies with ghosts that buff them. This should give you an idea of how annoying the road to fight Dark Lurker can get. Enemies with high health, damage, speed, and long combos can make Dark Lurker one of the hardest bosses to get to. Is it THE hardest boss run? I would say no, because there are two other boss runs that make this look like a walk in the park. Anyway, the main goal of these dark areas is to kill your way to the end while lighting whatever shrine is nearby with a torch. There's nowhere to light your torch if you don't have flame butterflies, but whose fault is that? Anyway, I've finished this area and don't have to return unless I choose to, which can be useful since they drop bonfire ascetics. Now I'll warp out of here and move on to the next Dark Lurker path. The second Dark Lurker pathway I'll be visiting is in Shaded Woods near Najka. Each one of these dark chasms of old can be frustrating, but the third one I'll visit is the worst in my opinion. Here I'll abuse the poison arrows again, because I want to. I consider this particular path to be the easiest of the three, as all the enemies are light hitters, whereas the final path has a Havel ripoff and an absurdly fast rapier boy that I'll deal with. Once I'm done, I'll buy some ascetics and move on. Now I've reached the final stretch before Dark Lurker. This area, as stated earlier, is the hardest in my mind because of the Havel lookalite we fight. High health, massive damage, and accompanied by others, if you aren't careful, can spell doom for you. I pity those without a massive weapon. After Havel 2, I'll fight the buff ghost and then the rapier boy, luckily being able to smack his 2000 plus health pull down quickly. Then I'll smack down the woman before finally facing Dark Lurker. As you can tell, this is my first run against Dark Lurker. Dark Lurker is a boss that I have mixed feelings about. I like some of its attacks, but several of its explosive attacks rub me the wrong way, as they are incredibly hard to dodge. Add that he'll duplicate, and it can be very difficult. Given all that, I'd say it's one of the better made bosses of the game, as the hitboxes are mostly tight, and every attack has some form of weakness to it, so I'd give this boss an overall good rating, especially considering the other bosses of the game. The main drawback to this boss is its boss run and the length of the fight. Having to fight PvP enemies several times in three separate locations seems like a simple padding of content to me as opposed to a challenge. Believe what you will about its run, but I stand by Dark Lurker being a good boss overall, if a bit long-winded. His soul, however, is utterly useless. The Dark Chasm of Old is the remnant of some ancient dissipated being. That's all you get. One sentence. It's literally what Legs was talking about earlier. That's it. Anyway, I'm done with Dark Lurker, so let's move on. Remember all of those bonfire ascetics I just picked up? Remember how many souls the Rotten gives? Remember my insane grinding skills? Behold, one hour of Rotten farming. Edited, of course.
nearly 8 million souls, and 37 levels. Thank you, Rotten. You're the best. Now you've arrived at the end game. And it's right. Here, you will see the Emerald Herald one last time before the credits. She will tell us that her journey is already complete, and that her name is Shanelote. She then gives her backstory about being born of dragons, and hints that she was made to break the curse, but she wasn't able to. Then she talks of Nishandra coming after you if you seek the throne, which you are about to do. But first, I will end Vendrick. Once I make my way back to Vendrick, I begin slapping at him, since he won't attack you until you rough him up a bit. If you don't have enough giant souls, he will have increasing defenses, and if you have no giant souls, he will have 32 times the normal defenses he has. This is absolutely ridiculous for a boss to have such a cheap defense. The reason that Vendrick is difficult is because of two things. He has stupid high defenses if you attack him too early, and he hits like a truck. But other than that, he's just a basic boss. Swing combos, overhead slam, red orb throw, and that's it. He doesn't have very deep mechanics. His numbers are just arbitrarily increased for defense and offense because players need more difficulty in the game, but the developers can't figure out how to give that difficulty without taking the cheap route of playing with numbers. This makes this fight painfully slow and frustrating because the only times you will lose is when all of your weapons break because of his defenses or because of a cheap combo that deals 2,000 damage. You don't even get a soul directly from him after killing him either. You have to go back to the Shrine of Amana to pick it up. Anyway, once this jerk is dead, I'll enter his memory. Here he will spout out everything you've already heard about proving your worth, how fire burning brighter fades quicker, and how you must seek the throne. We're almost there. Now we're going to get the king's soul and armor, even though we should have been able to pick it up in the undead crypt. Don't question, just accept. Anyway, in order to get these things, you'll need to go a little after the second bonfire in Shrine of Amana to a long walkway leading to a door. This door will open, and it houses the king's soul in a chair, and his item set in a nearby chest. His soul describes itself as a soul that beckoned the dark, and that it overwhelmed him. Then it insults him by saying that he was a lacking vessel for the true throne. He really did suck as a king. His own soul even admits that. Off down a weird cave hallway, you'll find the chest with the king's set in it, which you saw earlier, for those who want to cosplay as the worst king in the Souls series. With everything out of the way, I will finally seek the throne. The throne that is down this long walkway, in a huge cave, leading to a huge structure inside a cave that's on the tip of a mountain? They gave up on holding the world together. Just admit it. One thing that bothers me about all this is how Dark Souls 1 and 3 were explicit about linking the fire, whereas Dark Souls 2 is all about seeking the throne. Once you've defeated the bosses, you'll see that I have no fire to link, and instead I sit on a throne and that counts as linking the fire. I don't know why they changed this, but I'll talk about it later. Here you have your boy Benhart and a reassembled Vengarl to help you out. Told you he'd come back. Then we jump into the fog. The first phase of this long-winded encounter is with Throne Watcher and Throne Defender. These two bosses are trying to play on the Ornstein and Smo dynamic from Dark Souls 1 but being worse at differentiating the two. Throne Watcher is faster and has some acrobatic moves, but that's where the mechanical differences end. Anyone else notice the similarities between Throne Defender and the average Hade Knight? The worst part about this fight to me is that they both can resurrect the other, and as far as I know, this is infinite. This convinces me that this first phase is the hardest part of this four-boss encounter, and it only gets easier from here. As a side note, my original recording got corrupted for my glass cannon run again, so I'm fighting the end bosses in New Game Plus. That's why I get the Ring of the Evil I Plus 2. Just wanted to put that out there for clarity. After they're toasted, we'll be visited by the Queen. This is something I appreciate about the Queen's cutscenes, in that you have won if you fought Throne Watcher and Defender before going into the Memories of the Giants, and you have another cutscene if you fight them after the Memories. What's weird is you can get them both on one person if you die while fighting her directly after the Throne Twins. Also, you can fight Throne Watcher and Defender as soon as you get the King's Ring. Nishandra and Aldia won't spawn after them, but that also begs the question, why can't I take the throne when nobody was here? Don't question, just accept. 
Anyway, Nishandra is here, and she has transformed into what I can only describe as Nito's ultimate waifu. She is brief and says that you have proven yourself, and then threatens you by demanding you become one with the dark. That is the first cutscene. The second shows her already at the throne, but she says the exact same lines, which makes me think they just copied the audio. One thing about her soul, too, is that it describes it as fragments of the Abyss, tying her to Manus, father of the Abyss. See guys, everything's connected, isn't it amazing? When talking about the fight itself, I find her incredibly cheap with the way she curses you to drain your health bar, but her moveset does have many very punishable moves that will let you kill her easily. Overall, not good, but not stupid difficult either. After her death, Aldia speaks to you. It mentions how many monarchs have come and gone, including the DLC ones. Then it states how none have stood where the player has now, further sucking on your catalyst. Then it asks for your answer, which is weird since it just starts attacking you as soon as it spawns. When I talk about mechanics of the fight, this fight is the most boring fight in the game as far as I'm concerned. If you're a melee character, it's essentially a green light, red light situation, where you can only get hits in when its fire aura is down. If you're a caster, however, spam your heart out. This makes the boss very tedious either way, because of the teleporting and large health pool on top of arbitrary restrictions when trying to attack it with melee weapons. Can you feel the length dragging out yet? One thing I do like is Aldi's soundtrack piece. It's very somber and soft, as opposed to most of the rest of the soundtrack. Once Aldia is defeated, it will tell you how it lost everything, but that it remained here patiently. Then it says the throne will certainly receive you. Then he directly poses the question that Dark Souls 1 left subtle. Link the fire, or leave it. I'll be showing both endings here. It is your choice to embrace or renounce this. Sovereign, take your throne. What lies ahead, only you can see.
than the credits play. Not only the credits, but double credits for both Dark Souls 2 and Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin. I would like to ask why they gave us credits to a game that we don't actually own if we just have Dark Souls 2. Kinda odd if I do say so. I guess they needed to lengthen out the outro piece they made for the music to sound like Dark Souls 1's outro? Once that's over, you're sent back to Majula. Thankfully, this game doesn't force you into New Game Plus, which mechanically is nice, but narratively is a bit odd. The only person that seems to acknowledge our standing as the new monarch is the immortal cat. She'll give some confusing dialogue about how we must part ways because she's a cat, which is dumb, until you realize that she doesn't move at all throughout the entire game, let alone after the end, making this extra dumb. Then you'll see Kale is still hollowing, but never goes hollow. Same as all the other NPCs here. There's nothing more to say. Now that the base game is done, it's time for the DLCs. The first DLC I'll be tackling is Shelva, Sanctum City. You access all of the DLCs through these fountain things in the main game. No Dark Souls 1 list of requirements to be met, but you can come to a DLC too early, as two of them are available if you make a run towards the Rotten or the Old Iron King, with the final DLC being just before Drang Lake Castle, roughly the halfway point of the game. Anyway, these fountains are surrounded by stone pillars with messages about the DLC nearby. Shulva's text reads, Forbidden is the path to the ancient king's domain. Trespassers will face adversity befitting a monarch. With water dry and path amiss, woeful temptation is dismissed. The city of the sunken king sleeps, as does the dragon within. After playing through the main game and noticing how it will usually use some fancy language to say something mechanically, this pretty much translates to me as, you need to be high level, this is going to be difficult. It might be hard to navigate your way through. There's a dragon in the DLC too. And for the most part, that is accurate. Each DLC requires a high level to deal with the tough enemies and challenges that await you. This DLC in particular will give you the hardest time when it comes to progression, which you will see why as I go through it. The final boss of this DLC is also a dragon, but don't get your hopes up. After you go through the spring, you'll run into the dragon, Sin, sleeping until you get close to him. This is very similar to how Dark Souls 1's DLC showed Calamite very early on, and how both dragons notice you. One thing I like about this over Calamite's first encounter is how you can hear Sin breathing before you come around the bend. This is a great way to build tension, as dragons in the Souls games have been very intimidating, for one reason, or another. However, the drawback to this is that there is no surprise to be had. Calamite's first encounter was quick, surprising, and intimidating, as he looks at the player after appearing out of nowhere. This was scripted very tightly, so it'll have a similar effect almost every time, because he's in and out quickly. Sin, on the other hand, can be left sleeping while you stare at him. This can result in some of the tension being lost when you can stare at your foe outside of his trigger zone. Some may even start shooting him with magic or arrows or the like, until he flies away. This is something where I think they took the best of both worlds when designing Mitter's encounters, as he is viewable early, but not in a position that you could attack him. That encounter can be pure tension when you see this massive dragon sitting atop a mountain, and when you try to get near, he will roar and attack. This encounter with Sin is very gamey, in that nothing triggers until you reach a certain point, so he is just programmed to sit there. They do a better job with this later when he's flying around and attacks a bridge you are about to cross, but I think that should have been the first encounter with him. Not because I want things to be like Dark Souls 1, but because of the effect. You see two enemies across the bridge and think, oh boy. Then you hear a roar and a dragon comes and obliterates them. Now you're thinking, I have to fight that, I'm gonna die. This could have set up Sin as a more imposing enemy that appears with a bang, but then there wouldn't be another encounter with him until you fight him so I can see why they tried to stretch it out. Anyway, once you get to the DLC proper, you'll find the first bonfire above what looks like a bridge and an elevator. These will come into play later as some wonderful shortcuts. Genuinely good shortcuts. This is also an area where I and others have tried jumping down to the staircase leading into this temple. This doesn't work, as you can tell, but it is strange how they didn't just let the fall damage kill you. Instead, they give you the you fell into a pit of death camera angle showing that they purposely put a trigger there to kill you no matter what. I would have been fine with just dying from the height, but the developers didn't think that was enough, apparently. 
Once I start engaging with the DLC and its encounters, you'll notice right away that there are many enemies with high health as well as triggers that you can hit to raise and lower the platforms. This hits home the main gimmick of this DLC, being puzzle solving and platforming, something the Souls games have never done well. The area is filled with triggers that manipulate several platforms for items, exploration, combat, and shortcuts. Now on paper, this sounds great, but when you apply the Souls game's tendency for platforming to suck with the restrictive way platforming works, then you have something that can be a massive pain to deal with. You'll also notice how this DLC is unlike many areas of the base game, since this area is much more maze-like than many previous levels. While exploring, you'll run into these bugs and their sacks of item destruction goodness. They are essentially just here to break your gear, so be careful when dealing with anyone in these rooms, or with the bugs in general. It's best to lure them out or use very controllable ranged attacks to cut them down. One thing I've found while playing this DLC specifically is that you can skip a number of bonfires in order to progress. This may be because of the maze-like structure or because of the bonfires being in odd places where you can miss them, but either way, I only use a few bonfires in this DLC. The first one available, one at the bottom of the zone, the one before the gang squad, and the one between Alana and Sin. This is because the other bonfires are hidden or locked off by puzzles, or because the boss they are closest to isn't too much of a threat, so I don't worry about resting at them. Further down the road, I'll run into that bridge I mentioned earlier, and another elevator leading up that is locked off for now. This lift has been the subject of great humor, and here is why. This is a serious issue with the game, and for Christ's sake, it doesn't stop there. AI is pretty fucking important in video games. It can make or break immersion as well as make or break the challenge at hand. You need this shit to behave as expected, basically, and Dark Souls 2 has some incredibly interesting issues in this regard. This guy can't... can't get to me because he thinks he's a blind wall. Come here, buddy. <laughs> Come here, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm right here. Like that, that's a minute. <laughs> what happens if I step onto this thing? It's like, wait, what? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> He's treating you like a compass. He's just like, gotta get to that center somehow. <laughs> this is uncomfortable. I can't figure this out. <laughs> Bad AI. Obviously, this is simply a minor issue, though. So, does it get worse? Okay, let's uh, let's see if these guys are smart enough to realize that I'm on the ledge. Oh shit! <laughs> They're not. He's like, what the fuck? How is he doing this? Where did that guy go? Is this the shit Frank was talking about earlier? <laughs> <laughs> I'm technically in <laughs> square of invincibility. <laughs> I never want to activate whatever like lever that thing makes this thing move. This is just fucking beautiful. Aside from the buggy loss of aggro and the weird spasm of movement and the severe individual pathing issues, the AI has a few more problems. To the square! <laughs> <laughs> ride! Ride to the square! You stack your entire arm inside it and it's just like, stay firm! <laughs> They're like, what the fuck? <laughs> Frank, where did he go? I don't know. Let's look. <laughs> I mean, he's gotta be here somewhere. God damn it. Okay, Frank, you go this way and I go the other way. No, Frank, don't follow me! <laughs> so aside from the buggy loss of aggro, the weird spasm of movement, the severe individual pathing issues, and the clashing of each AI's pathing, the AI has a few more problems. <laughs> He's like, oh shit, what is this? <laughs> was it in the contract? What is this square of, of, of torture? I'm not supposed to be here. Uh. <laughs> He's like... <laughs> so is that it? Are the only issues the fact that they have a weird spasm of movement sometimes, they can't path for shit when alone or in groups, as they can clash into each other, they randomly lose their aggro to obstructions and literally nothing, and they have no sense of self-preservation? No. There's more. Wait, what the fuck? <laughs> Look at Frank! He's like, oh no. Oh no, no, no. 
shaking his head. <laughs> How did we come to this? <laughs> oh no, no, no. This is supposed to be hard for the player. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with this game? <laughs> and next time it's just a fucking retard running into nothing. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> he just needs to attack. He would <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm in range. Anyway, next to this lift is the second encounter with Sin, where he roasts these guys on the bridge. He only does this once, so try not to die afterwards until you reach the next bonfire. The other side of the bridge has a long hallway of stone doors sliding open that leads down towards another maze-like area inside the temple. First off, the sliding stone doors are a little odd to me, as they have five of them blocking you from entering until you run up to them, but you don't trigger anything like you will directly after them to open another sliding door. These five doors don't make sense. Why would they open without anything, but the later ones need a button to be hit? Just put a button on the outside for the five opening doors, or have all of them open when you walk up to them. Have some consistency, please. Secondly, this area can produce several problems for players, as it is easy to get spammed in a tight space and murdered by the normal enemies, dark poison casters, or ghostly dudes. These ghostly guys have an interesting mechanic, where you have to attack a nearby body that powers their invincibility. But the trade-off is that you can get stuck dealing with some of them without knowing where their power source is. This gets very frustrating later, when you try to reach a room holding several of their bodies while also dealing with up to five of them at once in a tight space when you can't damage them until you've destroyed their body. Later, I'll reach an area where having a bow is necessary to completing the puzzles, as the buttons are placed in weirdly tight and deep holes in the walls. Then I'll reach an area with spikes all over the ground. This area bugs me, because the spikes will damage you and your equipment very quickly, easily destroying your gear if you aren't careful. By the way, have you noticed the poison gimmick yet? A little after the spike room is an unlockable shortcut to an earlier part of this building, which is quite nice, and I really do have to say that the shortcuts in this DLC are some of the best in the game. Further down, and just before a confusing place with water monsters, I'll be invaded by our old friend Jester Thomas. His AI can be very intimidating when it wants to be, but sometimes it'll just break, or he won't attack, and he'll just roll around. I get that he's a Jester, but come on, man. Treat your fellow Joker with respect. Just after him is an area that is very annoying for its high health, high damage, melee and range attacking near bonfire spam of these weird bipedal mouth creatures. These guys will anger you as they have a ton of health, bad hitboxes, high damage, and surround the nearby bonfire. Easily one of the worst parts of this DLC. If you have ranged attacks, consider yourself lucky and try your best to get what you need done and then get out of here. The whole point of coming down here is to activate this mechanism to raise the bridge needed to enter the main temple, where two of the three bosses are. This area also includes the elevator back up to the bridge we need to cross, as well as another elevator connecting that to the first bonfire of the DLC. Where did all of this effort for good shortcuts and interconnectivity within the levels go in the main game? Seriously, this is some good stuff, but why are we getting so much of it at such a late stage in the game? Specifically, why in the DLC... This further pushes me to believe that the main game's areas were rushed, and that's why the level design was so simple in many areas, but now it's returning to what we expect from the Souls games. As I find the Dragonstone in the room with the spiked floors, I'll find a key leading us towards the Gank Squad boss. I also find the room I mentioned earlier that powers several ghostly dudes. This area can be frustrating as I said, but also a bit funny since there are pits of death that the ghostly dudes can easily fall into, but so can you. It's all about how well you can dodge. One other fun thing is that once the ghostly dudes turn corporeal, they can take damage from the spiked floors. I'm not one to encourage suffering, but I'll make an exception. Once the ghostly dudes are dealt with, you can find some buttons around that deactivate the spikes and open up several doors, with one leading to a bonfire, which is convenient if you're having trouble, but not so much when you hardly have an opportunity to aim at the button to unlock access to it in the first place. Once I make my way back to the Dragonstone mechanism, I'll activate it to raise the platforms needed to progress to the final area of the DLC. You're able to finally run up the stairs into the Dragon Sanctum, and you'll slowly make your way down to the double boss fight. This trek down can be very tiresome, as there are several tough knights down here. Thankfully, I have the power of Havel on my side. 
One room that a knight is near has several Titanite lizards locked in a room until you open it up, where they will run to the opposite wall. This was a bit weird, as sometimes you won't be able to hit them because of the knight attacking you, or because the lizard's hitboxes are the only accurate hitboxes in the entire game. There is a nearby bonfire, so you can attempt this multiple times, but it's still odd, and just embodies the frustration with dealing with these little lizards in this game. Further down, you'll find an illusory wall that leads to the bonfire mentioned previously. Shortly after, I'll run into two more knights that almost kill me, and then I'll continue my trek to the bottom. There are more knights to murder and items to find, but you'll eventually get there. One thing I found funny was how the knights in the poison-themed DLC aren't resistant to poison. That's quite ironic. Once I reach the bottom, through the power of the mighty Jester set, I'll find a summon sign for our old pal Benhart. One interesting thing about the boss fights in all of the DLCs is that every boss fight has two summons available. I'm not sure how this helps the difficulty angle of the game, but it certainly helps dealing with some of these boss runs and bosses, particularly the bad ones. Alana is a boss that I don't really have high thoughts of. She monologues at the beginning, giving you an opening for many hits. Then she'll summon additional mobs to fight, with most of them being skeletons, but she can also summon a Golden Velstat clone. This is an incredibly unbalanced trade-off. The skeletons don't do much damage or have much health, but there are a few of them, so they can present a challenge in a group of 3 to 4. The Golden Boy, on the other hand, can drastically increase the difficulty of the fight because it is literally Velstat from his first phase. High health, high damage, and being a second boss that can randomly be summoned makes this fight one that will either be quick and painless, or prolonged and frustrating, depending entirely on RNG. Add that the Velstat clone dodges much better than the actual boss, and you wonder what the developers were thinking at this point. After killing Alana, you're greeted by a secret pathway opening up that leads to the final fight of the DLC, Sin himself. Here I would recommend picking weapons that hit hard or have good durability while keeping some repair powder on hand, since this boss messes with durability. You can summon Transcendent Ed and Abess Fiva for this fight, making Sin anxious to stay in the air as much as possible. This fight is a simple endurance fight, because his moveset isn't anything ridiculous or high damaging, so I'd recommend taking your time and nuking him through the bleeding poison he will spray at you. This fight will drain your durability quick, so it's not a bad idea to let the summons deal with him while you sit back and heal, or fix your durability. With the summons, this fight looks amazing, Sin flying around while you and your cohorts fight to bring him down. The downside is that it becomes a very start and stop boss because of the summons. He spends so much time in the air that you'll spend just as much time looking at him flying away as you will actually fighting him. Once he is defeated, you'll get his unusually plain looking soul that mentions how wondrous his soul is. I doubt his wondrous soul, because even the game thinks it's on par with Dragon Rider. You'll also get the crown of the Sunken King. You'll also have a chance to look at the ring I picked up at the beginning of the fight. Yorg's ring is one of the weirdest rings I've seen in these games. It basically gives you a 50% chance to deflect spells. Now, it sounds good, but at the same time it's very weird to be able to just deflect every other spell because you have a ring. Seems like they just wanted to add more rings in the game, so they made up cool new effects for them to have. Now I'm going to make my way towards the gank squad. To reach them, you need the Eternal Sanctum key, and you have to return to the door that was locked at the beginning of the Dragon's Sanctum. After opening it, you'll fight some casters and bugs until you go up a ladder to an area that can lead to the top of the temple, as well as another pathway leading to the bonfire before the squad. But before you can reach it, you'll have to deal with an invader, Rock Shield Balder. This is this invader's only appearance in the entire game, so I'm not sure if this is a reference to something, or if they just made him for fun and then added him in near the end of production. He's not referenced anywhere, so this seems like a one-off. Anyway, I kill him and chill at the bonfire afterwards. One thing that is a bit odd to me is how there is an elevator right next to the bonfire that leads down to the main temple bridge. I've already cleared that area, and you need to go deep into the temple to get the key to access this area anyway, so I have this elevator that gives you a second route that makes you go through the bridge again. You already have access to the temple, and I'd say that the two casters and bugs are easier to deal with than the two shield and spear dudes on the bridge. If you're going backwards, you can always just warp to one of the bonfires there. This seems like a shortcut that doesn't need to exist. You can warp to the area before this elevator, and you've already beaten a good chunk of the area after this, so what's the point? 
They may have just wanted another shortcut, because it's a very Souls-like thing to do. Now I'm on the warpath for the gang squad, beginning by entering the Cave of the Dead. I'd highly recommend summoning rapacious Andre and ruined Aphlis for this next bit, as it is... painful. You will drop into an area with several enemies, dozens of petrifying statues, and several roaming, living statues that will follow you and continuously try to petrify you. This boss run is ridiculous and annoying, but it is only the beginning to the horrible boss runs of the DLC. Eventually, I make it to the fog wall, and the fight begins. Right away, you can see that fighting the afflicted grave robber, ancient soldier Varg, and Sarah the old explorer would be ridiculous if you tried soloing it. Now the fight is more evenly matched at a 3v3 instead of a 3v1. This fight is one of the worst cases of a spam boss because each of these enemies is on par with a strong invader, but there are three of them, making this fight extremely difficult without help. These three enemies make up what many have referred to as the gank squad because, more often than not, they will gank you to death with the great bow, bleeding slashes, and the second Havel rip off of the game. Not to mention how all of their assets have already appeared before. One thing I recommend doing early on is to nuke Sarah, as he is the weakest and has ranged attacks that can assist the others, but be wary of the statues near his sniper perch. Once he is dead, focus on the grave robber, as he is very fast and bleed is a real pain. Once the two of them are dealt with, you have a much more manageable fight with Varg. This strategy works very well with the summons acting as distractions. However, Aphlis is next to useless with his spells doing very little damage, because the defenses for these guys are oddly high. For instance, my lightning-infused Ultra Greatsword can do over 400 damage per hit to the New Game Plus 7 Rotten, but does about half of that to these guys on New Game for some reason. DLC magic right there. And yes, I do know that summons increase boss defenses, but still, that's ridiculous in itself. Once I've finished the fight, I'm given three Twinkling Titanite, three Petrified Dragon Bones, and one Titanite Slab. This may be the way the developers say, we're sorry for making this so terrible, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Afterwards, I'll explore a small area after their arena that gives us a few items and a new hex, Dark Greatsword. And with that, I've reached the end of Shelva and the Poison DLC. Now let's head to what I consider to be the best Dark Souls 2 DLC, Rune Tower. The reason I say that is because this area and the bosses are, mostly, better than the other DLCs, with the Fume Knight being arguably the best fight in the game. But I'll get to it when I get to it. To reach this DLC, you'll have to get to the end of the Iron Keep area, just after the old Iron King boss fight, and interact with the fountain to warp there. I'm not sure why all the DLCs have fountains linking them to the main game, but I'm not going to complain about it any more than I already have. The inscription around this fountain reads, Forbidden is the path to the ancient king's domain. With water dry and path amiss, woeful temptation is dismissed. In the tower of the old Iron King resides a child of dark. Trespassers will face adversity befitting a monarch. Like Shelva, it has three sections that are identical with the other DLCs, but the only difference here is the In the tower of the old Iron King resides a child of dark. This fits the Broom Tower DLC similarly to the Shelva DLC, with its emphasis on difficulty and how you should beat the main game before doing the DLC. But the line about the Child of Dark is a little misleading. You deal with a Child of Dark, but it doesn't do much to get in your way the majority of the DLC. At least Shelva mentioned a dragon, and you actually fight a dragon. The addition of the Old Iron King to the description helps to explain why this area and DLC is connected to his boss room, but other than that, it's about as random as the other fountains. Anyway, once I make it to the tower, you'll notice that this map is very vertically designed. This means prepare for the elevators. Even the beginning to the DLC has one just before the reveal of the tower itself. Once you make it up the stairway, you'll see several ashen corpses surrounding a multi-armed monster. These corpses look very much like Dranglaic soldiers, which shows a connection to the base game not found in the other DLCs. This is something I really like about this DLC in that several aspects of it connect with the base game, mainly with the Iron Keep and its inhabitants. This will be heavily enforced when you get to the bosses. The important part of this little set piece, however, is that there are smelter wedges here, and it subtly lets you know how to use them. The monster has six smelter wedges in her, and when you take them out, she disintegrates. This lets you know that when you encounter another one of them, that you can use a smelter wedge to destroy them. 
This is also a bit off because you only need one wedge to destroy the monster's bodies, but six are inside the one before you loot it, and then it disintegrates. Inconsistent, but it's nothing major. The monster idea is expanded after you reach the first bonfire. You encounter a Bride of Ash, the monster from earlier, and you get an idea of what it can do. It will spout flames from the ground and attack you until you shove a wedge down her throat. Then she will drop a piece of a soul. This soul will require you to obtain more smelter wedges later and interact with all of the Brides of Ash to get the soul of Nadalia, as each one possesses a part of that soul. I'll be skipping over several of them for now, as getting them all can be a pain, and you need to make sure you have at least four wedges for the Fume Knight fight, as the Brides don't just attack you. You'll have noticed by now that there will be a lot of jumping and falling in the DLC, so it's a good idea to bring the Cat Ring or be wearing the fabulous Jester's Legs for the reduced fall damage. Another thing you may have noticed is the ambushes from enemies spawning out of the ground. This comes throughout the DLC, so be wary and alert for ambushes. One nice thing about the DLC is how it will give you a Titanite slab early on. Now, before you get on to me about complaining about getting slabs earlier, this is during the DLCs, which are post-endgame content. It makes sense here, but it doesn't in the early game. Once you go down this ladder, you'll be greeted by more enemies and another Bride of Ash. This bride buffs the enemies. There are several areas visible from here that you can reach by dropping down to them or by opening secret doors. One such area is the chest room below. Keep an eye out for these areas or elevators that will become active later once you activate the smelter forge. Eventually, you'll reach a room with several dudes holding explosive barrels. These guys are suicidal and straight up idiots. They will wander around most of the time, and usually end up helping you more than hurting you, as they damage anything nearby, whether friend or foe. You'll find a floating dude that wields a bow and a sword that has already taken damage from the fire placed nearby. This is one thing that really messes with the enemies, because they can end up killing themselves because of the flames spewing out of several places in the map. Add the exploding guys, and all you have to do is bait them into the fire, or use flame-based attacks to trigger the barrel bros to kill whoever is nearby. After a few more enemies, I'll come to the next bonfire. This bonfire connects to a few rooms that lead to chests or lifts that I'll use later. Be careful with platforming here, as they can be tricky and exploration will usually lead you to vantage points against some enemies. Then you'll come to a door that you can't open until the blockage on the other side is destroyed. The convenience here is that it explodes, and it can be hit and triggered from the other side of the door, albeit only with certain weapons. I'm sure this is unintentional, but it is rather annoying to try to get around it and shoot it with an arrow to blow up the debris. Blowing it up gives you access to the dude that can ambush you if you're fighting in the room below. After poisoning one barrel row, I'll make my way around to the entrance to the area with the Bride of Ash and the big guy. The big guys on this map are both interesting and potentially frustrating, as they have very high health and damage, but also have a way to catch you out if you try rolling around them. Their shoulders leak lava from time to time creating an interesting challenge that prevents much circle strafing, unless you're willing to take the damage. As you can see, I'm rather cheap with these guys, as I will use any and all cheese methods to defeat them, since this encounter can be quite troublesome with several normal enemies, a big guy, a barrel bro, and a bride of ash to deal with. One interesting thing about the big guys is that they have a chance to drop the smelter hammer, or the community dubbed chicken wing which is a massive great hammer with the largest hitbox of any weapon in the game. It requires 70 strength to one hand and 99 strength, max strength, to power stance. It is an experience to use, and if you have the stats, by all means, become the Dark Souls Colonel Sanders. Once I come back outside, I will meet a new enemy, the Crow Girls. Sounds like a terrible goth band. They shoot lightning balls at you and can teleport behind you to backstab you. They are a right pain at times, but are relatively weak. This area, though, plays to their strengths, as there are several ambushes here, and you'll most likely be too distracted by the ambushers to deal with the crows. This area below the crows can be frustrating as well, because you can fall down here and get spam-bushed, as you can see. Once I make it back, I get sweet revenge on them, and loot all their goodies, and proceed to the next bonfire, where you will need a key to activate the lifts throughout the broom tower. But before I progress further, I'll take a detour to a nearby tower. This tower is an incredible pain. It's like walking down the street with a cactus dominating your rectum. This tower spawns an invader, Maldron, which is a hit or miss in this game for the most part, but if you get his health bar low enough, 
he will drag you into the tower where you will have to deal with a now healed Maldron, several enemies, a floating archer, and another Bride of Ash that will curse you and buff the enemies. And the best part is that you can bring them all back up to the top once the Bride is dead, but Maldron will run back to his camping spot once his health reaches the same percentage as before, and he will heal again. This tower has led many players to death, torture, self-loathing, and rage, and it is the second worst area of this DLC. I say second because there is another dark, depressing section that I will eventually have to overcome. But I defeated one atrocity, so let's move on. The next area is a strange maze-like room with gates that provide shortcuts throughout the area. There are also several crows and barrel bros throughout that can be damaged by the fire-breathing mounts on the walls. These things are kinda cool because you can smack them back and forth along the wall to damage enemies. The other side of the wall usually has spikes all over it, but the fire is more useful. The drawback is that this whole area is really stupid once you think about it. I mean, what purpose does this area serve? Seriously. At least once you beat the area, there's a shortcut past it from the bonfire. Once you've beaten the gate maze, you'll enter another tower. This tower houses several fat guys on the floor that can leap at you and explode. Suicide is a real problem here, apparently. They are best defeated by baiting the suicide, if you can, and just letting them blow up. I'll make my way to a ladder that leads down into a room with another invader, Rachel, and this is where things get really funny. The invader has a hard time staying focused once the ladder comes between you. This is doubly hilarious if you manage to set these brazers on fire and run the NPC into them. She'll just keep walking into the fire and you can enjoy roasted Rachel for lunch. Afterwards, you'll have several rooms to check out that house more fat guys, crows, items, and one allowing you to progress further. The final area of this tower is the Power Room. This room has several exploding fat guys that will activate once attacked, or if you pick up the Scorching Iron Scepter or get close to it. This is pretty easy to deal with as you just bait, back away, and repeat. They'll kill themselves for you. Once that is done, I'll take a lift up and return to the bonfire to activate the Broom Tower Forge thing that powers all the lifts. Taking the lift closest to the bonfire takes you down to the next level, where a locked door and a pathway outside are. The key to the door is just on the edge of the outside area, but first you must deal with the mighty Barrel Bros and their merry giants. As you can see, poison is one of the most overpowered things in this game, right up there with life gems. Once I get the tower key, I'll return to the door and make my way down to reach another lift that will take me to the Iron Passage, where dark forces await to ruin our day. This area leads to the Blue Smelter Demon, basically just another smelter demon that is buffed with magic instead of fire, hence the blue. Now I come to... that boss run. This run is one of the two worst boss runs in the entire game. There are several normal enemies, crows, floating archers, and a new enemy, I'll call them Satan Spawn, that casts Tranquil Walk of Peace over and over to slow you down while also healing the enemies. Add that these crows, archers, and Satan Spawn are often on platforms you can't reach, and you have a recipe for many a rage compilation. Seriously, this is the most middle fingers I've ever seen a video game developer give to the players. This area oozes spite, and I genuinely think someone was having some real issues when making this. After battling our way through three separate areas of psychological pain, we'll make it to Mr. Blue. It's essentially the same fight as Mr. Orange from before, but now he deals magic damage, and his stats have been buffed accordingly. There's nothing else to say about him. After the fight, you'll find a lift leading you back to the bonfire before the highway to hell. I'll take a lift back to the main area bonfire, and I'll make my way down even further. There are two platforms, one the elevator stops at, and one just above that. Jumping to the higher platform leads you to a chest with a strength ring. You know what it does. Then you'll slowly fall down, level by level, until you reach the bottom. If you stand on the rubble on one of the levels, it will collapse under you, and this can chain depending on where you're at. If you can, you want to land on one of the edges, so that the big guy at the bottom won't attack you, and you can simply shoot him down. After you open the door behind him, you'll run into more floating archers that won't die the first time you slap them down. Just run past them to the chest, then the lift that will take you to the bottom of the tower. Don't forget to praise the sun on the way down. It increases your morale stat by 1000%. Anyway, here you will find the Fune Knight, with his arena surrounded by Brides of Ash. This is the reason I held on to the smelter wedges. 
The brides can heal the Fume Knight during the fight if they are not destroyed, so wedge those suckers. Nearby is a bonfire, so you don't have to make a very long boss run back if you die, which is a nice addition. Now I'll fight the Fume Knight proper, or at 200% proper, as I have a summon. Steelheart Ellie will join us, and she's pretty useless, except for being a wonderful punching bag for Rame. You can summon Carhelion, but only if you've spoken to him and he's relocated to Majula. He's also pretty useless and weak. The Fume Knight is a very tough fight, as he is weak to nothing, has over 10,000 HP, and has a wide array of moves covering several combos, long and short range attacks, slow and fast attacks, an AoE move, and a charge. Overall, a very solid fight that I say is the Artorias of Dark Souls 2. Not that they are on par, but that they are both fantastic one-on-one -on -one fights in their respective games. I find it funny that Velstat defeated him, and yet the Velstat boss fight is very boring and simple compared to Raim. Maybe it's the Fume Ultra Greatsword making Raim awesome. You may have noticed that the Fume Knight dropped another piece of Nadalia's soul. This was required, as you need to wedge all the brides and defeat Raim to get Nadalia's soul, effectively completing the DLC. But I'm not done yet. After I get the crown of the Old Iron King, I'll be leaving. I've spent plenty of time going down, but now it is time to go up. Along the way, I will be grabbing the other fragments of Nadalia's soul, as well as picking up the ring at the top of the tower. This ring, the Baneful Bird Ring, reduces stamina loss when blocking with a shield. This is quite useful for tank builds, so all my hefty friends should try to get this ASAP. Once I return to the main bonfire, I'll enter a locked area where you will be continuously cursed by the Bride of Ash here. Since I don't have any more wedges, I'll have to go find some to deal with her. If you take the one lift nearest to the locked door, you'll be brought up to where you've been before, but now another lift is in operation that leads you to an area with more fire spouts and barrel bros on the first level. The second level adds normal enemies and floating archers. Once they have been dealt with, you'll find a chest at the end that holds another four smelter wedges. Now that I have more wedges, I'll continue collecting the soul fragments. Then I'll progress upward again to reach another bride next to a group of invaders. Yes, a group, because the developers hate you as a player. Take the lift leading up to the other smelter wedges, but use the door on the left to take another lift up to the next bride and the invading prowlers. It doesn't say it's multiple prowlers when you get the pop-up text, so it kind of throws you off when this guy appears another four times all at once after just beating him. Once you're done with the invading spam, you'll reach the area where you gain access to the Sir Alon boss fight. There is a nearby bonfire, and I recommend resting at it, as this boss run can be difficult. But before that, let's grab another soul fragment. When you return, you simply interact with the suit of armor to enter the memory of the old Iron King. You'll find two summons here, Adel and Lori, and then you can begin the trek to Alon. One funny thing about these summons is that they will emote and throw the hello rocks when you're near. Makes them feel more real, which should have been used more in this game. The slow grind begins by trying to manage these giant flame-spitting lizards, as they can produce many issues when trying to deal with the Alon Knights littered throughout this boss run. On a side note, it is nice to see Alon's followers defending him in the memory. Gives some context to why all the Alon Knights use katanas, as Alon himself uses one. After making our way through several enemies, we'll find Alon sitting in his arena, which gives some thought towards him meditating, or something like that. Unfortunately, he does not praise the sun so we must execute him. As you can tell, Alon is one quick fighter, with several of his attacks being very fast. This makes the boss fight very much based on reaction time. This is almost the opposite of the Fume Knight, as his attacks were slow, but had heavy damage and wide reach, while Alon moves across the arena and attacks very quickly, but lightly. The only exception is his grab move. On that subject, one thing that Mahler brought up in his videos on Dark Souls 2 was that Alon's grab had a very bad hitbox and that it would grab you behind the hilt, which would be absolutely ridiculous if proven true, which he did prove in the video in question. He showed several examples of the grab tagging you from behind the hilt. My problem with it is that this has never happened to me while playing, and I have over 500 hours in the game. I'm beginning to wonder if it is an issue in Dark Souls 2, an issue in Scholar of the First Sin, or if it was patched in one version or the other, as the video that mentioned it wasn't clear if it was an issue in Scholar, the original, or both. I'm not criticizing what Mahler said, just wanted some clarity on which game had the issue, as I personally haven't had an issue with it in the original. But you never know what it might be when you have to account for the game version and what the player's ADP is at. 
Once Alon is beaten, you will find the final Smelter Wedge needed, and I will continue searching for the final Bride of Ash. Once I find and kill her, I then have all 12 fragments for Nadalia's soul. Once all pieces are in your inventory, they will become the completed soul. If you choose to, you can convert it into the Pyromancy Outcry, or the Chime of Screams, or you can pop it for souls. I always pop it for souls since I'm insatiable. Once Nadalia's soul is completed, I've finished the Broom Tower DLC, with only the Ice DLC remaining. Now I reach the final stretch of content for the game, with the Laum Lois. Like before, three of the tablets near the fountain read the same, except for Eleum Lois, Land of the Ivory King, lies cold as death, nary a hint of warmth remaining. This is telling us that this place is going to be chilly, and inadvertently encourages pyromancers to light everything on fire. It's interesting that they put the Eleum Lois fountain after the One Million Souls checkpoint instead of somewhere else. I can understand why they'd have trouble placing this one, as the base game didn't have a snow-themed area like the other DLCs. Shulva was poison-themed, so it connected to Black Gulch, and Broom Tower was fire-themed, so it connected to Iron Keep. I also believe that the developers put this here because I would argue that this DLC is the hardest and most unforgiving, as well as the most time-consuming. Each of the three bosses has something to make the fight more difficult, whether fair or not, and you have to go through the entire map two times in order to complete the DLC. I'll talk about all that as I go. First things first, the entrance has a woman tell you to turn back, as the old chaos hungers still. The DLC itself tells you to leave. Kinda weird, but everyone immediately wants to do that which she said not to do anyway. Shortly after that, you can approach the first boss immediately on the left, and she'll tell you to go back again and that Ava is watching. Ava is the first boss of the DLC, and your first encounter with her can be a pain because she is invisible until you go through the first cycle of the DLC. And no, this isn't like Priscilla, where you can see her footprints on the ground and she reappears every once in a while. Just follow the path and she'll become visible when you reappear after getting an item. Still, such a cheap way to make this boss harder. But this is only the beginning. If you do enter the arena before exploring the DLC, the woman will say, Poor Ava, do you miss your king? One without the sign has arrived. Do be merciful and end things swiftly. I'll die quickly here just so I can move on. If you head to the right after the first bonfire, we'll begin the first cycle of the DLC. From here, you can see that the average enemies are pretty standard at this point. High health, high damage, etc. One thing this DLC includes is one thing that the Souls games got right once. Dogs. I will fight people to the death about that. Sif is the only good dog enemy in any of these games. Seriously. The small ones are either spammed together, too fast and agile, or have hitboxes that are hard to hit because of how small and fast they are. I'll make my way to this large courtyard area, where you'll deal with several enemies that are programmed to swarm you when you're in the right position. Add that they can spam you with ranged attacks and you have a very hard time here. It also shows some more ambush tactics, as I attack one guy off in the distance, only to trigger another enemy that was lying in wait behind a wall. Another thing you'll notice is all of the hooded women sitting around. These women don't activate until you come through the area again when you have unfrozen the area. When you unfreeze the area, several of these massive ice blockages will be gone, allowing you to explore more areas for items and further progression during the second cycle of the DLC. Now I'll make it into a building with several enemies behind boxes, including a dog and several normal enemies. But I'll be heading upstairs to make my way around to where I was before, but behind a snowy hill to pick up the dark clutch ring. After that, I'll return to the room with the dog and his buds. Then I'll run outside again to meet two beefier enemies that I love to poison, as poison is such a great tool to counter the game's enemies. This open area can become more hectic after the unfreeze, as all these women will activate and they are specifically designed to backstab you for a critical hit. This can be frustrating, but only if you're caught out, so keep rolling and swinging. There are three paths after this that lead towards some loot, an essential area for the second cycle, and the path forward. The loot area just has a few enemies near cliffside that eventually lead you to the old bell helm, you know, so you can look like a dunce. The second area I will get to later, but the third area forces you forward, as the bonfire is just after a drop. This is such an annoying way to force players to go through the entire area again if they forgot something near the end. It's just a time waster. Please stop. Anyway, progressing will bring us to an interesting side area with a ring, 
the Ring of the Embedded. This ring gives you some bonuses, but causes you to take extra damage. This really can be beneficial to some builds, but I already have a good deal of buffs, and I want to avoid taking too much damage as much as possible, so I won't be using it. But if you're into the whole challenge me as much as possible idea, feel free to use it, as this can be useful for glass cannon builds, one way or another. Next I will run into an ice big guy next to a locked door. This door is used as a shortcut later, but it's pretty useless in my opinion. The big guy isn't too hard to deal with once you understand his attacks, but these guys are usually supplemented by more enemies. This guy gets a friend shooting at me from inside a nearby building. Once I make it into the building to murder the shooter, you'll see a frozen mimic chilling in the ice. This is a nice hint for later, as the mimic will be in its camouflaged appearance when you come back. Next to this room are more big guys with a hidden bonfire behind a locked door. This bonfire gives access to a hidden boss of the DLC and the second of the two worst boss runs in the game, but you'll have to wait to see that. After making my way up, I'll be greeted by invisible enemies near these ballistas. You can ignore them if you choose to, so don't feel bad about neglecting to visit them. You can come back after the unfreeze to unlock the Pharaoh's lockstone port to enter a secret room for a special item. After dealing with a few more enemies, I'll come to an area with a lever that lifts rubble that was blocking off a side room earlier in the level. I'll head back there later. Shortly after that, I'll come to another encounter with several dogs that give a few items, and after them, I'll head down into the next area with a key item towards progressing. Before that item, the woman will tell you to turn away and never look back. She'll also tell you that no one must ever find that which is sheltered in Elaim Lois. After the 63rd warning from her, you'll obtain the Eye of the Priestess key from the altar nearby. This makes Ava visible once you obtain it. Shortly after, you'll find a unique enemy that doesn't invade, but seems like he should. Not to mention the strange way he died, where I backstab him and his animation rolls away after the initial slap, but he still takes the damage and dies. A bit odd. I bet he would say it was lag. Moving on, I'll enter into the walls of the area, and I'll deal with several hooded women casters that aid the enemies we've already seen. The next room has several enemies, but adds even more once the unfreeze happens. Luckily, these little women are very susceptible to poison, just like everything else in this DLC. After that encounter, I'll be invaded by Arheim, and this boy is very sneaky, which you will see why in a moment. But first, you must deal with the spam in the room above. Once the spam is dealt with, you'll move up and see a chest at the end of a hallway. If you're playing online, this area will have several messages telling you to be aware of backstabbing, and this is one of the situations where I love being a jester. Arheim has disguised himself as a barrel that backstabs you when you try to interact with the chest. Normally, the backstab can do high damage and even be fatal, but because of my wonderful costume, I shrug it off and send that cheap boy home. After you run up the nearby stairs, you'll appear right before the Ava boss fight and the first bonfire. Your first cycle of the DLC is now complete. Before the fight with Ava, I'll be summoning some friends, because I'm that guy. You can summon your old friend from way back, Masterless Glencore, and Ellie again. When you enter the arena this time, the woman from before will state that this city is dead and has nothing to offer and to go back. She tells us to not seek the old chaos or its twisted flame. She's wrong, of course. The city is full of souls to take. After that, the Ava fight begins. This fight is an overall mixed bag to me, as this is a fresh take on the quadrupedal bosses, being that it's a kitty, but its moveset is very unbalanced. Several of its melee attacks are fine and have their own telegraphing and such, but some of the spells used can be quite frustrating. The explosion has an overly large hitbox, which is always frustrating, and the homing missiles are incredibly hard to dodge. Because there are five of them shot at you in quick succession, the best way to mitigate the damage is to block it if you have the stamina, or just tank the first missile damage, as it's difficult to dodge all five at once. Overall, an okay boss, but nothing beyond okay. The solo of the boss is a bit confusing as well, since it mentions the Ivory King having seven beasts, but we only meet three in the DLC, and they're all cats. Maybe he's a cat person, but I don't know where the other four are. After the fight, you'll gain access to the Grand Cathedral, where you will meet the woman who's been bugging you the whole time, Alsana. She's surprised to see that you've bested Ava, and then spouts the lore of the land. She talks about how the land was barren and sucked until the Ivory King came and he built Elaim Lois. Then he was drained of vigor and went into the Chaos Heart after giving his soul, and she hopes he returns one day. 
She then says that her one wish is that her lord will be freed from the chaos. Right there is where most players' ears will perk up, since you now have an objective. The lines afterward confirm that she wants your assistance. If you don't offer your help, she will just be angry with you, and won't unfreeze the area, and won't open the way towards the final boss of the DLC. If you offer your service, she will thank you and open the way towards the Ivory King, as well as unfreezing the entire zone. After this, she will tell you that many of the king's knights followed him into the chaos, but didn't return, and that his subjects waited patiently for his homecoming, but now wait for a new leader, that being you. This basically tells you that there are knights with the boss, and knights around the area where you need to guide them into the chaos. This leads to a part of the boss encounter that I'll talk about when I get to him. I highly recommend that you do not engage the boss fight here, as this can be one of the worst encounters if you go it alone, or just with the summons nearby. I'll return once we gather the knights. You begin your trek by going where you have been before, but this time there are a few changes. The first area no longer has rubble blocking the pathway, so you can explore and pick up Soul Flash and the North Warder set. Now you'll see the hooded women get up and ambush you when you run past them. This can be frustrating, but they usually won't activate until you go past them or attack them, and at this point, you should have a strong weapon in hand. Before the open courtyard, you'll find two ice areas opened up with a few items to collect. The courtyard itself now has more enemies to deal with, and you have much less cover available. I recommend using the ranged attack strategy on the two in the back, as that makes the rest of the area much more manageable. Just after that, you'll come to an area where the ice has melted away, allowing you to go up and loot the frozen chests from before, and access a lift leading into a new area. This new area sucks, as it introduces an enemy that will make you want to forget the game exists. But I'll come back to this. For now, I'm going to go to the end of this section, just before the bonfire, where I will go down the second pathway I neglected earlier. This pathway requires a lit torch, so having a flame butterfly is a great help for this. Here you will need to light the four brazers, and the door will open, showing many repeated assets in the Flexile Sentry clones, and quite a lot of hooded women. I don't know if this is a polygamy thing or spam, but either way, these sentries are getting plenty. The main point of this area is to kill the Flexile Sentry deepest in the room, as he has a key to many doors throughout the area. The platforms above make great vantage points for ranged attacks, as well as acting as wonderful choke points to deal with the KKK women. After you defeat them all, you'll get the Garrison Ward Key, which you will be using quite a lot. Now I return to the lift area, and I'll head down to meet the enemy that frustrates all, the porcupines. These little mongrels will roll at you, damaging you, and can easily stun knock you because of how many of them will come rolling at you, mixed with the fact that they can be quite fast. They also damage you by simply being close enough to you, so range is important here. Shortly after I am introduced to the porcupines from hell, I'll be invaded by Hexer Nikolai. This invader can be a massive pain because of his high damage, and that he has an incredibly unbalanced health pool and damage, considering he uses hexes and miracles. His cheapest move is his Dark Explosion, that creates dark orbs that seek you shortly after exploding. This attack does upward of 1000 hit points if they all hit you. I recommend nuking this guy as quickly as possible, because he can really ruin your exploration of the area if he kills you over and over again. Thankfully, I'm able to cut him down in my first go. Afterwards, I'll enter an area with multiple levels to it that have several porcupines hiding behind corners that can chain aggro on you based on natural movement to get away from them. This can be frustrating, but keep a level head and try to keep them in their own area before moving on to the next enemy. There are also some casters here that were repeated from the Dark Lurker boss run. These enemies tend to do very little damage and don't have much health, so I think they were added just to stunlock you while dealing with the other enemies. One enemy that is particularly cancerous is the special enemy here that will run away from you constantly. This enemy's AI is very weird, being as it rarely attacks and will get stuck if you block its coded path out of the building, as you can see. This enemy is meant to lead you to every other enemy in the area, and then run down the pathway if the door is open. Thankfully, on my glass cannon, I'm able to knock them down quickly, as they will be a tough fight if they are allowed to go down into the nearby cave, where an old friend is waiting. That old friend is Jabba on ice. They repeated the covetous demon now. Why would you do that? He's just a fat slug that gives free souls in the base game, but now he's got cranked health and damage. That doesn't change the fact that he's still a terrible enemy. I guess we should be thankful that they didn't repeat him as a boss, because it wouldn't be a surprise if they did. 
After clearing the room, you'll find the Ivory Warrior Ring, which reduces enemy stamina when attacking them if they are blocking. Useful, but only in particular situations. Once you're ready to move on, you'll deal with more Porcupine Spam and find a shortcut back to the bonfire from earlier. There is also the continuing path forward. This path has several Porcupines and several Soul-Charged Golems. These Golems won't activate unless they consume souls from something you've killed. I recommend heavy use of the bow in this area, as this can be a tremendous spam area to get through. One weird thing about the Golems is that you can attack their bodies even if they aren't active and still get the souls from them. Kind of flies in the face of the risk versus reward situation when you can get a free 3000 souls for nothing. After that horrible area is another lift leading up to the other side of the bridge where the first lift was. Here you will deal with a mesh of porcupines, big guys, and other enemies you've seen. Caution is the best tool here, as many of them wait around corners to ambush you. Once you finish clearing the area, you'll come across two things. A large snowball, and a room with a knight sitting in a chair. The snowball is a shortcut back to the area near the first lift. In my opinion, this is the best shortcut in the game, as this is a great spot for easy access to the next area to get through. It's a creative shortcut, and it is very satisfying to watch the snowball grow in size and crush the enemies blocking your way. The knight in the chair is something else. This is one of the Eleum Lois knights you need to free to make the Burnt Ivory King boss fight manageable. There are several of these chaps, so this is just the beginning. All you do is free them and they will warp to the fog door for the final boss fight. After returning from the next unfrozen stage, I'll make my way to the top of the wall again. Here I will run into that mimic from earlier and will be able to open all the other chests. Shortly after that, I'll run to the bonfire in the corner as you can open it with the garrison ward key. This will give access to the most tedious area in the game. After making my way back to the top of the wall, I'll return to the invisible ballista users and open the secret area. You will find Durgo's hat in the chest, which increases the range of bows and makes you look quite fashionable. Not as fashionable as the always popular and glorious Jester, but decent. You'll have noticed that there is a stairway that has been unfrozen, allowing you access to the inner area of the walls. This long walk down the inside of the walls can be a bit slow, as there are several enemies and the bottom level has many dogs to deal with. After completing this area, you'll find a pathway with a lift on one side, and a small tower on the other. Here you will be invaded by Donna, a witch whose spells and hexes have issues working well. She can easily be poisoned or simply stunlocked to death, so have at her. After her and another big dude, you will find another Eleum Lois Knight. Taking the nearby lift, this brings you to a door just under the area where you found the Eye of the Priestess key, and leads on to the next unfrozen section. This area becomes much harder after being unfrozen, as the golems can now be activated, and sometimes they will steal your souls from defeated enemies. There is also a nearby mimic in this room, which is pretty obvious to see as the mimic metal chests have a different lighting effect on them, which I'm not sure is intentional, as that defeats the purpose of them being surprises. After making my way back up to the sneaky invader area, I'll slap down the enemies as quick as I can while also avoiding the golems in the center of the room. If you have a large weapon, specifically a weapon with a large hitbox, smack the crap out of these three golems. If you can manage your damage well enough, you can kill all three of them at once or close to it. Shortly after will be another Eleum Lois Knight, and after him will be a door leading back up to the Grand Cathedral. If you have done all that, you can now fight the Burnt Ivory King on even terms. You can summon Twiggy Shay and our old friend Lucatiel for this fight, in what many consider the final fight of Dark Souls 2. I told you Lucatiel's story had no resolution. This fight may not be the last one people fight, but you gain access to the proper encounter after unlocking or killing the other bosses, so I'll call this the final boss of the game, even though I'm doing them out of order. Alsana will tell you that the knights, reborn, will follow your word, basically meaning you're in for a fight. And indeed you are. As you can see, you will have six friends assisting you in this boss fight, although the Burnt Ivor King has several charred Lois knights to fight for him. This boss fight is one that can be a great or terrible experience, depending on when you try it. If you try it immediately after the unfreeze, you will be spammed and ganked to death. If you do it after unlocking all the knights, it will run as I believe was intended. Or I might be wrong and the developers wanted you to suffer. What do you think? Getting back to the fight, this is a battle where the charred knights will keep spawning until a white knight interacts with one of their spawn doors. Once that happens, the door will ice over and it won't spawn any more enemies from it. 
but you will lose the White Knight in the process. After a while, and a lot of spam, the boss himself will appear. Sometimes he will appear before the doors are all iced up or after, but it really depends on your speed. I really think they should have timed this better, as you can have several friends beating up on the king, which results in the fight having less tension when you're sitting in the back, watching your allies go ham on him. If they balanced it where the first phase was shorter or faster, and made all of the charred and white knights disappear before the fight with the king, I think it could have been a more intense experience. Maybe have a cutscene of the last charred knight getting killed, and it shows the white knights nodding at you before they close the doors. Give it a real sense of, now it's really getting started. But that didn't come to pass. As such, you can wail on the king and use your friends as distractions when you need to heal. When talking about the actual fight with the Burnt Ivory King, I'd say that he's a good boss fight when doing a one-on-one. -on -one. His moves are fairly telegraphed, aren't too cheap with their hitboxes or damage, and he's fast enough to be a threat, but not so fast as to be unbeatable. The sad thing is that this fight can be done too early, thereby ruining everything I just said by spamming charred knights at you, distracting you from the good parts of the fight. This is the reason why I put the fight so low on the quality list of bosses. He is good, but his encounter can be bad. On a lower note, it's interesting how many parallels there are to Gwyn and this king, as they both made their kingdoms from nothing, gave their souls to protect their creations, and that they were both devoured by flame and then killed by the player in the end. The Burnt Ivory King's soul is also different to the other boss's souls. It is represented as a Great Lord's soul, not a Dark Soul like Nishandra, or a generic soul like Ava, and most other bosses. I believe they put this DLC last as a reference to the end of Dark Souls 1 in a way, and so they made parallels between the two games. Anyway, we defeat him and get the crown of the Ivory King, then I'll return to Alsana with the good news. She is grateful and says that she has no regrets now. Then she'll tell you she was born amidst the dark, how her father perished in the abyss, and the dark shattered into pieces, one of which was her. This alludes to her being a child of Manus, father of the abyss, similarly to the other major female characters in the game, such as Nishandra, Nadalia, etc. It's interesting how Alsana was taken in by the Ivory King and wasn't so much a corrupting force like Nishandra was to Vendrick, but rather a faithful servant trying to appease her master. This is a nice change to the way the other Children of Manus have behaved. After you talk to her again, she will say that the Elaeum Lois Knights were swallowed by the chaos, and that their souls still remain. She says she prays for their deliverance, and this lets you know that you can gather the souls of the Charred Knights. This grants you several armor pieces to the Lois set, as well as the Ivory King armor after giving her enough Lois souls. This can be a pain, though, because there are often many of them to deal with, and the drop chance for the Lois soul is not very high. Add that you must bring her 50 for everything mentioned earlier, and it can be quite a grind. But I won't be doing that. Instead, I'm going to shoot Alsana to death so I can take her soul, because players are like the Abyss. All-consuming, always hungry, always wanting more. Killing her takes a while, as she is very far away, and it takes a lot of arrows to kill her. Poison doesn't affect her either, so I have to use up many of my final precious poison arrows. But that doesn't matter since I am near the end of the game. When you finally kill her, she simply says, Oh, my dear lord, showing how she was faithful and true to her lord till the very end. When you kill her, or give her the appropriate amount of loy souls, the ice blocking the stairs will slowly shatter, allowing you to run up the stairs to where Alsana is, or was. After that, I will head toward our final boss encounter of the game. This boss has been missed by several people when reviewing, analyzing, and defending the game, because this boss is quite possibly one of the most frustrating bosses to get to, let alone fight, and even greater still, to kill. This boss and accompanying boss run is one of the biggest stains on Dark Souls 2's reputation, and is easily the absolute worst part of all the DLCs, and quite possibly the worst part of the entire game. I'm talking, of course, about the double cat boss fight against Lud and Zalan. A wise man said, This fight is incredibly difficult to even reach. This is such a terribly long and difficult fight that many won't even try it once they understand the requirements. In order to find the boss, because it is not obvious at all, you will need to wander around the frozen wasteland while being attacked by several demon reindeer that hit hard and have lots of health, slowly making your way until you find an iced bridge leading to the actual boss fight. And should you die, you must repeat it all again, which can be very common as this could possibly be the most difficult fight in the game 
on top of the longest boss run in the game by far. For this final run, I'll be summoning our boy Vengarl and Fiva, as having two summons, one of which can heal you, is a great mediator when dealing with Santa's fallen pets. When it comes to the run itself, there are a few things I would encourage people to do before or during this run. Number one, take your time. Rushing through this area can cause several rain demons to spawn at once, which can be incredibly tough to kill without help. Add that you will have to explore in order to find out where to go, and rushing can be a bad option that will waste time and potentially get you killed by the Holly Jolly Lightning Squad. Number two, stock up on all healing items beforehand. This is the longest boss run in the game, and can easily deplete your resources before the fight with the Twin Kitties. Make sure you have 99 life gems to burn on the reindeer, as you'll need your Estus for the cats. Number three, stop when the storm appears. Now, you can run to each building for cover during the storms to put up with the rain demons, but I've found that it's easier to manage them when you stop every time the storm appears. This storm indicates that the demon deer will spawn, and if you take it slowly, you will usually only have to deal with one Rudolph at a time, two of them max. If you are close to cover, by all means, use it. I'm just saying this works if cover is very far away, as it gives you time to heal any damage taken and minimizes encounters with the lightning stags. Number four, nuke Dancer and Prancer when they appear. The Fiend Reindeer are very agile, so nuking them as soon as they spawn can really save you time and resources. They can be quite damaging if left alive for too long, so I found it's best to keep a heavy hitter on you, like the Crypt Black Sword or the Dragon Tooth. Something very heavy that doesn't deal lightning damage. Save that for the Mighty Kittens. Number five, don't be afraid to burn through your summons on the way to the boss. This is something I wouldn't recommend personally, as I think summons are great to have for this fight, because of how cheap it can get solo. The combo swipe is so bad. But if you are good enough, it can be easier solo since the summons buff the boss's defenses significantly. The bridge near the boss is a great way to kill them off with a bit of shoving or by feeding them to the reindeer from hell. After all that, we've made it and our journey is almost complete. Now begins our final fight. As you can see, Zalin is the lazy one of the two, since Lud is actually fighting us. If you fought Ava beforehand, this will seem very familiar to you. The only real differences are that there are two of them, and they can regenerate health after a certain point. They are both very weak to lightning, which is heavily abusable if you know this beforehand. Feel free to stack those souls and levels into lightning-based combat, as that seems to be extremely overpowered in this game. When it comes to the healing, I find it best to damage through it as much as possible, as quickly as possible. This tends to work well, as the summons may require healing or be dead by this late of a stage into the fight, so you'll want it to end quickly. After defeating them, you get Lud and Zalin's souls, which are copy-pasted souls from Ava, with the names changed. It makes sense since the king had several beasts like this, but this is also really lazy. They could have had a little bit of lore explaining why Ava was guarding his child of dark and the path to him, while Lud and Zalin were just chilling here. That would give more personality to each boss. But after that grueling run, I guess they realized that the players wouldn't care. They probably thought a lot of players wouldn't even find this place, so why put in the effort, right? Anyway, I'll warp out of here and head home since we've finished the DLC. Prepare for our final moments in this game. Now for the farewells to my friends. As you can see, not much changes once you've killed every boss and completed the game. For instance, Chloe-Anne can be murdered next to her father, but he will say nothing of it. He probably knows that she will simply become hollow like him. He is the next to die, and he drops the blacksmith's hammer. Then I will murder Miss Life Gem and Ladder Guy because they don't matter now. Then I'll slay the timid bro in his hut. Now I must find the map maker to end his map making for good. He drops his headpiece after crushing his skull in. One weird thing is that the cat is invincible and can't be killed or moved without cheating, so I must leave her alone. This game really loves cats for some reason. Now I fight this scantily clad Rosabeth, who seems to have the most HP out of everyone. After her, I destroy all remnants and references to the Blue Sentinels. Funnily enough, Crestfallen Saladin is happy to die, as now he is free. Now for the Emerald Herald, 
who forced us to return to Majula every time I wanted to level up, forcing Dark Souls 3 to do the same, and who also directed you down this ridiculous journey to conquer Drenglaic. I can't believe how awkward of a death she gets. She looks so stiff and lifeless as she falls. Yes, she is dead, but make her flail about or something, developers. After that, let's take a look at how far we've come. We see our 273 levels and our massive 19 million soul memory. Take that, Dark Souls 1 hero. I have more than you. You suck. Now I am going to be one with the dark as I end this playthrough. I may be done with the playthrough, but I'm not done talking. Now I'm going to go over some of the major problems that Dark Souls 2 has when you compare it to its predecessors and its sequel. There is a lot to talk about here, as I'm not restrained by background footage, so... Buckle up! I'll be going over these eight major issues in sections. Mechanical changes, level design, difficulty, boss quality, encounter quality, story and lore, marketing and reception, and comparisons to Demon Souls in that order. Then I'll end all this with my final thoughts of the game. Shall we begin? First off are the mechanical changes made to the game. Dark Souls 2 changed the movement by making the regular 360 degree movement we're used to on console into 8 snap points that can seriously hinder movement and lead to many frustrating moments and deaths. This especially looks wonderful when you have to zigzag across the space because the developers couldn't figure out how to make the characters move on par with other games. Next is adaptability and agility messing with your iframes. Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1, and Dark Souls 3 don't have their iframes tied to a levelable statistic. Iframes adjusted depending on your weight in those games. Heavier builds got more iframes because they were slower, but even if they were caught out, they had heavy armor to mitigate some of the damage taken. Lighter builds could roll faster and more easily with less iframes, but they were faster, and they could recover from a roll quicker to do other actions, while being more susceptible to damage if they were tagged. Putting a stat that you can level to give you the base iframes expected, and then it can give you more than the base iframes expected, radically imbalances builds based on the statistic being added. Players will throw several empty levels into this stat to simply get the iframes they are used to, or to get extra iframes because of the annoyances in the game. Let's not forget that they may not even know this exists. This is a reoccurring thing throughout Dark Souls 2, where a problem will be introduced, a solution will be created to counter it, but the initial problem didn't need to exist in the first place. Now let's talk about healing. Healing in Demon Souls was easy to do once you understood your openings and knew where to farm the grass needed to outlast any area or enemy. This, on top of regeneration items, was a major problem for difficulty when you could fight an enemy who nearly kills you and you can just sit and regenerate health with a ring, a shield, or eat one of your hundreds of grass. This was changed into the much more balanced Estus system in Dark Souls 1. Now the developers knew exactly how much healing players would have at the lowest and highest possibilities. This means that they could craft more intricate encounters, where they could balance the difficulty depending on the area, stage of the game, and how many healing items are available to the player at that point. Dark Souls 2 combines both games' healing ideas, which drastically hinders the difficulty when some of the challenge of an area is wondering if you have enough healing to push through to the next checkpoint. Dark Souls' healing system forced you to improve as you played, because your Estus count when reaching a boss was important, so you would learn better ways to deal with the enemies before the boss. It was up to the player to decide to proceed with fewer Estus than they were comfortable with, or to retreat to the last bonfire and try again. This is no longer the case in Dark Souls 2, as you will have a plethora of healing items available after finishing the first real area. Someone who sells 99 holdable, 500 HP regenerating life gems is just one boss away. This, on top of Estus and regeneration items, makes this game the easiest out of all of the games, because you have a million and one ways to get your health back. If you don't believe me, try this strategy the next time you play Dark Souls 2. This was an idea that Mahler came up with that proves several points about the healing in Dark Souls 2, although I'm going to change it slightly. Do as follows. You must level adaptability to cause agility to reach 105 before leveling anything else. You must kill the last giant and talk to the hag before going anywhere else or fighting any other bosses. Make sure the hag relocates to Majula. 
Once this is done, you must level Vigor, Endurance, Strength, Dexterity, etc. at your own discretion, but you cannot farm souls, and you must use your remaining souls each time to purchase life gems, after other expenses of course. Then take the game slowly and carefully. The game will have a hard time killing you from this point on, except for extreme circumstances. The inclusion of life gems isn't the problem, it's how readily available they are. You can use them, farm them, and buy them from directly after the first real area is over. For the rest of the game, you will never have to worry about your healing items, as it takes just under 30,000 souls to bring them back to your maximum amount. This doesn't include farming at all. The Estus still function as well, but you must find them in the world and the cap is 12 instead of 20. This may have been a design oversight, as there were more healing options, but the oversight failed magnificently since you have over 100 healing items on you at a time, that are easy to obtain and restore. Dark Souls 3 seems to have found a sweet spot with its healing, as there is mainly the Estus, capped at 15, but there are also a few regeneration items, but those items take a while to get to or are placed deep into the game, so they aren't easily obtained after the first boss. The healing drastically changes much of the difficulty of the game, which I will cover later. The next mechanical change was the health penalty for dying. You lose some of your maximum health every death until you reach 50% of health at the lowest. 75% if you have the ring reducing the penalty. This is such an annoying gimmick in this game. The fact that the game will punish you for dying when the game itself can murder you in unfair ways makes this a change that I am happy to say didn't carry over to Dark Souls 3. Like several people, Mahler included, I also didn't like this in Demon's Souls. Dark Souls 1 and 3 seem to have a better grasp on what hollowing should penalize you for. Dark Souls 1 limited online features, and Dark Souls 3 limited online features and gave you extra health if you stayed embered, but only if you stayed embered. The offline aspect of Dark Souls 1 and 3 do not hinder you as much as Demon Souls and Dark Souls 2 do. It seems unfair that offline players receive the health penalty if they simply didn't want to play online in Demon Souls, and you can be invaded no matter what in Dark Souls 2, regardless of hollowing. Both games punish you with a similar mechanic, but have different situations produced from this. This makes Demon Souls feel a bit cheap at times, and makes Dark Souls 2 feel overtly punishing towards players. Another change that was made was the durability on weapons being drastically reduced. They refill at bonfires, but why make it where there is a chance that our weapons will break in between bonfires? This is simply another way to produce difficulty by arbitrarily making our weapons weaker and less efficient. There are several other things like bonfires not leveling you up, instant warping between bonfires, having to go to NPCs to upgrade items and level up, etc., but I've already talked about those things in earlier sections, or we'll talk about them later. Now let's move on to the level design in Dark Souls 2. A staple of the Souls series is the interconnectivity of the levels, either between the levels, within them, or both. This is something that Dark Souls 1 is undisputedly the best at, as it is the most complicated map of the four games. Here are charts for all four games when it comes to interconnectivity between levels. As you can see, Demon's Souls is the simplest in terms of level-to-level -level interconnectivity because it is simple. The only area that connects to more than one pathway is the Nexus itself, with each pathway being a straight shot towards the end. Now, the internal interconnectivity of Demon's Souls levels is very strong with several shortcuts throughout every pathway. Dark Souls 1 is an incredibly complicated map to understand, with several areas connected to several other areas. Blight Town on its own connects to the Valley of Drakes, the Depths, the Great Hollow, and the Demon Ruins, while Firelink Shrine connects to the Undead Asylum, Undead Burg, Undead Parish, the Valley of Drakes, kinda, New Londo Ruins, the Catacombs, and to the Kiln of the First Flame. That's a lot. And those areas connect to each other in many ways. There are only a few areas that don't connect to many areas, usually being towards one of the four corners of the world, such as the Duke's Archives, the Tomb of the Giants, Lost Islith, Ash Lake, and the DLC area of Ulysseal. There's quite a lot happening when you have to navigate across this world, because it really is laid out like a world. Dark Souls 2, by comparison to the two previous titles, falls in line with the former's layout more than the latter's. When you compare the maps of the three games, you can clearly see that Dark Souls 2 shares many similarities to Demon's Souls, in that there are several linear routes leading from beginning to end, with few or no branching pathways, or alternative routes available. The most Dark Souls 1 part of Dark Souls 2 is the options available to get to the Lost Bastille. There are two routes that take you through three areas to reach the Lost Bastille, and later Sinners Rise. 
The only other area similar in style is Shaded Woods connecting to the doors of Pharos, Drangleic Castle, and Aldia's Keep. It does connect to the DLC as well, but that doesn't count as physical connectivity like the rest of the game does. If you pay attention to how the developers crafted the game towards pushing you to go to the Lost Sinners pathway first, you can see the inklings of a very Dark Souls 1 type of level design, both internally and level to level. The Forest of Fallen Giants is an area with several shortcuts leading up, down, left, and right through lifts, doors, ladders, and so on. This contrasts with several areas later, like Aldia's Keep, which is a straight shot from the doorway towards the Guardian Dragon, and then up the lift to the Dragon Airy. You can also see this from the level to level angle, where you have the two options at the beginning that expands to five, and then that condenses down into a single linear path where you will go from Drenglaic Castle to Shrine of Amana, then to Undead Crypt, then to Shaded Woods, then to Aldia's Keep, then the Dragonary, then the Dragon Shrine, then the Memory of Jay in the Forest of Fallen Giants, and then you head to Drenglaic Castle to go to the endgame fights. If you want to kill Vendrick and unlock Aldia, you'll add the Undead Crypt just before Drenglaic Castle at the end, but that is the only other option for this part of the game. You either go to 9 areas or go to 10 areas in the exact same order every time. This is nothing like Demon Souls or Dark Souls 1, as they both gave the player options right up until the endgame fights, whereas this is just a straight shot from beginning to end with a minor offshoot for two optional bosses. This gives me the feeling that the developers of Dark Souls 2 weren't sure where to go with the level design after they made the opening areas, and were either too lazy to make the levels afterward more intricate, or were rushed to get all of these areas finished for release. This is something that I think the DLCs hammer home to be true, as each DLC has a myriad of shortcuts and looping passages that you'd expect from a Souls game. When you look at it from a progression standpoint, the opening half of the base Dark Souls 2 gives you plenty of options and several levels still retain shortcuts and multiple paths throughout the levels. The second half of the base game is a straight path through very linear levels with few internal shortcuts that lead you to the throne. Then the DLCs come out and have a myriad of shortcuts and internal interconnectivity again. It's almost as if the developers dropped the ball during the middle of the production of the game, and then rushed those sections for release. I don't know that to be a fact, but this is my reasoning for thinking this way. When we talk about the levels of a game, we tend to judge them based on the aesthetic, and how that aesthetic was implemented into that level. Demon's Souls has a diverse palette of levels, such as dark swamps, cliffside fortresses, underground tunnels, catacombs, prisons, lava hellscapes, and classical castles and cities. Dark Souls 1 shares this same aesthetic palette, with everything previously being mentioned while adding dark forests, snowy ruins, massive archives, crystalline caves, gigantic tree levels, and a massive lake. Dark Souls 2 continues this aesthetic diversity by having several levels similar to the ones just mentioned, while having a particular increase in dragon-themed and poison-themed areas. This is probably the strongest aspect of Dark Souls 2's level design, in that they may not be what we're used to, or what we expect as Souls series gamers, but they definitely went all out to create many different types of levels. The variety of differing levels is probably the highest in Dark Souls 2 compared to the rest of the games, but that isn't enough to carry a game or enough to be heralded as good design. That comes from how well crafted the levels are, not how many different types there are. I'll take 5 well made levels of one type over 20 levels of differing types every time, because the quality will shine through the well made levels while diversity will only get you so far on its own. You don't need diversity to make something good, you need talent and care. How's that for social commentary? One thing that I mentioned several times throughout the playthrough was the prevalence of environmental deaths. This has jumped to 11 in Dark Souls 2 from the previous games, because of the amount of cheap ways to get the player to fall into a pit of death. This is at its worst in places like the gutter with its rickety and breakable walkways, and the Shrine of Amana, with its barely visible outlines for where the abyssal drops actually are. There are others, but those two are the worst offenders to many people. This can be magnified by the amount of enemies when you have to put up with several enemies in a narrow walkway with death pits all around you, which can lead to many an unfair and frustrating death. This overshadows some aspects of the levels that are just outright ridiculous. Several levels or their backgrounds don't match up with each other when compared. Levels in Dark Souls 2 often don't make physical sense. Walking from Hades Tower into No Man's Wharf puts the wharf somewhere below sea level, which shouldn't happen. The Shaded Woods exit into Drenglaic Castle shows the tower of the castle on the left, but after the player walks in a straight line, it will be on the right now. Drenglaic Castle leading into Shrine of Amana makes no sense, as the castle is on a mountain peak, and there is no way a short 30 second elevator ride 
will get you to an area where the ceiling is covered in giant overgrown roots with a massive pit of water below you. The funniest, dumbest, and particularly picked on example is the path from Earthen Peak to the Iron Keep. You get to the top of Earthen Peak after seeing it connect to nothing from outside and find an elevator that takes you up. Shortly after, you emerge in a lava land with mountain volcanoes in every direction. This has crossed over into insanity at this point. Why not make Earthen Peak be a fortress that you make your way down through, and then you find an elevator leading down into a lava-filled cavern? Get rid of the elevator going up, and get rid of the background of mountains and ashy skies. It's doable, but the developers had other plans apparently. Or they were just lazy. Now let's talk difficulty. The Souls series is both lauded and criticized for its high difficulty, but how does each game stack up? Demon Souls had an easily farmable source of healing that you could carry quite a lot of, so I wouldn't call it the hardest game. Some areas and encounters could be challenging, but if you found your openings, you could outlast almost anything. Dark Souls 1 balanced the healing by limiting it to Estus, a few items with strict requirements, all while also being careful to not use too many cheap tactics on players to kill them. Instead, they focused on each encounter and how they could tweak them to be just the right difficulty for a climaxing experience as you progress through the world. You would still have your struggles, but they were rarely a cheap developer trick. Dark Souls 2 retroactively undid the Estus fix from farmable health and gave both to the players who could easily farm or buy them on top of healing items and regeneration gear readily available. That massively imbalanced the healing towards the player's favor, but the encounters became consistently filled with spam, ambushes, bad hitboxes, several one-hit kill moves, and cheap number multipliers to ensure that every encounter would be harder beyond what the norm was for the Souls series. Dark Souls 3 retroactively fixed the issues in Dark Souls 2 by limiting the healing to Estus and a few regeneration items that weren't easy to get. The game also took inspiration from Bloodborne, which was a much more aggressive and faster paced game in comparison to the other From Software games at the time. This made several parts of Dark Souls 3 more difficult by upping the speed that things happen, so you get the speed of Bloodborne combat and the weight of a Souls game encounter. This forced players who hadn't played Bloodborne to adapt to much faster enemies, attack patterns, and actions in general, including myself. The Souls series has had its high points in the difficulty not coming from the number of enemies, their health, their damage, or their speed, but from the way that they fight you. Several bosses in the series that many fans look back on as great fights are great because they are difficult, but fair. Several bosses come to mind that make me remember every time I died to them or took damage because I made a mistake and was punished accordingly for it. Fights like Artorias, Calamit, The Fume Knight, Gale, Nameless King, Soul of Cinder, Abyss Watchers, and Lady Freyda are great because of their design not because of how many enemies they have to help them, how much damage they do per hit, or how much health they have. They are well designed, and they are remembered fondly for the effort the developers put into those bosses. In comparison to many bosses in Dark Souls 2, several of them become annoying because of the way their difficulty is handled. The Royal Rat Authority isn't hard until you have to account for the fast little rats that can 1-2 hit poison you. The Skeleton Lords aren't strong on their own, but when you have to face the 20 skeletons that spawn after them, it can be more difficult. King Vendrick's moveset is simple and easy to deal with, but his defense and offense numbers are insanely imbalanced against the player. He takes significantly reduced damage if you don't have the right amount of a particular item, and his sword strikes can hit for almost 1000 HP per swing. If these things weren't this way, he would just be boring and monotonous. The final showdown of Dark Souls 2 at the Throne of Want has you fighting four bosses in a row. The first two are together. The third has a cheap way to drain your max health bar with a very easy move set besides that, and the final boss has an aura of high damaging flames surrounding him 75% of the fight, while chucking ranged spells and attacks from underground at you. This is ridiculous and a tedious way for the encounters to be difficult by forcing players into a scenario where you have to fight several bosses in a row without warning that all have cheap methods to make the encounters more difficult or lengthy. This can easily dwindle your resources before you reach the end, and kill off your summons before you finish all the fights. Talking about the encounters with the normal enemies throughout the world, spam and ambushes are abundant, and the developers relied on this strategy far too much in Dark Souls 2. Most instances of difficulty in the normal encounters will deal with several enemies with high numbers, cheap combos, constant tracking, or unbalanced stats. Sometimes they will do this all at once. This is a lazy and unfair way to create a challenge, 
as every other game in the Souls series, was all about challenging the players. Demon Souls, Dark Souls 1, and Dark Souls 3 challenged players, while Dark Souls 2 tries to actively murder you often, no matter the cost. The amount of deaths from platforms falling out from under you, enemies spamming you in tight spaces, and cheap insta-kills make playing Dark Souls 2 a frustrating experience if you aren't aware of what to do, or makes it a tedious grind once you understand what the developers are doing. You find out that they're spamming you, so you swipe at the horde, back away, then repeat. Or you bait out the ambush and knock them down after they leave themselves open. This was rare in the other games, and thank Gwyn that this overabundance of spam didn't infect Dark Souls 3's design. At least not too much. When mentioning the bosses, arguably the highlights of each game, there are several instances where Dark Souls 2 falls short. The game has almost double the boss fights of Demon's Souls, Dark Souls 1, and Dark Souls 3, but half of them are boring, monotonous, cheap, or simply terribly made. This illustrates to me that the developers of Dark Souls 2 were trying to make as many bosses as they could to help market the game, instead of focusing on the quality of those boss fights. Some of these bosses wouldn't be as bad as they are if the team hadn't made so many of them. If one or two bosses are bad compared to the rest, that's okay. The better bosses will make up for it in the overall experience. When every other boss is bad, that will make players think the game is trash. Talking of the bad bosses of the series, Demon Souls had a few bosses along the path to Maiden Astraea that some could see as terrible or lackluster. Leechmonger and the Dirty Colossus are, arguably, the worst bosses of the game because of their spastic movement or simple movesets. This also accounts for the bosses that are supposed to be easy, like the final boss, the real King Alant, before the end of the game. Most of Dark Souls 1's weaker bosses were found in the Demon Ruins and Lost Isolith. Ceaseless Discharge has cheap ways to kill you by spamming fire through walls while they never fix the bug that lets you insta-kill him. I'm still not even sure it's a bug as it remained in the remaster of the game. The Demon Fire Sage is the third Asylum Demon you'll find in the game, which is a small change to its moveset and color palette. The Centipede Demon has the most spastic attacks in the game, and its arena can cheaply kill you by burning you very quickly. The final boss of that path, the Bed of Chaos, is the worst boss in the game, because it can throw you off into a pit of death. The only redeeming feature to the Bed of Chaos is that it saves your progress if you die, so you don't have to redo the entire boss fight. That's four bad bosses in a row. This is interesting to me, as this area is the most boss stuffed of any of the four Lord Soul pathways, and yet all the bosses are bad for one reason or another. The only bad bosses in Dark Souls 3, in my eyes, are Yorm and the Gravetender. The Gravetender, because it spams several fast and spastic dogs at you, including the big one, while Yorm is what I would call a botched gimmick, as it's already been done in Demon's Souls, and it was much more balanced in the earlier game than in the later game. Yorm becomes the easiest or hardest boss depending on your knowledge of the item in the room. This is such a cheap way to foster a unique fight when it really just creates a boss that players can be stuck on if they don't think that picking up the item is a good idea before defeating the boss, let alone reading its description and equipping it. Staying with Dark Souls 3 for just a few more moments, the Ancient Wyvern could also be put as a bad boss, as the drop attack can sometimes not work correctly, leading to a fall to the death which is completely out of control of the player, but that is more a bug than a bad design choice. Dark Souls 2 bosses lean towards one of three different types of fights. Dudes in armor, spam, or tedium. Sometimes you'll get a combination of all three. Seriously, think about how many bosses are just dudes in armor or the equivalent. The Lost Sinner, The Pursuer, Dragon Rider, Old Dragon Slayer, The Ruin Sentinels, Twin Dragon Riders, The Looking Glass Knight, The Congregation, The Skeleton Lords, Velstat, Vendrick, Throne Watcher and Defender, Dark Lurker, The Gank Squad, Alon, The Fume Knight, and The Burnt Ivory King are all humanoids in armor or something close. That's not including bosses that have a vaguely humanoid shape, such as the Smelter Demon, the Last Giant, the Giant Lord, Nishandra, and Alana. All of those bosses make up 23 of the 41 bosses in the game. You'll spend half of the boss fights in the game against a humanoid with varying abilities, while still very much retaining similar combos of thrusts, slashes, slams, and spells. Now, before you say I'm hating on Dark Souls 2 for having a lot of humanoid fights, I'll break down the other games by this same metric. Demon Souls had 7 bosses out of the 18 that were humanoid in shape. The Fool's Idol, the Old Monk, the Tower Knight, the Penetrator, Old King Alant, the Old Hero, and Maiden Astraea. Dark Souls 1 had 8 bosses out of 26 that were humanoid. Gwyn, Gwendolyn, Artorias, 
the Iron Golem, Ornstein and Smo, Priscilla, the Four Kings, and the Capra Demon. Some wouldn't count Capra because he's a demon, but I do, since he's a dude up to the neck and tailbone. Dark Souls 3 had 16 bosses out of its 25 that were humanoid. Eudix Gunder, Vort, the Crystal Sages, the Deacons of the Deep, Sullivan, Dancer, Dragon Slayer, Champion Gunder, Nameless King, the Abyss Watchers, Yorm, the Twin Princes, Soul of Cinder, Sister Freyda, Half-Light, and Gale are all humanoid. Champion's Grave Tender has a human in it, but the fight is mostly animals with the wolves, so I didn't count that fight. Dark Souls 3 has the highest percentage of humanoid fights in these games, but Dark Souls 2 has the highest number of them. The overall amount of humanoid fights has increased as the series went on, with the raw amount or percentage increasing, or both. Dark Souls 1, however, was more balanced, with 31% of its fights being against humanoids, 23% being against animals or animal-like monsters, and the other 46% were of varying design. This was the most balanced of the games towards boss variety, not only in their design, but in their individual aesthetics as well. This keeps the game fresh along with each fight having its own unique set of strengths and weaknesses. This is interesting to think about the increase in armored humanoid fights because of the reception to a particular fight from Dark Souls 1. It's no stretch to say that Artorias is one of the most beloved fights in the Souls series. You can enjoy it because of the fight itself, which is very well made, or from the lore around Artorias, causing many to shed a tear at what happened to him and Sif, as well as what you do to the two of them. Is Artorias the best fight in Dark Souls 1? Personally, it's hard to say. However, I would put him in the top tier of bosses from that game. But this isn't the main reason I bring him up here. It's because of his impact on the Souls series that matters most. It's no surprise that From Software listened to the impact of Artorias, and quickly rushed to capitalize on the one-on-one -on -one duel with the knight idea that the Artorias fight was. This is one reason why I believe a lot of fights in later games became more humanoid focused. The amount of one-on-one -on -one fights with a knight of some kind in Dark Souls 2 jumped from 3 in Dark Souls 1 to 9 in the sequel. Dark Souls 3 went down to 8, but the numbers still drastically increased since Artorias was released. Demon's Souls had two that met this criteria, so it's increased overall, but since Artorias, the spike has been more noticeable. Now, some people may have a problem with this, and say that I simply don't like humanoid fights, or I don't like them trying to replicate the Artorias fight that so many fanboy over. You're wrong. Several of my favorite bosses are humanoid, and have that aesthetic to some degree. Ornstein and Smo, Gwyn, Artorias, the Fume Knight, Alon, the second phase of the Burnt Ivory King, the Nameless King, the Soul of Cinder, and Slave Knight Gale are all some of my favorite fights from the series. The Nameless King and Gale are my two favorite fights from Dark Souls 3, and are very different encounters. I don't simply like something for the way it looks or acts. I appreciate that as a layer on top of strong design. I could fight Minecraft Steve, and if the boss fight was well telegraphed, had good hitboxes, had no cheap moves, and was interesting enough, I'd love it all the same, because it's well made first and foremost. It'd be a meme that you fight Steve Souls, but that's beside the point. What I'm getting at with all this talk of humanoid bosses is how similar they can be in the wrong hands. Dark Souls 2 made several humanoid bosses with similar movesets. This makes several of the bosses fight in similar styles, and as such, have similar exploits and strategies. This makes the boss fights feel very repetitive, and can bore players when we feel like we've fought the same boss five times in a row. Now, it's not certain that players would fight a lot of these types of bosses in a row, but there are quite a lot of them anyway, so we'd still end up fighting the same type of boss over and over, directly or indirectly, throughout the game. This is not the only problem with the bosses either. Several bosses rely on other means to make them unique or difficult. One common way is through having the player deal with multiple enemies. In the best case scenario, this would be like the Ruin Sentinel fight, which has multiple opponents, but they won't spam you unless you make poor decisions. In the worst case scenario, this turns into the Congregation, the Rat Vanguard, the Rat Authority, Skeleton Lords, etc., where the game just puts you in an arena with many enemies and then forces you to deal with them. This can be extremely annoying in certain places, as you will be engulfed with enemies which usually ends with the same strategy used on them. Swipe at the Horde, back away, and repeat. This makes these fights feel like a joke, since we've had other bosses that work far better at providing a challenge through individuals with tough movesets, or by multiple enemies that have complementary combinations, or other aspects to the fight that allow for a challenging fight that is still fair. Two great examples of these are Ornstein and Smo and Calamite from Dark Souls 1. Ornstein and Smo have a tortoise and the hare dynamic, 
so you will have to deal with the fast and agile one, or the slow and tough one first. Add that this boss fight can change depending on who you kill first, and this can produce interesting results when fighting them with different strategies. This fight adds a layer to the multiple boss strategy, as you can't swipe at both of them until they are both dead. The survivor of the two becomes stronger as a result of the other's death. This gives the player options, and can help dictate the difficulty of the fight during the second phase, because you know which one is tougher for you to deal with, and lets you choose which one's soul you want to grab from this fight, as you only get the one you killed last. This keeps the fight fresh, as you are given options each playthrough, and can lead to different strategies during the first phase. You can lure Ornstein away from Smo, or use Smo's golden fat rolls to block Ornstein, depending on your skill and patience. This creates balance while keeping the player on their toes, as they have to account for two different enemies that will only kill you if you aren't careful, or if you are indecisive about which one you want to kill first. Calamite, on the other hand, is difficult on his lonesome, because he is a very aggressive boss with a wide moveset. He has several fire-breathing attacks, swipes, charges, and a buff he can apply that will double the damage you take if hit. He is also an intelligent boss. He will usually do one of the moves that would make sense for a dragon to do if the player is in a certain position. If you are directly in front of him, you will swipe. If you are behind him, expect a tail swipe or slam. If you are near him at all, expect the possibility of an aerial bombardment of fire. If you are a decent distance away from him, he may do one of his fire-breathing moves, either straight ahead or sweeping across his front at an angle, or he may do his flying charge. My favorite move of his is when he charges you and immediately spins around with a fire breath sweep that can catch several players off guard. This is a very smart move to do if you were Calamite. This could hit the player once with the charge, twice with the charge and the fire breath, or could catch them from behind with just the fire breath. An intelligent move and a difficult move to avoid all damage from. Overall, it's no wonder that an Orlando didn't want to make an enemy of him. Getting back to the point of this rant, Ornstein and Smo are an example of a good multiple enemy fight, while Calamite is a good example of a single enemy fight. This is to illustrate that whatever the developers did for Dark Souls 1 to make both fights challenging but still fair was lost in Dark Souls 2 for one reason or another. It's clear that some bosses were lazily cobbled together through a search for assets in order to make bosses quickly. The Congregation fight has the Prowling Magus, which is just an Aldia Warlock repurposed for this fight. The zombies are from several areas, most notably from Harvest Valley, and the Hollow Priests are simple zombies that just go pew every little bit. You see what I did there? Pew? Because Congregation? Fine, I'll stop. Anyway, the two rat bosses are easily two of the worst in the game for many reasons, but mainly for the spam. The rat vanguard has you kill a bunch of rats that you've already seen throughout the area, but then they really shake things up by making you kill another rat with... a mohawk. That's not lazy or stupid at all, is it? The rat authority has a giant rat dog thing with tiny little poison rats that are just there to poison and stun you while the big one tries to crush you. The Skeleton Lords are just three bigger skeletons that die and spawn smaller skeletons, with several of those smaller skeletons being assets from earlier. Add that they also spawn wheel skeletons, and you can imagine how annoying this encounter can get. Some of the worst bosses also come from repeating other bosses that exist in the series. The Smelter Demon was repurposed from the Iron Keep to the Broom Tower, Ava was repurposed for the Lud and Zalan fight, Dragon Rider was doubled for the Twin Dragon Rider fight with one getting a bow to use, a Velstack clone was repurposed as one of Elana's summons, and, worst of all, the Belfry Gargoyles are almost directly lifted from the Bell Gargoyles from Dark Souls 1. Not even joking. Their soundtrack, moveset, and aesthetic are directly duplicated from Dark Souls 1, but now there are six of them, more of them will breathe fire at once, and you can have more than two of them on you at a time. Isn't that amazing, guys? Isn't it amazing that we get to fight this boss again, but now there are more Gargoyles, more fire, and we have the same soundtrack? Isn't that just what you wanted? This repeating of enemies and even bosses shows me that they were willing to do whatever was necessary to make as many bosses as possible, no matter how forced or terribly made they were. Another aspect to these boss fights is the advent of self-healing bosses. Throne Watcher and Defender can resurrect each other as many times as they want until you kill them both. Mytha can heal from the Outer Ring of Poison in her arena, or throughout the entire arena if you didn't drain it of poison. Blood and Zalan get an effect after one of them is killed, where they will enrage and regenerate some health. The Fume Knight gains health from the four Ashen Idols surrounding his arena. These kinds of healing tactics are better served by giving the bosses more health in the first place. Don't give them infinite healing or resurrections unless you're planning to do something interesting with it. 
Dark Souls 3 had the Twin Princes fight, where Lothric would continually revive Lorien, but Lorien couldn't revive Lothric. This meant that you would try to hit Lothric during the pause between Lorien's active state, or hit Lothric on Lorien's back. This created a dynamic that wasn't infinite unless you were too stupid to try and hit Lothric while he was down. This fight is an improved version of Throne Watcher and Defender, but with some obvious differences. One thing that can be quite annoying in boss fights is when you are grabbed by a move that will instantly kill you. The Rotten immediately comes to mind, as his grab can kill several players if they don't have high enough HP, which is entirely possible because of the relatively short run to his area. Similar things can happen when bosses have combos that can leave you stunned during the full combo. Vendrick is probably one of the worst cases of this, as he hits massively and has a 3 swipe combo that can deal about 3000 HP if you don't dodge it. The Ancient Dragon is the epitome of cheapness, as his fire breath attacks last forever, so if you're caught out during it, be ready for the run back to him. If not, then his drop on you should kill you in one hit. He is a 10 ton dragon, but still, that's pretty cheap given what we can normally deal with in this series. This is nothing compared to one thing that Dark Souls 2 suffers from extensively, at least the previous things you can see coming. I'll give you a hint. It starts with hit, and ends with boxes. The hitboxes in Dark Souls 2 feel like they were done by a group of amateurs compared to what came before. Some are the sloppiest hitboxes I've seen in games in general, and I've seen laggy Call of Duty kills. This is a serious problem with several enemies as they will have cheap moves, spam, high damage, and grabs on top of terrible hitboxes. This is one thing that can feel incredibly unfair to the player, when you dodge a strike and it hits you from 3 feet away anyway. This is ridiculous to put up with because once you know which enemies have bad hitboxes, you'll do your best to cheese them or use cheap tactics against them. This makes the game feel like a series of what is the exploit I can use this time on an enemy, since you'll be trying to avoid total contact with them since they were made so roughly and without any kind of accuracy. Now that I've gone over the bosses, let's move on to the regular enemy encounters. These are not much better than the bosses. Spam is apparent, as was said earlier, and will usually be within tight spaces, so be ready for a bottleneck strategy, or be prepared to circle strafe a group of enemies while slowly slapping away at the crowd. Swipe at the swarm, run, repeat. Ambushes are abundant, as was also previously mentioned, and will often lead to a death. Several areas come to mind when it comes to ambushes locking the player in a position where the only way out is death. Undead Crypt has the ambush of four floating dudes while also dealing with the seven Dwemer enemies. By the way, these jerks respawn on you without touching a bonfire. There are also several areas throughout the DLCs where ambushes can do massive or fatal damage to you. Dropping down into one area with several enemies waiting in the ash of the broom tower can lead to a great time. The fight at the nearby tower also leads to several terrible ambushes of all manners of enemies of that DLC. We'll also talk about the phantom ambush just before finishing your first cycle of Alay and Lois, where a barrel will backstab you with enough damage to kill. But that was the simple stuff. Now we're on to more interesting ways the game creates difficulty. One being straight cheating. Shrine of Amana is the one on trial for this, for a reason that was mentioned in its respective section. The casters can attack you from miles away. This is ridiculous, but isn't the only instance of the game trying to murder you by any means necessary. The environment itself will often try to kill you via high drops, poison, cursed pots, platforms giving way under your weight, or the all-encompassing drops into nothingness. Shrine of Amana has several instances of nearly invisible drops hidden by the water that can barely be seen without a light or torch handy. This is such a cheap way to kill you that they created an area just for this. Can you guess which one? The gutter is effectively Blighttown 2.0, while Blighttown was the Valley of Defilement 2.0, I guess. In a way, Farron Keep is the gutter 2.0, or Blighttown 3.0, or the Valley of Defilement 4.0. Anyway, the gutter and Black Gulch are some of the more extreme areas when it comes to the cheapness used in the game. Both have edges where you can fall to your death, and both have poison used throughout because of the statues, but the gutter is usually forgotten after a while, since there's really no reason to go through it again except to get Havel set after you get the key in Black Gulch. There aren't any bosses, and there isn't any significant storyline or NPC or Covenant down there. There's only Havel set. It makes me think that this area was patchworked in after they needed something connecting the Grave of Saints to Black Gulch, and they didn't find a way to squeeze a boss in, or they didn't feel like putting one in. Kind of weird how this is the only area without a boss and a game littered with them.
Now let's talk about the story and the lore of this game. This is going to be complicated, as the Soul series stories and lore are hard to understand unless you read the wiki or watch a well-constructed video on YouTube about it. The basic story of Dark Souls 2 is that a kingdom was ruled by Vendrick, and once Nashandra became his queen, she convinced him to search for more power, specifically from the giants over the seas. They conquered and enslaved the giants, and used them to create the golems, and with them, they built Drangleic Castle. Then the giants retaliated and laid siege to Vendrick's kingdom for many years, slowly destroying the kingdom. After a long period of time passes, the bearer of the curse, the player, shows up and is guided through the ruins of Vendrick's kingdom by the Emerald Herald. The player then takes power from the old ones that litter the kingdom, and eventually make it to Vendrick in the Undead Crypt, where we see that he has gone hollow. After that, we make a journey to talk to the Ancient Dragon, in order to get the Ashen Mist Heart, which allows the player to go into a memory of a giant, and kill the Giant Lord. Afterwards, we go to the Throne of Want, where Nishandra will meet us and try to kill us. After defeating her, we take the throne so this whole situation can play out once more. Not to mention how we don't actually link a fire, we just sit in a rock chair in Jesus' tomb. Did you see how quickly this deteriorated? The main problem I've found with this story is that there is no driving force to do anything. Things just happen, and you progressively unlock more until it's over. It's very mechanical in nature. You did A, so now B unlocks. After that, C unlocks, and so on. There isn't as much of a narrative as the previous game. In Dark Souls 1, Oscar set the player free from the Undead Asylum, and mentioned that if you are undead, you have a fate. If you want to know what it is, then you need to ring the Bell of Awakening. Once you leave and make it to Firelink Shrine, you learn from the Crestfallen Warrior that there are actually two Bells of Awakening. After ringing them both, you find a visitor at the shrine, Frampt. He tells you that your fate is succeeding Gwyn, linking the fire and undoing the curse of the undead. He pushes you to find the Lord Vessel in An Orlando afterwards. Once you retrieve the Lord Vessel, he will bring you to the altar before the kiln of the first flame. Then he will tell you of the four beings who possess fractions of Gwyn's soul. Seath, the Four Kings, Nito, and the Bed of Chaos. After retrieving all four fragments, he then tells you to succeed Gwyn and link the fire. You make your way to Gwyn and defeat him. After that, canonically, you link the fire and the new Age of Fire begins anew, starting the cycle over. Do you see how you had people guiding you and telling you what needs to be done? Oscar gets you to seek the Bells of Awakening. The Crestfallen Warrior informs you of the two bells and where they are. Frampt guides you to the Lord Vessel, to the Four Great Souls, and to Gwyn at the Kiln of the First Flame. There are people actively driving you to do things, instead of saying something vague about the king or the inhabitants of the land and expecting you to figure it out yourself. The Emerald Herald doesn't guide you like Oscar or Frampt do, or Koth, if you talk to him. The Green Hood doesn't do much besides say, there's a thing that exists, seek it. Then she'll tell you, here's a new thing, seek this now. Then, once you reach the throne, she says, I'm Shanelot, by the way, seek the throne, but Nashandra won't like that. It seems like they were trying to create a mysterious figure with the Emerald Herald, but ended up with an NPC where half her lines of dialogue are vague and useless nonsense. It's not good guidance to just drop a name and tell the player to seek it. The game will do that anyway, just because of how limited games are and how linear they can be. So this doesn't do anything beyond tell you that there is a king you can find. Oscar and Frampt gave you reasons to search for the Bells of Awakening, why you should want to succeed Gwyn and Link the Fire, and they gave you motivation. Granting Oscar's dying wish is a motivator to find the Bells of Awakening, as that is the best way to repay him for setting you free, and this can be seen as one of the main driving forces in the game narratively. The other is curing the curse of the undead. Since Oscar would have gone on this quest, you feel like you're doing what he wanted to do, and fulfilling his mission in his stead. You also have the curse, so you might want to cure it. Let's not mention how Dark Souls 1 is paced compared to the sequel. Dark Souls 1 gives you one objective after another, and tells you what to do next regularly. When you look at it from a progression standpoint, the first objective, Ring the Bell of Awakening, takes you out of the Undead Asylum, the tutorial of the game, and brings you to Firelink Shrine. With that, you've completed 4% of the game, roughly. Then the objective is updated to Ringing Two Bells of Awakening, which takes you through four areas, three if you have the Master Key and use the shortcut to Blighttown, and once you complete that, you've done about 20% of the game so far. After that, you talk to Frampt and are tasked with finding the Lord Vessel. You overcome Sen's Fortress and An Orlando and retrieve the Lord Vessel from Guinevere. We'll assume you did enter the painted world of Ariamis before leaving An Orlando. Once you return to Frampt, he will take you to the entrance of the Kiln of the First Flame and guide you towards retrieving the Lord Souls from their four guardians. At this point, you've completed roughly 32% of the game. This is where the fun begins. 
Now you have to venture into the four corners of the world in order to find all four Lord Souls. This means going through the Duke's archives and Crystal Cave for Seath's Lord Soul, then the Demon Ruins and Lost Isolith for the Bed of Chaos Lord Soul, then Darkroot Garden, potentially Darkroot Basin and the Valley of Drakes, and Yolanda Ruins to acquire the Four Kings Lord Soul, and finally the trek down through the Catacombs and the Tomb of the Giants for Nito's Lord Soul. Once you've done all that, you have completed roughly 76% of the game. You may be asking why only 76%, since the killing of the first flame is the next objective, and that leads to the end of the game. This is because we haven't accessed some of the other areas that are completely optional and off the beaten track. These areas include the three DLC areas, Ulusil Sanctuary, Ulusil Township, and Ulusil Dungeon, as well as the Great Hollow and Ash Lake. The path to Ash Lake is completely optional, but does give access to several upgrade items in the Great Hollow, and a Covenant and a particular questline's end in Ash Lake. If you complete all the areas mentioned after getting the Lord Souls, and then make your way to Gwyn, you will have completed 96% of the game before succeeding Gwyn, resulting in the 100%. Now, that isn't 100% of the content of the game. This is just looking at it from an area-to-area -area progression view. Dark Souls 2, on the other hand, has you complete the tutorial, things betwixt before reaching Majula, and then gives you a lot to do before you can complete the next objective. After making it to Majula, reaching 3% of the game's content by area-to-area -area progression standards, you will be told to seek the four Old Ones and the King. No clear-cut objective except to seek five things. Once you complete this task, you have gone through a large portion of the game's areas. To get to the Lost Sinner's Old One Soul, you'll have to go to the Forest of Fallen Giants or Hades Tower of Flame, probably doing the Cathedral of Blue as well, and No Man's Wharf in order to reach the Lost Bastille. Once there, you may do the Belfry Luna and reach Sinner's Rise to obtain the Old One Soul from the Sinner. To get the Old Iron King's Old One Soul, you'll have to progress through Huntsman's Copse, probably do Undead Purgatory, you'll do Harvest Valley, Earthen Peak, Iron Keep, and possibly Belfry Soul. This will also give access to the Fire DLC shortly after retrieving the Old Soul. We'll be sticking to the base game for now, though. To get to the Rotten's Old One Soul, you will progress through the Grave of Saints, the Gutter, and Black Gulch. This will also give access to the Poison DLC. To reach Freya's Old Soul, yes, I know it's not really hers, but let's move past that, you'll need to go through Shaded Woods, the Doors of Pharos, and Brightstone Cove Seldora. Now we have all four Old One Souls. When you do the math on this, assuming you did all the optional areas except the DLCs along these pathways, we have just completed 70% of the game by the same metric used for Dark Souls 1. Our second objective takes up almost two-thirds of the game. Technically, we aren't even done with the second objective either, as we haven't found the king yet. We still have to go through Drangland Castle, which also opens up the Ice DLC, Shrine of Amana, and Undead Crypt before we complete that. With that done, we're up to 80% of the game. After we find the king, we'll get our next objective to reach Aldia's Keep. By the way, we aren't told this, it's just available now because of the king's ring. If you were hoping for a hint of where to go next, sucks to be you right now. After making it through Aldia's Keep and up to the Dragonary, we'll be hinted toward interacting with the Ancient Dragon. At this point, we're at 83% of the game's areas reached. Once we make it up to the Ancient Dragon, after going through the Dragonary and the Dragon Shrine, we'll move to our next objective to enter the Memories of the Giants and defeat the Giant Lord. Again, this is not told to us. 90% now. We'll return to the Forest of Fallen Giants and defeat the Giant Lord. 90% still based on our metric. Then we'll do each of the DLCs, and then we've gotten 96% of the areas just before the end. We'll come back to Drang Lake Castle to get our final objective from the Green Hood, put Nishandra to rest. Once this is done, we've finished the game and, canonically, link the fire once again. That's not a very balanced experience, as you can tell. As I said earlier, this is almost inverted to Dark Souls 1. The progression per objective in Dark Souls 1 was 4% to 20% to 32% to 76% to 96% to 100%, including exploring and doing the other areas before the end game. The game expanded as it went on, slowly giving players more and more to do and explore. Dark Souls 2 was 3% to 80% to 83% to 90% to 96% to 100%, including exploring everything a pathway had before moving on and doing the DLC areas before the end game. This game is massive in the beginning, and then limits it to one objective after another, going through a few new areas and some old ones until you finish the game. As I mentioned earlier, it feels like the developers rushed the latter half of the base game because of the lack of content from the main path available. 
Also, is it just me, or did Dark Souls 2 decide to tell the player to do next to nothing throughout the game? And did Dark Souls 2 only tell you something else when you did something that you weren't told to do earlier? This isn't open-ended. This is poorly organized and poorly paced. Demon Souls and Dark Souls 3 objectives were open-ended. In Demon Souls, you are sent to the Nexus after dying, and are told to defeat the Archdemons to stop the fog. Once that is done, you go to the end of the game, and make your choice to help the Maiden in Black, or kill her. In Dark Souls 3, you show up and are told to return the Four Lords of Cinder to their thrones. Once that is completed, you are told to link the fire. It's just the main game, and then the end. They are both clear-cut, and don't have any vague objectives that aren't told to you. The only exceptions are the DLC to Dark Souls 3, Arch Dragon Peak, and Smoldering Lake, as they are optional. One thing that makes the lore, the stories, and the world feel more artificial in Dark Souls 2 is the lack of unique interactions and quests with the NPCs of the world. Almost every NPC is there for the player in some respect, unlike in the previous games, where they all had their own purpose and goals. In Dark Souls 1, you could help NPCs on their quests, and would often see their lives end in some form of hollowing as you get closer to the endgame. The crestfallen warrior goes hollow and can be found near the entrance to the New Londo Ruins, where he will be hostile. Siegmar will be led to a point where his daughter Siglind has to find and kill him to prevent him from getting into trouble. Big Hat Logan can be found in Sen's Fortress, and he will appear at Firelink Shrine, and then the Duke's Archives in his pursuit of the Pale Drake's knowledge. If you buy all his spells after releasing him from the giant cage, he will go hollow and try to emulate Seath in the area where you first encountered Seath. He will be hostile and nearly naked, as he has gone insane trying to understand Seath's magic. There are many others in Dark Souls 1, but the one that has depressed the fanbase the most is Solaire's journey. He starts off as a helpful and hopeful knight, looking to find his own son. He is a proponent of jolly cooperation, and so will join you in several boss fights in the game, until one of two endings happen to him. You will see him in Undead Burg, an undead parish near the Sunlight Altar, as a summon for the Bell Gargoyle fight, as a summon for the Gaping Dragon fight, you'll see him at the bonfire just after the snipers in Anne Orlando, as a summon for the Ornstein and Smo fight, as a summon for the Centipede Demon fight, at the bonfire just after the centipede demon, near the shortcut back where he can be hostile if the sunlight maggots are not killed before he gets there, and finally, if he was saved at Lost Isolith, he can be summoned for the final fight with Gwyn. His final encounter is depressing either way you do it, as he will have been possessed by the sunlight maggot, making him go insane and become hostile to you if you didn't save him. Or, if you killed the maggots, he will be depressed at being unable to find the sun he has been searching for. He does potentially get to see a son of his own, as he can accompany you to the fight with Gwyn if he is saved. If you link the fire, could that count? Since he disappears after the fight, this is just a theory of what could have happened. It's interesting to know that Solaire is the first summon available, and the last one of the game, if saved that is. Unlike the first, very few NPCs have any weight to their situations in Dark Souls 2. Most of them talk about their history, give some lore of the land, and some will warp to Majula afterwards where they will remain until New Game Plus. Several of them serve some kind of mechanical purpose, but that doesn't restrict their identity or their goals. First off, I will give a pass to the following individuals, as they need to be stationary for one reason or another. The Emerald Herald needs to stay put because we'd like to level without having to track her down. Lenegrast and Macduff are blacksmiths, so they need to be in their workshops. Vengarl's just ahead, so yeah. Ornifex and Strayed are boss weapon vendors, so they can stay where they are except Strayed should really move somewhere less annoying. Grandal can stay where he is, as he is needed to open the pathways to Dark Lurker. Lycia can stay for similar reasons for opening Huntsman's Copse, if you don't have miracles. All the Covenant leaders, like Saldan, the Bellkeepers, Targray, Tichy, the Rat King, and Magarold are fine to remain where they are. Pate and Creighton also get a pass, somewhat, because they're actually out doing things. For every other NPC, they need to get up and get a life. Seriously, the other NPCs in this game are the most submissive people in the Souls series towards the player. They don't do anything of significance narratively after moving to Majula, they just give some backstory, sit there, and become vendors for items or for other purposes. A great example of this is Cloanne. She is Lenegrast's daughter, and he is clearly happy to see her and have her at Majula, where he can keep an eye on her. He tells you this, and she makes comments about how Lenegrast looks like her father. They help each other mechanically because Cloanne is an ore vendor, and Lenegrast is a blacksmith. This makes it easy to buy the ore you need and upgrade it right there and then, which is good mechanically. They both talk about each other, they both work well together, but they never talk to each other, 
or mention interacting or anything like that. It's like the developers made a story and cut out the final act of their arc. The other NPCs should have free reign to move around while still being of use to the player. This is one thing that really bothered me after playing through the game a few times and noticing that the NPCs don't do much after they arrive in Medulla. Melentia just becomes a life gem vendor after leaving the forest of fallen giants. Cloan just becomes an ore vendor after making it to Medulla. Carhelion becomes the token sorcery vendor, and Rosabeth becomes the token pyromancy trainer once they make it to Medulla. Rosabeth doesn't even need to exist, as Carhelion can teach pyromancies. Kinda funny how the stripper is easily replaced. Kale just chills in the basement of the Medulla mansion and forgets who he is after a while. The cat doesn't move or do anything besides poke fun at your existence or position in the world, and sells a few rings of interest. They have their backstories and are vendors, but they don't have quests or any change after moving to the hub. They are doing their own thing, and then you talk to them. They meet you at Majula and never move afterwards. They'll offer you items, but that's all they do. They don't do anything else most of the time. Lycia, Lucatiel, Peyton, and Creighton at least had unique quests and encounters for them, however poorly constructed they were. They still did something. Pate and Creighton's questline is probably the biggest experiment in this game as these two are led to fight, and you can side with one when the time comes. It's not as one-sided as the Loud Trek vs. Firekeep request from Dark Souls 1. Pate and Creighton were set up to fight, but we weren't given enough to care about either of them, or to feel anything when we found them fighting. They have both been abrasive and a bit secretive from us. This isn't like Solaire or Laurentius or Domnal, where they are NPCs that provide valuable services and are pleasant to be around. This is something that Dark Souls 2 seems to have split between the NPCs, some are vendors, some are summons, some have quests, but their personalities don't really play into any of this. Solaire was helpful and friendly and actually helped the player fight bosses. Laurentius was probably the nicest NPC in Dark Souls 1, and he was a valuable vendor and trainer for pyromancy. Domnal was a vendor that could trade you special armor and was very friendly and polite whenever you interacted with him. Are you noticing a pattern? They have their mechanical purposes, but they have personalities that impact their functionality and their stories in a positive light. The deaths of Solaire and Laurentius hit players harder than others because they were helpful, likable, and suffered terrible ends resulting in them feeling like companions that you lost along the way. I don't care about Creighton or Pate after their questline is over. Pate was a traitorous thief, and Creighton is consumed with hatred and a single-minded need for revenge. That is motivation, but not character, and that is why these characters are dull and unlikable for the majority of Dark Souls 2. A few are fine, but they are often retreads of previous NPCs. Malin is basically Domnal, or they get no resolution to their quests or stories, Lucatiel in particular. This is nothing compared to the parallels between Dark Souls 1 and 2's stories and themes. The themes are almost exactly the same, but with several NPCs blurting out said themes at random in the sequel. Straight goes over the obvious thing that Drenglaic once stood where his kingdom did ages ago, and that stood where Lordran once stood. The rising and falling of kingdoms and arrows was more subtle and less amateurly done in the original Dark Souls. Dark Souls 2 has a bad habit of telling you directly what is happening or telling you nothing concrete. The opening cutscene and the hags and things betwixt are almost a parody of what players say the game is. They go on and on about dying and losing your souls while saying a bunch of stuff that doesn't make sense around that. NPCs will talk about death and losing your souls, and there is a literal player death counter in Majula, but the final encounter with Nishandra doesn't really explain why you or she is there. The game can't decide to be completely vague or blatantly obvious about things. It flip-flops between the two regularly, and this results in a confusing narrative as you can't understand some of the vague information. And the direct approach just forces you to think about how this was all done before, but with less precision and subtlety. Dark Souls 1 found a nice sweet spot between vagueness and direct storytelling. They would give players just enough information to get the basic idea of a story, while maintaining an overall objective or theme to hold it together. Then they would leave smaller details up to question, which resulted in fan theories found all over the internet trying to fill in the slots that the story and the lore left open for interpretation. Some of these slots were easily fillable if you paid attention to the details in item descriptions and dialogue. The details missing are the exact reasons why some things happened and how. This lack of all the information lets fans craft part of the journey themselves, while the developers still maintain the overall journey from start to finish. In other words, the developers crafted A, F, M, and Z, while the community fills in the rest. Now, is this good storytelling? I think it depends on how you look at it. On one hand, it can be incredibly interesting to read the descriptions of items, talk to NPCs, 
and try to fill in some of the details of their stories on your own. On the other hand, this style can leave out many important aspects of storytelling in general, like motivation, progression of events, etc. Things that help you understand the shifts from A to B, and so on. Overall, I think the Soul series' style of storytelling is interesting and complex, but not without lacking a lot of meaningful information to give everything that extra layer of realism or believability. One of the strongest aspects of Dark Souls' story and lore was its subtle intricacies and details that gave life to the world without exposing it directly to you. As I said earlier, this encouraged players to search and apply their own ideas to each story, but it wasn't too vague to the point of being aimless. Dark Souls 2 missed the sweet spot and ended up telling too much or too little. This resulted in a very fragmented game in terms of story and lore when you compare it to what came before. There are more holes than before, or the game says something so on the nose that you wonder if this storytelling was split between two people that veered too far off in both extremities of storytelling options. I can't confirm this, but it certainly feels that way to me. Now let's talk about how the games are marketed, and how the communities receive them. It's no surprise to Souls veterans that a big selling point to the series is the difficulty, as that is a major aspect of the sense of accomplishment in completing the games. Not everyone can play these games, because they require you to learn and adapt in ways that other games tend to ignore, or implement in much more simple or tedious ways. This is where Dark Souls 2 falls short compared to the rest. As I said many times before, the former and later games all emphasized the challenge of the encounters, not the overall difficulty of them. The hags in the beginning really hammer home the tone of the game being, we want you to die over and over again. Then they laugh maniacally. Because the difficulty was put over the challenge in this game, many players found themselves dying to a spam bush, an unfair environmental death, horribly balanced enemies, cheap insta-kills, and mechanical changes that aren't explained to them in any coherent way, the iframes tying to agility being the prime example of cheap developer tricks. This isn't to say that the other games don't have their sections, but the game feels like it's cheating to kill you, but it is not nearly as bad as Dark Souls 2. Another selling point of these games are the bosses, as some of them can be very entertaining, interesting, and fun to engage with, either mechanically or aesthetically. Some highlights of the series are The Tower Knight, The King of Storms, Dragon God, Fight Me, Old King Alant, Artorias, Gwyn, Ornstein and Smo, Nito, The Four Kings, Sif, Calamite, The Fume Knight, The Burnt Ivor King, The Dancer of the Boreal Valley, The Nameless King, The Twin Princes, The Soul of Cinder, Freyda, The Demon Prince, Midir, and Gale. All of these bosses can be pleasing for one reason or another, but this doesn't include the bad bosses. Dark Souls 2 was heavily marketing its list of bosses, but it failed to mention how many bosses were simply a spam bush of normal enemies, or how many bosses were simply repeated assets, or how many bosses were just big dudes in armor with similar movesets. It genuinely surprises me how so many people talk about the game so highly, but don't talk about the sheer laziness of having the same bosses multiple times, but changing something slightly about them. The two smelter demons, the three dragon riders, Ornstein 2.0, the Belfry Gargoyles, the Three Cats. Seems like some people don't really care about the integrity of a game as long as they get paid to review it positively. Speaking of reviews, here is a chart showing some of the reviews for the Souls games from various critical outlets. As you can see, there are several discrepancies between who reviewed what and how the numbers changed. Taking some of the largest review outlets, Metacritic and IGN, and others who reviewed all the games, such as Ed's, Famitsu, Game Informer, GamePro, and GameSpot, you can see that the average score for all four games is around a 9 out of 10. When you look closer, Game Informer and Metacritic gave Dark Souls 2 the highest scores out of all the games, which shows me a few things. One, they didn't play the game more than once, since you can notice several things after experiencing something multiple times. Two, they clearly can't tell the difference between well-crafted difficulty versus spam bushes. And three, they haven't paid attention to what Dark Souls 2 did compared to the others, since there are several things that Dark Souls 2 did wrong worse, or both, compared to the others, as you will have seen by this point. I'm not a scorer's guy myself, as I prefer a review you actually have to pay attention to compared to a single number on a scale telling you whether it's good or not. I appreciate depth in a review, you know, since hardly any game can be summarized with a simple number ranking accurately. I don't think I should have to say this, so I'll let Mahler say it. 
Are you saying that it is strange that people who take a huge amount of time to explain and comb through the ideas of a video game disagreed with those who released a day one review? The people who passionately love the games and development disagreed with those who are doing this for day one views and money. This seems natural to me. What's the issue? The day one critics should not be trusted for anything aside from opinion as far as I'm concerned, and even then they are weak with supporting evidence. As he said, don't take the word of someone with a day one review. Watch a walkthrough instead, as that is much more representative of the game's quality, you know, since they are actually showing the game. Moving on, one larger aspect of Dark Souls 2's marketing was its representation for its graphics and frame rate, as those things are pretty important across all games. Dark Souls 2 marketed the 1080p graphics running at 60 frames per second, you know, good quality. Well, they botched this down to 720p graphics running at 30 frames per second on console, now, that's a heap of misleading marketing, which would be bad enough if not for what followed. It seems that they were saving those graphics for Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin, the second round of Dark Souls 2, because we all wanted more of that. This is one of the greediest moves I've ever seen a company do. Now, remasters and remakes years and decades after the original release are fine with me, because they want to bring it to new audiences and new consoles and such. I don't have a problem with that. I do have a problem with re-releasing a game that's only a single year old, changing some spawns, giving it the graphics promised at launch, selling it as a new game, and calling it the Director's Cut and the Definitive Edition. If this is the Director's Cut, why release the original before it's ready? Why release a version that isn't done yet? Early access is one thing, but unfinished products are another. Why release the original Dark Souls 2 if you're going to release Scholar a year later? It's not like it really added anything to it besides changing the spawns and giving the performance that was promised at launch. To be honest, I can't tell which thing I find more distasteful. The re-release of a game with minimal changes that was called a new game from just a year earlier, at full new game price by the way, or the fact that they released Dark Souls 2 before Scholar and didn't give players what was promised on a technical level from the trailers and advertising. It's a miracle that this attitude didn't infect the rest of From Software's games afterwards. This is an interesting topic to tackle, since this is the only game they've made with these issues with development and marketing. Funny how the only game with a different team is the one with all the deception and cheap tactics. Strange how that works. Now we need to discuss something important that I believe was one of the biggest crutches when designing Dark Souls 2. It's clear that the developers took inspiration from Demon Souls when making Dark Souls 2, and I don't think anyone would argue that, since several aspects of Dark Souls 2 are reminiscent, or even directly lifted, from Dark Souls' predecessor. Things like the health reduction mechanic, life gems, the level pathways being pretty linear, and the Emerald Herald are clearly not original ideas, but are taken from Demon Souls. Before I go on, there is nothing wrong with taking ideas from an earlier game and incorporating them into a new game. That's totally fine in my book, and that's not the problem I have with these aspects of Dark Souls 2. It's the fact that they retroactively undid some of the improvements that Dark Souls 1 made over Demon Souls. To my mind, Dark Souls 1 is the strongest of the four Souls games, as several aspects of its design either built on Demon Souls ideas or were never surpassed by its sequels. Its healing, its level design, its bosses, its story, and its mechanics are all very well balanced, for the most part. The sequels either take things in new directions or add things that Dark Souls removed from Demon Souls for the better. One of the biggest differences throughout the series is how healing works. Now, I'm not going to talk about miracles as those are build specific, so don't get on me about how miracles make healing easier in X game over Y game. I'm not talking about that. I'm going to stick to what every character can use. In Demon Souls, grass was the go-to healing item, as well as useful regeneration equipment found throughout the game. There are a few problems with the way these things work. With the grass, there were several different types, and all of them are farmable. You can hold a lot of grass and a lot of different types of grass on your character at once, assuming you aren't encumbered. This results in a simple strategy of outlasting whatever enemies you're fighting. If you play cautiously, and know when to dodge and heal, you'll beat them through attrition. The flip side to this is that you must actively farm the grass in one way or another. You can buy it, or you can kill mobs that drop each type but you have to make an active effort to get it. The regeneration items help to alleviate the grind for grass. These items give health back to the player over time, but it is done very slowly. They are particularly good if taking small amounts of damage or for counteracting a damage over time effect like poison. 
The downside to them is that they are often items that hinder something about your build. The Adjudicator Shield doesn't block 100% of any type of damage, and the Regenerator's Ring takes up one of your two ring slots. However, these trade-offs are not as balanced as I would like, as you can use the shield to beat an enemy down and just sit and wait for whatever damage they did through the shield to regenerate. The ring can be equipped whenever you need the health, so you can fight an enemy, take some damage, kill them, and just re-equip the ring to gain the health back. This can be a hassle of inventory management and sitting around for a while, but it still exists to avoid using the grass to heal. Add that the Adjudicator shield is available relatively early in the game, and you'll find several players trying to get it as soon as possible. In short, healing was plentiful for players in whatever way they chose to use it, but the developers made it too easy to get health back through this overabundance. Dark Souls healing was switched to the Estus system. This made it where the player had 5 to 20 Estus flasks on them at any given time, or a max of 10 if you haven't obtained the right of kindling from Pinwheel. This upped the difficulty by limiting your healing items to very few uses, especially considering that most won't get the full 20 until the latter half of the game, or with a lot of work to get the right of kindling. This also locked most of the healing to a single type or amount of healing, resulting in a choice for players. They could burn an Estus to get to full health if they wanted to top their health off, or risk dying before using one to maximize its healing. The risk and reward system was optimized for healing in this way. There were other forms of healing found throughout the game as well, such as humanity, divine blessings, and a few pieces of gear that gave health back, although they were often one-time use items, or the gear gave back very little health. Humanity was the most abundant of these extra healing resources, but you could only farm them in very specific locations, and they could only be used once. The Divine Blessings were the rarest item, and were the most beneficial healing item, as they removed status effects and gave a high amount of health back. The gear that could heal you was also very sparse. The Ring of the Evil Eye gave a small amount of health back for every enemy killed. This was a much better system than a Regeneration Ring, because it required an engagement in combat, creating a risk and reward choice for the Evil Eye Ring, where the Regenerator Ring was lacking in risk. An item that really didn't change much was the Sanctus Shield. This item acts the same as the Adjudicator Shield, slowly healing you over time. But the catch for this is that you have to be in human form to be invaded by a phantom, then kill said phantom, which is located near the end of a pathway leading to one of the four Great Souls that encompasses the endgame content of Dark Souls 1. In other words, it'll take a long time and a lot of work to reach this shield. This is also the slowest and only regeneration piece of gear in Dark Souls 1 giving 1 health per second compared to the Regenerator Ring's 4 per second from Demon Souls, the Ring of Restoration's 4 per second from Dark Souls 2, and the Sun Princess Ring's 2 per second from Dark Souls 3. Since every other game has a ring that does it, that's why I compared them, as Sanctus is the only piece of equipment that does it in Dark Souls 1. Some could call that balance in Dark Souls to have one piece of gear that regenerated health found deep into the game, but I believe that is up for debate. When you get to Dark Souls 2, you find that they have reverted back towards a more Demon Souls type of healing system, with several types of life gems and other items that give health slowly or quickly. Life gems are the most abundant of these, as the base life gem can be bought early, is stackable to 99, and each life gem gives 500 health per gem. Some could say that they tried to balance this by making them work slowly over time, but I would say that backfired. Since they act as slow forms of Estus, thereby eating future damage that Estus cannot, they become overpowered in certain scenarios, because stacking them has your health regenerating like crazy. Mahler's footage from his Dark Souls 2 response series exemplifies this perfectly, as he is able to run around DLC mobs, mobs with high damage, and simply pop life gem after life gem while healing through all of the enemy attacks. Mind you, this is on top of the Estus flasks available in the game. Dark Souls 2 could have stuck with the idea of life gems being the only consumable healing source. This would have been more balanced than what we got, as having the life gems on top of Estus on top of everything else gives players a billion ways to heal. It also would have been an interesting nod to Demon Souls if they incorporated it well. However, they decided to try to make a hybrid of both Dark and Demon Souls healing systems, without balancing the idea properly. They simply gave players too many options, and combinations that were too strong when it came to healing. You want slow healing? Life gems are everywhere. Need quick healing? Estus has you covered. They clearly liked Demon Souls system for healing, but had to have the Estus as that was what Dark Souls popularized. Were they pressured into doing it this way, or did they have the option of one or the other? I don't know, but I wish they picked one instead of both. 
The phrase, if you chase two hares, you will lose them both, applies very aptly to the situation. Thanks, Civ4. They took two interesting ideas with their own trade-offs in their individual games, and created an imbalanced overabundance in their game when combining them. The whole point of this rant is to compare Demon Souls Grass to Dark Souls 2's life gems. They are very similar, in that there are multiple types of each, they both heal for varying fixed amounts, they both are purchasable and farmable, or found throughout the world, and they both imbalance the combat encounters when you can outlast everything the game throws at you. Here is some useless data I got while testing how long it takes to die from poison, since that is an easy metric to track, and it's in all four games. This accounts for healing items you have and high HP, along with some regeneration gear. The gear is limited to one item per character, as some combinations completely nullify poison altogether, so some things aren't upgraded all the way and items that nullify poison completely are not counted. In Demon Souls, if you have 99 Crescent Moongrass, 1500 HP, while also equipping the basic Adjudicator Shield, it will take roughly 111 minutes to die from poison. Poison damage varies in the game, but this is going with a number that matches closely with the other Souls games. I apologize for not showing footage of this test, by the way. I am really bad with capture cards for some reason, so I got this from doing some number crunching instead. Getting back on topic, in Dark Souls 1, if you have 20 plus 5 Estus Flasks and 1500 HP while equipping the Sanctus Shield, it will take roughly 90 minutes to die from poison. In Dark Souls 2, if you have 12 plus 5 Estus Flasks and 2200 HP while using the Ring of Restoration, it will take roughly 6 minutes to die. If using Life Gems instead of Estus with the same HP and Ring, it will take roughly 28 minutes to die. The main thing to remember here is that the poison damage per second is much higher in this game compared to the others. The other games have poison deal 3 to 4 damage per second, while this game does a whopping 30 per second. When we adjust the damage per second so it lines up more with the other games, using this setup with Estus takes roughly 41 minutes, and using life gems takes over 3 hours. When we adjust the health to 1500 and the poison damage, Estus keeps you alive for 28 minutes, and life gems keep you alive for a little over 2 hours. In Dark Souls 3, if you have 15 plus 9 Estus and 1800 hit points while using the Sun Princess Ring and the Estus Ring, it will take a little under 2 hours to die from poison. If we adjust this to the 1500 HP average, it'll take a little under 100 minutes to die. Now that we've gone through each game, let's see a chart of this information since I like pretending I'm smart. When you look at it this way, you can clearly see that the Dark Souls 2 healing will keep you alive when adjusted to the normal poison rate, but because it was buffed to a ludicrous degree, it happens much quicker. Is this the developers trying to balance the healing to the damage dealt, or vice versa? Or are they trying to hide the fact that you can absorb so much damage with life gems? I don't know, but you shouldn't give players that much healing all the time in any case. I didn't include some stats in there because I didn't want it to get too confusing to read. When you adjust every other game up to Dark Souls 2's poison damage per second, things get kinda funny. Demon Souls goes from 111 minutes to about 16 minutes, Dark Souls 1 goes from 90 minutes to 12 minutes, and Dark Souls 3 goes from just under 2 hours to about 13 minutes. Those numbers are all higher than Dark Souls 2's Estus number. That's interesting to think about, but ultimately is pretty useless data since the games are locked to whatever systems they have in place. The whole point of this is to show how much damage you can absorb in the two games that give you other forms of healing than Estus. When we're talking about health restoring items, the numbers get quite ridiculous for some games. Demon Souls lets you have over 134,000 health on your character at once through the grass, excluding full restore grass. Dark Souls 1 lets you have 16,000 from the Estus. Dark Souls 2 lets you have an unbelievable 272,000 from Estus and max stacks of life gems. That's almost as much health as all of Dark Souls 2's bosses combined. Think about that. Dark Souls 3 gives you 10,800 health with the Estus. Thank Gwyn that Dark Souls 3 didn't have Ash Gems or Cinder Fragments or something that regenerated your health like Dark Souls 2. When you look at it this way, you can see how broken the healing is in Demon Souls and its non-sequel Dark Souls 2. They drastically overpower the player with health options, and even when I limit things to the base life gem, you still have four times what Dark Souls 1 had. This is ridiculous and proves how unbalanced the games are with their respective healing systems. This isn't completely Dark Souls 2's fault, but when they make game A and improve the system in game B, but then game C makes it worse than game A, 
that tells me a lot about the competency of the developers of Game C. They clearly didn't understand the problem with the healing in Demon Souls, and decided to make the same mistake again. Now that we've talked about healing for 50 hours, let's move on to health reduction. This is something that has been covered by Mr. Matosis, but we fall on different sides of the argument. He said that the health reduction in Demon Souls is a hindrance, but it protects you from some of the nastier stuff in the game. This is true, as your health is reduced when you are in soul form and you can't be invaded in that form as well. This is trying to strike a balance where online gives you more health, but makes you susceptible to more and stronger opponents. This to me is fine at the base, but my problem isn't losing health, it's the amount. Your HP gets halved when you die. There is a ring that reduces the penalty to 75% of max health, but still, that's a ring slot effectively gone if you want to play offline. This seems pretty excessive as a punishment for death, and there are several instances where you can be comboed or one-shot because of the health reduction afterwards. This can even happen when at 75% health. To me, this seems unbalanced and overly punishing. In my opinion, every Souls game afterwards did this better or somewhat better. This is even more overly punishing now because the online servers were shut down for Demon Souls. Yes, there is a remake for the PS5 and private servers but the original PS3 and PS4 players are just screwed out of online now, I guess. Also, how many times do we need to remake the game for a new console? Seriously? I think Dark Souls 1 found a sweet spot with both online and offline players, as you don't get a health penalty at all from either state. This made it easier for players in offline mode to play the game without having to worry about managing a health reduction and whether they would be invaded or not. With the distance between bonfires and bosses and the Estus system in place, I think this is much more balanced without adding a health reduction mechanic into the mix. Some could call this oversimplification and even pandering to the casuals, but I would say it's less punishing to the offline and PvE style players like myself. I don't like PvP in general in these games, and I don't have to explain why, because we've all dealt with the problems presented by PvP. I don't want to be punished for my choice of having my health reduced if I want to play offline. I also don't want to have to manually disable my internet connection just to play these games offline. Yes, you can opt out of online play in the menus of Demon's Souls, Dark Souls Remastered, and Dark Souls 3, but that doesn't fix the health reduction problem in Demon's Souls. If anything, it makes it more useless and annoying. Dark Souls 3 made a tweak where being online through Embering gave you an increase in health, and it would recharge after defeating a boss if you were not Embered. This was an interesting change, but I still think it was a step backwards from Dark Souls 1. I say this because you don't get an ember to use for the health edition when you want. They automatically apply it to you after defeating a boss. And if you are already embered before the boss, you don't get anything. What happened to Dark Souls 1's system? It gave players options, and that, to me, is one of the strongest aspects of these games. We won't even go over the health reduction in Irithal Dungeon from the Jailers. That entire area and the Jailers can go straight to the Abyss as far as I care. I mention all of this, of course, as a contextual backdrop for what came before and after Dark Souls 2. When you compare the health reduction between Demon Souls and Dark Souls 2, Demon Souls is actually the more punishing of the two when you look at just the health reduction on its own. The former automatically goes down to 50 or 75% health, while Dark Souls 2 is a gradual decline until you hit 50 or 75% after several deaths without using a human effigy. This is also less punishing because Dark Souls 2 gives you 4 ring slots instead of 2, so your combinations for builds aren't as restricted when using the ring that reduces the health penalty. When you factor in other aspects of the health reduction, however, Dark Souls 2 becomes a completely unfair and frustrating experience. You can be invaded no matter what form you are in, either human or hollow, and that can be very frustrating to deal with on top of bad hitboxes, cheap ambushes, spam, mechanical restrictions, and bad iframe balancing. The only way to avoid invasions from players is to burn an effigy at a bonfire, giving you a period where invasions are drastically reduced. The trade-off is that the human effigy is also used to cure the health reduction. This could have been better than Demon Souls' system for health reduction, but you can pop effigies on yourself and the bonfires in the same area at once, so you are nearly free of invasions and have full health, which is very imbalanced. If they limited it to one use on the bonfire or yourself, but you couldn't use the other afterwards, that would work better than this. What we have now allows for players to farm effigies and essentially make the game nearly invasion free. Then again, I've been invaded less than 10 times in my 500 plus hours of Dark Souls 2, so I couldn't really say how often you'd get invaded anyway. 
This might simply be an issue because of Dark Souls 2 and Scholar existing, but then again, that is a whole nother game. Now we'll move on to the similarities between Demon Souls and Dark Souls 2's worlds. Something that was heavily criticized about Dark Souls 2's worlds was how the levels were designed and connected. Very few of them connect to each other, and several pathways are simply straight shots from beginning to end, with only minor optional areas here and there. When you look at the interconnectivity within the levels, very few of them are more than a corridor leading to an area that leads to another corridor that leads to another area. The Forest of Fallen Giants, the Lost Bastille, and the Broom Tower are the strongest examples of Dark Souls 2's internal interconnectivity, with everything else being relatively lacking and in some cases, just a straight shot from the bonfire to the boss. Aldia's Keep is one of the laziest levels in the game, and a great example of this. The first bonfire takes you to the entrance, and it is literally a straight line through some big enemies and doors to get to the Guardian Dragon. Then you're done with the area. That's literally it. When you compare this to Demon Souls, you get two very strange results. Internally, the levels tend to interconnect in several believable ways, with the Tower of Latria arguably being the strongest level in this regard. This would put the internal connectivity above Dark Souls 2 in quality. Externally, the levels only connect to two areas, the area before and the area afterwards, until you reach the end. This would put the external interconnectivity below Dark Souls 2 in quality. This is strange to think about, as Dark Souls 2 has more branching pathways towards optional areas, while every Demon Souls pathway is a straight shot from beginning to end. But the levels themselves are vastly more simplified in Dark Souls 2 than in Demon Souls. These aspects of the two games can be swept over quickly by saying that one is better from a world perspective, and the other is better from a level perspective. This is inaccurate. Demon Souls levels work well on an individual basis, although they barely connect to each other, but they were never intended to. They are built to be taken as different sections of the world, not the entire world. This is why the Nexus teleports you to each pathway. This is also for hardware and loading reasons. Dark Souls 2's levels are meant to be the entire world. That's why they are all connected to Majula physically. However, they are often simple area corridor repeat levels that only branch out every once in a while, because Dark Souls 1 had many areas to go to at once. As the game progresses, you find more and more areas that simply ask you to go in a straightforward path towards the boss, and then repeat for the next area. The developers clearly had or put less time into the later levels of Dark Souls 2, as the opening areas had some complexity to them, but eventually fell into the linear design later. Dark Souls 1 has the greatest map in the series. This is because the levels interconnect well and often with each other, and connect internally, unlike its predecessor and its sequels. This isn't to say that the other games don't connect in any way at all, but Dark Souls 1 has the most connectivity in both aspects for most of its level design. It's clear that Demon's Souls' idea of pathways influenced Dark Souls 2, as there are several obvious pathways that go from start to finish and results in a primal bonfire that warps you back to Majula to try another path. This is almost identical to Demon's Souls' pathways to the Archdemons, that eventually leads you back to the hub to access the next path. Dark Souls 2 does this worse than Demon Souls, though, because of the linearity after reaching Drangleic Castle. Demon Souls gave players options right up to the end of the game, as each pathway towards the Archdemons was roughly the same number of sections. As I've said before, Dark Souls 2 gives you options until you've been to 75% of the game, then railroads you until you get near the end of the game. It seems as if Dark Souls 2 tried to combine Dark Souls 1's optional areas and pathways with Demon Souls' build-up to the end of each path, but they ended up in the middle, where interconnectivity was minimal, if non-existent, and the pathways ended up being randomly sized, mostly linear, and only had an optional area here or there. In other words, they did both poorly because they didn't commit to one over the other. The diversity of the levels is something that Dark Souls 2 fans have used as an excuse to say the levels are good. They may be more varied than previous entries, but they aren't as well made. Every game has their fire level, their poison level, their dark level, their royal level, their scholar level, their ruin level, their snow level, etc. That doesn't make the levels good because of their aesthetic. The layout, forethought, and effort put into them makes them good. This is one reason why levels before and after Dark Souls 2 were well received, as they were at least well crafted to give shortcuts that made each level feel like everything was put together with purpose. The shortcuts make things interesting, because it shows the world or the level coming together with intent, instead of randomly attaching areas to each other, which Dark Souls 2 is blatantly guilty of. 
The Iron Keep being above Earthen Peak through an elevator cannot be seen as a smart decision in any possible way. There are some cases of simpler or more linear level design in the other games, in Demon's Souls especially, but they were never stupid enough to put a lava lake above the sky. Now we'll talk about primal bonfires for a few seconds. They are literally archstones from Demon Souls that take you back to the hub. That's what they are, and they don't let you warp anywhere else, which is really weird considering that every other bonfire will let you warp anywhere. Kind of a weird decision to add these, as we already have the option to warp back to the hub from every other bonfire, so I restrict these to just the hub. It seems more like a gimmick to remind you of Demon Souls than anything else, even though it breaks the other bonfire's consistency. For our final comparison, we'll talk about something that really irked me. The Emerald Herald is essentially the Maiden in Black. They both serve as the main quest giver for each narrative, and you need to talk to each to level up. I'm not sure why they added the Emerald Herald to Dark Souls 2, though. The bonfire's purpose for leveling up made sense in almost every way possible, as I stated near the beginning of the video, so why does she do it for you now? As also stated before, this is an inconsistency I can't unknow now that Dark Souls 3 continued for some reason. She didn't need to be made as the level up NPC, but the developers clearly liked Demon Souls, so they copied and pasted the Maiden in Black as the Maiden in Green, and arbitrarily changed an integral system in Dark Souls 1 into something from Demon Souls that Dark Souls 2 doesn't have any canonical ties to whatsoever. Demon Souls and Dark Souls are not narratively connected at all. Neither is Dark Souls 2 or 3 to Demon Souls. Dark Souls 1, 2, and 3 are connected, so they should retain certain consistencies. But Dark Souls 2 decided to screw it up. They could have left the Emerald Herald as an NPC that appears here and there and guides you towards seeking the throne, which would have been fine. But they had to change things up, and we'll never know why. This change can be seen as the best metaphor to describe Dark Souls 2 in a nutshell. They take something good, great, or dare I say it, perfect, and screw it up for a cheap reference or gimmick. The bonfire is the most iconic symbol of the Dark Souls trilogy, and Dark Souls 2 decided to spit on it by turning it into a generic checkpoint. Keep that in mind the next time you play, and think about what was lost between the sequels. In my opinion, Dark Souls 2 is one of the biggest letdowns when it comes to sequels, and has many moments that will confuse, disappoint, bore, and annoy. The main problem that people had with it was that it was a massive step back from what came before, not that it wasn't Dark Souls 1. This is an argument that the hardcore fanboys seem to pull out to defend the game, saying that we're blinded by nostalgia when comparing Dark Souls 2 to 1. I got into all four games at the same time, and finished Dark Souls 2 first, so See how that argument holds up now. Demon's Souls was a great game that challenged players in ways we hadn't experienced and brought life to the whole Souls-like genre of games in the first place. It didn't get everything right, but it certainly was an innovative and unique game and a unique experience at the time. Its sequel was even stronger. Completing Dark Souls for the first time felt like a real journey, where I overcame everything the game threw at me because I learned and got better as a player, not that I ground out levels or used cheap tactics. I felt like the game challenged me and I overcame that challenge, which is a great feeling when you've finally completed the game after hours of struggling. Then, when I went back and looked at everything the game offered in its design, I found new respect for it, because most of it was well thought out and well made to be challenging, but fair. Dark Souls 1 was an ambitious sequel, and, in my eyes, was one of the greatest sequels ever made. I think it surpassed Demon's Souls, and is still the game I would consider the strongest from the series. I don't say that out of nostalgia, but out of appreciation and respect for its design. Dark Souls 2 could have been a fantastic sequel, but it became the black sheep of the series because the experiences of frustration were made to be frustrating, and the fairness was almost completely forgotten from its prequels. The levels were rushed or cheaply made, while the mechanics were changed in ways you couldn't understand without looking things up. The enemies would spam you, or their damage output would be ridiculously high, or there would be too many enemies to count. When all was said and done, you came away feeling like you endured a painful journey, and you will look back to see that the game actively tried to make it painful for you, no matter the cost. With all of that said, I still find Dark Souls 2 fun to play. Maybe I just love the soul grind, or maybe it's the aesthetic of the series, or the mechanics that I enjoy, or the crazy builds you can try. In any case, I still have fun playing this game, 
and will continue to play it. Mr. Matosis and I agree that Dark Souls 2 has no soul, forgive the pun, but we take it over several other games because it's still better than a lot of games out there, even though it has a whole host of issues, as you can tell by my hours of cynical complaining. It still can offer a challenging and enjoyable experience, as you can see from so many fans that loved it. The Souls series is a favorite of mine, and once I got how to play them and enjoy them, they all became some of my most played games, with Dark Souls 1 becoming one of my all-time favorites. Dark Souls 2 is no jewel of design by normal standards, or by Souls series standards especially, but it still can be a lot of fun to play, and I would recommend it along with the other games to people. Its flaws shouldn't be overlooked by any means, but it shouldn't be considered absolute trash either, just a letdown. After logging over 500 hours in Dark Souls 2, writing this 159 page, 86,000 word script, redrafting and making this video, I will leave you with this. Dark Souls 2 is the most hollow of the series, in many ways, but can still have its own incandescent charm. Thank you.